compensating for and then define residual debt. Also oh. kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, what's the time? Oh, oh, that's four. 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 Do I let you go early or do I crack on? Crack on. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, no! I'll have a look and see how long this... Uh, I'm not going into gyros now, because... There'll be some questions on that one. <laughs> All right, we can do this. All right, magnetic compass. We're nearly there. Last one. You guys good? Or do you need a quick stand up stretch and a water break? This will be 20 minutes. You want a stand up stretch and a water break? No? Okay. All right, so what we're going to go through is the Earth's magnetic field, what variation is, what compass areas are, and how we do service. All right, why is the compass important? Directions. It does point to magnet, magnetic, 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 magnetic. Yep. Nice. Good. And why is that important for us? Aren't all the charts in true anyway? No, where the heck we going? Do we though? Because the charts are in true north, and that points to magnetic north. We can use the directional indicator to adjust it to that to true north based off the compass. But how do you know what true north is if you only have magnetic north? Uh, yep, you're on the right track. Anyway, so the compass shows us direction. It tells us where magnetic north is, which is useful, right? Because that's how we navigate. So the Earth, it's the giant space butterfly, right? So we've got our antennae, the wings, and our little tail there. It's great. So these lines here, these are called flux lines, okay? So the Earth, because it's got a large metal core, has a magnetic field around it. Okay, so we've got the magnetic north pole, magnetic south pole, and we have these lines coming out and around the Earth. Okay? Now at different points on the Earth, the angle at which those magnets want to line up, right? if we take a normal magnet, gave it zero, um, zero friction, zero weight, zero gravity, and just put it there, it would want to line up with the Earth's magnetic field. Right? Now at the equator, it's going to be horizontal to the Earth. In New Zealand, right, we're down at these upper latitudes, it's on an angle, and that angle can be as much as 60, 70 degrees. As you get all the way up to the poles, it's like 90 degrees, right? If you're directly on the magnetic north pole, it's going to be 90 degrees, straight up and down. So your navigational information is going to be awful, which is why in the movies you see them with the compass spinning around. That's why. This is a variation chart. Because magnetic north, which is here, is not the same as true north, which is here. They're in different spots. Does true north change? No. no. Unless you're a flat earther, then it does. That's right. right. True north doesn't change. True north is the same. Magnetic north actually does a full 360 around the pole once every 800 or 900 years. Don't quote me on that. Something like that. Arbitrary number. Don't write it down. <laughs> Right, close to that, under a thousand years. It'll do it for 360. So, what does that mean for us? Compass is going to change? Well, our compass is still going to point north. Yeah. But in relation to the ground, that's going to change over time. Which can make navigating a bit difficult. That's why all the charts are in true. Because true doesn't change. The ground is still where the ground is. Right? So that's why. This is what we call a variation chart. So this shows us the variation throughout the world. Okay? Now what variation is, is it's the difference between magnetic north and true north. Right? So in New Zealand, we have 20 degrees east variation. So what that means is if we go to magnetic north, right, and we want to go to, sorry, if we go to true north, and we wanted to go to magnetic north, we'd have to go 20 degrees east. Right? And that would take us to magnetic north. Um, so we have this diagram here. So in this case on the west, we have variation east. So we have the same variation that we have in the North Island of New Zealand here, which is about 20 degrees east. Or in Auckland in New Zealand. It changes as you go throughout the country. Now if we want to go to true north, which is up here, if we point at that magnetic north, 
right? So if we're lined north up on our compass, we'd actually end up flying 20 degrees off the track, <coughs> right? So we use the phrase variation east, magnetic least, so as in taking it away. Variation west, magnetic best, added. So east is least, take it away, west is best, added, okay? So in this case, if we want to go from true, right? So our true course to north would be um, zero, zero, zero. To get there, we need to take away 20 degrees of variation. So we have to steer 340 degrees magnetic, right? Because if we just steered north on the magnetic, we would go past north. And then we would end up going south, right? Um, the compass. Looks like this. Got a nice compass chamber, fluid filled, a little cap there, suspended at a high point to reduce magnetic dip. But we have one of these. It's called a deviation card. So, deviation is the difference between compass heading right, and magnetic heading. Because they're different. Because the compass has its own errors. What's an aircraft made out of? Generally. Metal. What's an engine made out of? Metal. What are cylinders and pistons made out of? And they rub against each other. What happens when you rub metal together? Yeah, you create charge and forces and magnetism and what what are avionics? They've got big magnets in them too, right? To make things work. Every speaker's got a big magnet in them. So how do you think that poor little compass feels every time you turn on the aircraft? It's like, Wee! I don't know where I'm going. So what we do, oh, sorry, my throat, I'm, I'm just about to lose my voice, but I'm, I'm pushing on. All right. Oh, this is painful now. <laughs> so the difference between um, our, excuse me, magnetic and our compass heading. So if we want to steer magnetic north on the compass, we have to steer, oh, this one hasn't worked out very well, magnetic north. Right, so on the compass, if we steer north, we will go to magnetic north. However, if we want to go to the magnetic south pole, so 180, we actually have to steer 178 on the compass to get there. Right, so it's a little bit off. To be fair, as a private pilot, if you can steer within 2 degrees, I will be so impressed it's not funny. So generally, these are sort of left out as kind of a negligible number. But in some places, it can be quite significant. Right? Any time you have a, um, you know, any major work done to the aircraft, so any major modifications, any engine work, any installation of any avionics, once every 24 months, you need to do what's called a compass swing, which is basically where they put the aircraft on this nice big compass rose and point it to where magnetic north is and start it up and then run it up to normal engine power settings for the aircraft. And then go, what does the compass say? The compass is wrong. Let's adjust it a little bit, or let's just write it down. And they'll do that any time major work's been done. Now, inside the compass, at the equator, our compass would line up nicely with the Earth's magnetic flux line, right? Because it's horizontal. In New Zealand, it's like this, right? So the compass is going to dip with it, okay? So this is called magnetic dip, right? So the flux line dips as you move towards the poles. Now, what we do is the compass is suspended from a high point. So instead of suspending it from a low point, right, so where there's dip, it would roll straight away, we suspend it from like a string so that when we want it to line up with the, let's say my magnetic flux lines like this, right, it wants to line up like that. It can't because it weighs something and it's not going to move itself all the way out there. So it will only move itself a little bit, right? So that's what this high suspension point does. It means when the flux lines change, the compass only moves a really little bit because its centre of gravity is low, it's trying to hold it there. You guys still with me? A few blank faces. <laughs> does that make sense? Right? It's like, imagine I've got a... Oh, uh, I where it is. I used to have one. If so I'm... Basically, it's reducing the amount of change to what it relatively would be. Yeah, well, it's, like hold, it's like holding it from here, right? So our magnetic, let's take it to the extremes. At the poles, they're up 90 degrees, right? So my compass magnet wants to do this. But this compass magnet weighs something, so it can't. So because it's suspended from up here, 
it ends up sitting kind of like this. It's trying to, but it can't. If we did it this way around, what would it do? Light itself up, right? Because its centre of gravity is really unstable. Whereas if we do it this way, it wants to keep itself flat because of its centre of gravity is nice and low. But because there is some magnetic flux lines, it's still getting some influence, it still will move a little bit. And then we're left with what's called residual dip. Right? So it's all about having this low centre of gravity right, and a really high pivot point. Now, because that centre of gravity and that pivot point are offset, there you go, now I have to look, <laughs> crack it into the, into the real intense stuff. We have acceleration and deceleration error. So what that means is if north is, uh, yeah, if we have direction here, we have the compass and it's lined up with the flux lines, so we're going east and west at the moment, right? As we accelerate, my pivot point's here, but my centre of gravity is over to the left, right? So if I let it go, this end drops because the centre of gravity is offset, right? As I accelerate, what happens? It lags behind. As I decelerate, it goes in front because that centre of gravity is offset because of the residual dip. So that's how we get acceleration and deceleration here. Now if I line myself up nicely with north and south, even though that is offset, if I'm now north and south, nothing happens, right? Because it's all lined up nicely. As soon as I'm offset, then we get that lag and that lag. So the acronym is SAND, okay? So as we accelerate, we get an apparent turn to the south, so south, accelerate. As we decelerate, we get an apparent turn to the north. And it's max on east and west. You do need to know that. Turning error is all to do with the fact that our magnetic flux lines aren't constrained. Okay? So if we were going um, east and west, flux lines go this way. As we roll, the compass still stays in line with the flux lines, right? It's all happy. If we're going north and south, Right? As we roll, our aircraft compass now gets out of whack with the flux lines. So the compass wants to turn so that it's nice and realigned again. Okay? So then we get turning errors. So anytime we roll in when we're on a north or a south heading, because of those flux lines, the compass swings out a little bit, and then we get turning error. Which is obviously a pain if you're trying to turn onto a heading, right? So we use the, fra the acronym ONUS. Okay, so overturn north, underturn south. So it's maximum on north and south. Okay? So on north we need to overturn by 30 degrees, and on south we need to overturn by 30 degrees. On east and west it's nil. So if we want to turn onto a heading of west, we just turn onto a heading of west. And if we want to turn onto a heading of east, we just turn onto a heading of east. And it's fine. But if we turn north and south, we need to apply some correction factor. So. When we're doing a compass turn, let's say we're going on a heading of uh, 270, just for argument's sake. Right? So we're going this way. I want to turn onto a heading of north. So which way am I going to turn? Right. Right. Okay. So shortest arc, we're turning to the right. Am I going to overturn or underturn? Overturn. Overturn. By how much? 30 degrees. 30 degrees. So my rollout heading is going to be? 030. 030. So as I roll in, I'm going to wait for the compass to say 0, 3, 0, and then I'll roll out. And then once the compass settles, I'll be pointing it off. Nice and easy. Okay, now I'm heading, uh, let's say I'm heading southeast. So I'm on a heading of 150, and I want to roll, turn onto a heading of 180. Which way am I going to turn? Right. Right? Am I going to overturn or underturn? Underturn. By how much? 30. So what's my rollout heading going to be? 150. 150. Wait, hang on. Yeah. Right? So as you roll in, what will happen is the compass will swing out, you'll keep turning, and then it'll get to 150, then you roll into level, and then it'll move. And then you'll be done that one. That's a fun one to do to people in flight when you're not expecting it. Just sit there and work it out, and they go, wait, I am on 150. How, what? All right. Um, OK, now we're going on a heading of 210 and I want to turn onto a heading of 0, 3, 0. Which way am I going to turn? Left or 
right. Either way. Yeah? You guys don't say it first. <laughs> okay, let's go to the right. Over turn, under turn. By how much? So I'm going to roll out on. 050. Okay, now I'm on a heading of 050, and I want to turn onto a heading of 300. Which way am I going to go? Left. Left. Okay, so I'm going left to 300. I'm going to over turn, under turn. By how much? 10 degrees. So what am I going to roll out on? 290. Does that make sense? All you need to remember, Otis, 30 degrees on north and south, zero on east and west. And you can figure the rest out in your bracket. I'll write, I'll write all this crap off. <laughs> Alright, anyone want to grab a photo of that before I take it off? Got two phones, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a backup. Redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> Like hard on you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call me. <laughs> and do you just remember? Do you just remember the ten, twenty, thirty, or just work it out? You do it enough, and you remember it in your brain. But yeah, every thirty degrees is ten degrees of correction. But yeah, I just remember zero three zero. Well, that's twenty zero six zero is ten zero nine zero zero. You remember those, and then when you do a commercial license, they'll give you something like three zero five. And you're like, oh, oh, oh hang on, what, what's, what, is that 11, or is that, is that 9, oh, I can't remember. Real easy on the ground, as soon as you're flying a plane, everyone sucks at this, it's really entertaining. Alright, this is how a compass looks, right, little cross section, so we've got a really nice high pivot point, okay, so it's pivoting all the way up here, compass cards down nice and low, okay. It's in a liquid filled chamber, and that liquid filled chamber provides lubrication, it pro provides a bit of dampening and it also provides buoyancy. So that means there's very little friction on that pivot point in the compass, so the compass can, can turn nice and easily. Okay? Um, some of them have spring suspension as well, okay? so that when you go through turbulence, the card's not jolting around like all hell. On the card, you've also got a lover line. Okay? So that line tells you what heading you're on in relation to the compass. So when that lines up with 060, you're going on 060. So in this case, you're going on 04 or 036 or something. Okay. Serviceability checks. We want to make sure it's securely installed so it's not just flapping around. We can actually read it because if you can't read it, you won't be able to use it. There's no bubbles, there's no discoloration, there's no cracks. Okay. We actually have a deviation card or a compass card. That is a legal requirement. So if you don't have that, don't go flying. Uh, and it needs to read about right. Because if you get in it, start her up, and then you're pointing down runway 21 and the compass said it's 070, you're going, well, hang on a minute, that's, that's not right. Either I can't read runway numbers, or I can't read compass numbers, or my compass is wrong. Okay? So it needs to read about right. Powered through. Questions around the room from all of today? When do you use the directional indicator then? You line it up with the compass, because when you're flying through turbulence, the compass likes to do this. Whee! <laughs> While you're going in a straight line. <laughs> so you line the DI up and the DI doesn't move. But we go into gyroscopic instruments tomorrow. Any other questions? Guy? Right. Well, most values that people give you, so like your runway headings, Yep. When you're looking at like operational data, will that that'll be magnetic? Yeah. Heading? So runway headings are always magnetic. Yep. Then are there any instances where you'll be given a true north heading? So it's always given a magnetic. Uh, weather is given in true. Mm -hmm. Charts are given in true. Mm -hmm. Operational when you're flying, everything's magnetic. Even ADISs, mm -hmm. they're given in magnetic. Mm -hmm. So once you're flying, everything's in magnetic. Right. John. Um, is our phone compass uh, magnetic or true north? What's that? It, the compass on our phone? Yeah. Uh, you can set it to either the compass on your phone. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. 
Nope. So when you're saying, sorry, so winds on the ground are normally given in true north? No. Oh, well, wind forecasts. Mm -hmm. So metas, TAFs, craft wars, yep. aviation area winds yep. are all given in true. ADISs are given in negative. So basically anything that's written down, yep. other than runway vectors, mm -hmm. is given in um, truth. Yep. If it's spoken, then it's given in negative. Uh, um, if you guys have any questions, queries, put my name up. If you have any more questions, queries, I'll give you my number and you can call me, but otherwise, I'm trying to avoid that because recently I've had lots of people who decided it's funny to call me at 9 o'clock and ask me how work and I don't like it. Devin, questions? I have a question while I'm studying. I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna, get in, I'm gonna get in tomorrow morning and be 36 emails from Dev. <laughs> What's the answer to this syllabus point? What's the answer to the next syllabus point? What's the answer to the next syllabus point? <laughs> Eric? No, nah, Abby? Cool. Any questions? Email me. Okay. Any really urgent questions, call me. But you have to go find my number. Alright. That's us. That's it. You're done for today. Thank you. Three minutes early, you're welcome. <laughs>
The two gimbals holding the gyro allow the gyro to move freely and maintain its level orientation as the airplane maneuvers. Connections to the instrument face will then show the aircraft's attitude to the pilot. Note that if the airplane is experiencing an excessive pitch or bank, or if vacuum pump is not providing enough suction to spin the gyro, this instrument can read inaccurately. Heading indicator. The heading indicator senses the airplane's movement and displays heading based on a 360 degree azimuth in five degree increments. The tick marks are labeled every 30 degrees with the final zero omitted. For example, the number six indicates a heading of 60 degrees. 21 indicates a heading of 210 degrees. The heading indicator does not have any built-in heading sensing ability, so at the start of every flight, after the engine is running, the pilot must realign the instrument to correct heading, referencing the aircraft's magnetic compass. To accomplish this, push in the knob on the lower left side of the instrument. This both disconnects the gyro from the compass guard and aligns the gear of the knob with the gears connected to the compass guard. When complete, release the knob and the gyro will reconnect to the compass guard. Unlike the attitude indicator, the heading indicator is orientated so that only the horizontal axis is used to drive the display. When the aircraft turns, the gyro and attached main drive gear remain in their original orientation. This then causes the main drive gear to rotate the compass card gear, which then rotates the compass card on the face of the instrument. Note that, due to friction and precession, the heading indicator may slowly drift away from the correct heading. Because of this, the pilot should double check the accuracy of the instrument against the magnetic compass and realign as necessary. This should be done roughly every 15 minutes or so. Keep in mind that the vacuum pump is not producing sufficient suction. When the engine is idling, the drift may be greater. Turn coordinator. The turn coordinator is a supporting instrument used while banking. It is used both to indicate the rate and quality of the turn. It can also be used as a backup source of bank information in the event the attitude indicator fails. In the center of the face of the instrument lies a miniature airplane that indicates the rate of turn the aircraft is currently in. Two tick marks indicate level. The other two tick marks indicate what is called a standard rate turn. A standard rate turn is one that takes two minutes to complete a 360 degree full circle. This is so the Yang says standard rate, we say rate one. So if you get rate one, this is what they're talking about. The rate that all pilots fly when in instrument meteorological conditions, meaning they have no outside references to follow. Below the miniature aircraft is an inclinometer, which incorporates a ball inside a tube filled with kerosene. The ball can freely move left and right and will travel in whatever direction aerodynamic forces push and pull it. Ideally, the ball should always be centered, which means the aircraft is coordinated. If aerodynamic forces are unbalanced, the ball will slide left or right. This happens when there is either too much or too little rudder being used with the current amount of bank. These two conditions are referred to as a slip and a skid. In a slip, there is not a great enough rate of turn for the amount of bank. The pilot needs to add more rudder and or reduce the bank. In a skid, there is too much of a rate of turn for the amount of bank. The pilot needs to add more bank and or reduce the amount of rudder. The easiest way to remember how to fix these situations is just to step on the ball. This means that when the ball is deflected off center, step on the respective rudder pedal that the ball is deflected toward. A ball deflected left means step on the left rudder. Conversely, a ball deflected right means step on the right rudder. To get this instrument to function, it is typically powered by electricity. For this instrument, the gyro rotates from a motor located in its center. The gyro is mounted so it can remain upright while in a turn. Mechanical linkages then connect the gyro to the miniature airplane on the front of the instrument. A spring is installed to help return the mini airplane back to level. Because of this, the pilot would never know if the instrument has failed. So, if the instrument is not receiving electrical power, a red flag will be visible on the face of the instrument. Another important aspect to notice on the inside of the instrument is that the gimbal holding the gyro is not level. In fact, it's actually rotated 30 degrees. Unlike its older cousin, the turn and slip indicator, this change allows the instrument to also measure the rate of roll as you enter the turn. All right. I know that's, uh, that's a bit fast paced for a first thing in the morning, but write down the title of this video and who it's by. 
because it is a very good reference for when you're studying it, right? Because it does have all the information in there that you will need, and it'll make life a little bit easier um, when you're studying it. YouTube is a awesome source of information for anything that's technical or weather related or even navigation related. Law is law, is law. you just have to read and learn the law. Um, human factors as well, you know, anything information based is guaranteed to be pumping a little bit right? Um, the other thing you can do is, I don't know what this, this is, if we search up, uh, I don't know, I can't see what I'm typing. Oh, that's not what I want. <laughs> subject to a level that you guys will understand and need to know. Um, they are horrifically boring, some of them. They just sit there and it's like a robot voice talking the whole time. But they do explain all the information. So it's not much different to listening to me talk. Right? Right? No, not right. Uh, but yeah, use YouTube. Yeah, use YouTube. It's a really, really, really good resource. Alright, so... From that, we're just going to go through and cover gyros and go through the whole system um, in a slightly slower paced way so that you guys can remember it. Um, but again, when you're studying and you forget something, refer to that video because it's a really, really good one on gyros. There's also another couple that sort of explain how um, AHs work and that sort of thing. And when you get into doing all your CPL exams later on down the track, uh, you go into things like pendulous veins and all sorts of other exciting things which tend to break people's minds a little bit. Um, so if you use YouTube, it's an easy way to sort of visualise it yourself if that's how your brain works. Cool. All right, so what we'll go through is we'll go through a little bit more on gyros. You guys can talk to me a little bit about it now that you've uh, seen that video. Okay, we'll go through the vacuum system, so the standard way that most gyros operate in slightly older aircraft. Then we'll have a little bit more of a talk on um, how all the electric gyros and electronic um, gyroscopic instruments are presented now in new and modern aircraft. Um, so the turn coordinator, the AH, artificial horizon, and the DI, the directional indicator. Um, the DI can also be called the HI, and I think they call it a HI heading indicator in uh, the aspect exams. And we'll go through gyroscopic instrument errors. Again, sing out if you have any questions straight away, just ask. Alright, so what are the properties of a gyro? So the main thing that's special about a gyro and the reason why we use gyros is it has rigidity in space, right? You've all seen the little um, toys like this, right? You spin them up real fast and you put them on your finger and they just sort of sit there and you put them that way and they still sit there and they can just stay in space. They don't need anything to support them. You can support them just off the tiny end there and they'll hold themselves in space, which is really, really good because in an aircraft that's moving around in space, if we can't see outside, it gives us a little bit more information. So, a gyroscope has rigidity, and rigidity is the key point. That is its ability to maintain its alignment in space. Okay. So, what rigidity is, is it's proportional to one, the rotor mass. So, how heavy is the bit that's, that's spinning? Right. If it's really, really heavy, it's going to have lots of rigidity. If it's really, really light, it's going to have light rigidity. So it's the same thing, if you get one of those crappy little plastic spinny tops, how long do they spin for? Not that long. You get a nice metal one and spin it, how long can it spin for? Significantly longer because it's heavier, right? Because a spinning top is basically a form of gyro as well. Um, 
also proportional to the rotor RPM. Again, go back to the spinning top. If you spin it really slowly, sometimes it won't even stay up straight. If you spin it really quickly, then it'll sit there for ages. Right? Again, it's a, it's a gyro. And then the distance between that mass and the axis of rotation. So if you can get a heavy weight further away from the axis and spin it at a fast RPM, it's going to be better off than if you distributed that weight evenly throughout. So that's why gyros quite commonly in the middle are very, very thin, and then on the outer edge they have this thick little lip so that they have the mass further away because it makes it more efficient. Okay? So if you've got a, a big mass further away from the axis, um, you're going to get more rigidity. Right? So those three things affect the rigidity of a gyro. Now, one of the properties of a gyro is we have precession, okay? So what precession is, is it's when we apply a force to a gyro. So let's say we're spinning this gyro this way, and I apply a force to the top of it. Because this gyro is spinning, that force is then precessed through 90 degrees, okay? So even though I'm pushing up here, the gyro is feeling the force here. So as I push here, it's going to rotate this way. Does that make sense? Right? So that's what precession is. So it takes effect 90 degrees further from the axis of rotation. But if I, you know, if I've got this spinning this way, and I push it here, am I going to get any precession? No. It's only if I push this anywhere that way, so 90 degrees to the axis of rotation, or in the direction of the axis of rotation. Does that make sense? Okay. So that gyroscopic precession is really important to remember when you're figuring out how gyroscopic instruments work. Because you go, okay, well if I turn the aircraft, what force is going to actually be applied to the gyro? Oh, this force is, so how is that system going to work? Okay. So we apply a force here, that force then gets precessed 90 degrees through, and then the resulting movement is better. So the whole... Um, Gyro, or all gyros used to be vacuum powered or suction powered, to the point where on the side of most aircraft, right, so you're looking out there, this is a, a real old aircraft, just a one seater. Uh, they didn't have six instruments, but one would have drawn them on, so it looks like an aircraft. Out the side here, they have a little venturi tube kind of thing that comes in, squeezes, and then goes out. That resulting pressure there there'd be a lower static pressure, right? Because it has to accelerate through the venturi. So that lower static pressure was then routed to our gyroscopic instruments, spinning gyros. Problem is, if you went too slow, they stopped working. And if you were flying in IMC and slowed down, then it stopped working, and then the instruments didn't follow, and it all went that's up pretty quick. But that was the start of the vacuum system. So all it is is it's about pulling air through the system because on the gyros, if you look at the side of a gyro, so we have a terrible cross-section of a gyro, right? They've got little scoops cut into them. Okay? So these little scoops here, what happens is air gets pulled from, in this case, this way, and it gets pulled into that scoop, and as it hits the scoop, it creates a force and starts spinning it, right? So if you thought about it, not as pulling it, but just spraying a lens scan at it, right? <laughs> spray, I'm just using that, right? If you spray compressed air into that bucket, it would start spinning it faster and faster. It's like one of those little plastic uh, flower fan things you get, you blow them, it starts spinning fast. Same way, except instead of blowing, we're pulling the air through, right? So we have our vacuum pump at the end, and then that starts pulling air through. So the first thing we have is a vacuum relief valve, so if it's pulling too hard or there's a blockage in the system, the pump doesn't explode and ruin itself, right? So if it's pulling too hard and it can't get air through, the vacuum relief valve will let air in, okay? Then it keeps pulling, so it's pulling through both of these instruments, okay? And then it's pulling all the way up and we've got this air filter which is normally located in the cabin and behind the dash somewhere, okay? So it's pulling through this and it's sucking air in through here, pulling it through these instruments, through the little buckets on the rotors to get them to start spinning so that the gyros have rigidity. Somewhere in line, there'll be a suction gauge, okay? There can also be a low vacuum warning system, so there can be lights associated with it too. Um, 
and a horn sometimes, you can have circuit breakers, depends on the system, they're entirely different in each aircraft, but fundamentally that's the basic layout. So downstream, you have the vacuum pump, upstream of that you have the relief valve, then you have the instruments, and then upstream of that you have the air filter, and then somewhere along there you'll have suction gauges and that sort of thing. Everyone still with me? Good, not even nine o'clock. All right, so we have an engine driven vacuum pump. They are pretty much always engine driven. So if you have an entire electric failure, you still have your primary gyro instruments, okay? So it pulls air through. Generally, the amount of suction, four and a half to 5.4 inches of mercury. Important number, right? Somewhere around that. It will depend from aircraft to aircraft, but it'll roughly be about that much suction, which is quite a lot. Um, the suction gauge, it's normally a little button like this in the cockpit. If you're flying on a aircraft that's set up for IFR flying, sometimes you might have two suction pumps, right? So then you'll have a gauge which kind of has needles that go from here up to here and back down. On both sides, you have green range here, and you might have some warning lights down here as well, telling you when they're working. Um, on a little aircraft with one suction, oh, you'll just have a little button gauge hidden somewhere. Right. So the more likely it is for an aircraft to be flying IFR or flying on instruments in IMC, the more likely it is that suction gauge is going to be bigger and easier to see because it's more important. You're not going to take a robin flying through the clouds because you're <laughs> you want to do that, right? But something like a, I don't know, a caravan or an islander or something like that, um, you are going to end up flying through the clouds, so these systems are going to be better to show you if it's working or not. The air is always filtered air. Um, if it's not filtered, the amount of dust that gets into the gyros will go through the roof and then because of that you've got friction and then the gyro start getting error very early on. So they try and keep the system as clean as possible. You can never get rid of everything so it will slowly get worse and worse over time but they try and keep everything nice and clean. Common faults. So if we have a blockage on the air filter for whatever reason, okay, there's going to be either reduced suction, so not enough suction, or you're going to have to operate at a very high power setting to get the right amount of suction. Or there'll be none at all. Right? If it's completely blocked, there'll be no suction because it can't pull any air through that air filter at the end. The only thing it'll be pulling through is the vacuum relief valve, but you won't be able to see that. Um, if the vacuum pump entirely fails, how much suction are we going to have? None, right? Because not pulling any air through. You can sit there, find the tube, and <laughs> try and tuck on it, but it's probably not going to work. Suction's too high. That's also another hazard. What would be wrong with that? Um, if it spins the gyro too fast, then it might like, just completely break the instruments. Yeah, if you spin the gyros too fast, it could break the instruments, it could put the calibration out, right? Um, there's all sorts of things. But yeah, spinning a mass at a distance from something very, very quickly is going to produce a significantly larger force, so you'll probably end up breaking stuff, which isn't good. Okay. If you have less than the required suction, so less than four and a half mercury, four and a half mercuries, inches of mercury, inches of mercury, right? Um, does everyone know how, when, why we measure in inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury, depending on whether you're metric or imperial? Does everyone know how that system works? I'll draw it up quickly. I can't remember the numbers for this, but <coughs> just for an arbitrary number. So basically what they've got is they have a, a tube, which at the top here has a vacuum. Did I spell vacuum? I don't know. Extra C. 1C. 1C. Yeah. Two U's. Vacuum. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. So there's no air up here, right? Then it's filled with, guess what? Mercury, right? And then it sits in a tub, so it comes down, there's a little tub, and that's open to the air, or open to whatever it's measuring. 
in a very simple sense, right? The pressure, so the atmospheric pressure pulling down here is gonna push that mercury closer up towards that vacuum, right? If there's less pressure, it's gonna pull it back down. What you're measuring, because mercury is quite heavy, right? So that's why it doesn't just sit all the way at the top because there's a vacuum. If you did that with water, it would just sit up, right? So mercury is quite heavy. So what you're measuring is that distance there, right? So if the suction gives you enough so that you have four and a half or five inches of mercury of movement based off whatever the cal calibration is, that's where that number comes from. So that's why inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury is a measurement, because that's how they used to measure pressure. Yeah. Is that a sealed system within the? It's. They, there's no actual mercury gauge. It'll be a calibrated. It'll be like a capsule mm -hmm. that's just calibrated to read in that. It's just a unit that can be. It's the same as like a kilogram. There is the golden kilogram sitting somewhere, which is the the standard kilogram, mm -hmm. right? Same with that. Mm -hmm. You're not actually got a big tube of mercury sitting in your brain, because what does mercury do when it gets in contact with metal? Eats it, doesn't it? Eats it and goes through it. That's why you can't take mercury off the thermometers on planes. Because if it smashes, it will go through the floor and then through the bottom of the plane and take out whatever's in there on the way through. It goes through your hands too. Don't play with the mercury kids. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's where that unit of measurement comes from. So sometimes, especially in the States, all their sea level pressure is done in inches of mercury. So they have 29.92 is the standard. If you go to Russia or China, it's done either in hectopascals or millimeters of mercury because they're metric. Um, but again, that's where it comes from. All right, reduce suction. So if you have less than the required amount of suction, okay, what's gonna to happen to the gyros? They're not gonna be very accurate or they'll be very slow to give you a correct reading if they can. Yeah. The actual rotor itself is gonna spin slower, right? Because there's less air being pulled through because the suction is lower, which means the gyro is gonna spin slower, which means what's the stability of it? Quite little. Less, right? So now your instruments are gonna read erratically, they may not read correctly at all, they may not read full stop. They may just be sluggish, so if it's just a little bit lower than normal, then maybe they'll just be slightly slower, but prone to more error. Um, but again, you're gonna be, because if it's, if you have a very high rigidity gyro and you apply a force to it, it's not gonna move as much because it's got lots of rigidity. The force will still be processed, but it won't move as much because it's really, really rigid. If it's going really slowly, that force is gonna make a massive difference to it. Again, it's like your spinning top, right? Once it starts going, you know, when it spools down and starts doing that weird spinny thing, once it starts going, it just gets worse and worse and worse because as it's getting slower and slower, there's less and less rigidity, so it starts spinning around and toppling faster, right? So if the suction's too low and the rotor's spinning too low, it doesn't have enough rigidity to stay aligned in space, so any force that's applied to it might be enough to topple it. Cool. If there's no suction, after about one or two minutes of the gyros that were working normally, having no suction, they will cease to work at all, right? So they may just go, just go off to the side, it may start spinning, toppling, could do all sorts of things. High suction, rotor spins too fast, can cause damage, which is not good. So. All right, so the turn coordinator down here, or turn indicator, okay? The AH up here, attitude indicator, and the DI, DGI, or HI, heading indicator, is down here, okay? Very commonly, these two are gyros. This one is electric. The reason for that is if you have a suction failure, you have a standby instrument. It doesn't give you any pitch information, but what can tell you if you're going up or down when you're flying? Vertical speed indicator. Yep, your vertical speed indicator. Okay. Um, so that in combination with speed can give you your pitch, right? Because if that's going up and your speed is stable, then you know you're climbing at a stable speed, right? And you have so much pitch up. If you know that that's climbing and your speed's going down, you know your nose is pitched up too much, so you're slowing down, so you have to lower the nose. Same thing you can do with the altimeter. 
Um, vice versa, if this one fails, how do we know if we're in balance? That doesn't show us your though. You're, down, you're on the right path. How do we know we're in balance though? What does it look like when we're out of balance? So we have the nose off, but to go in, if we're going in a straight line, we end up doing this, right? So we're, in this case here, we're out of balance going in a straight line. If we were just out of balance, we would slowly be turning. Yeah? So if we don't have the ball, but we're wings level and not turning, then we're in balance. If we're wings level and we are slowly turning, then we're out of balance. If we're not wings level, but we're not turning, then we're also out of balance. Make sense? Go to straight forward. So you can get this information from here. A right one turn, you can calculate the bank angle. Don't ask me for the formula because I'm mind blank and I can't remember it right now. But if you, can, if you know your airspeed, you can figure out which angle of bank. Normally in a robin, doing 100 knots is about, about 10 or 12 degrees. This is the angle of bank for a right one turn. What is a right one turn? Um, it's the, when you, how long it takes to orbit, oh, wait, it takes two minutes to uh, orbit for 360 degrees. Like exactly. That, that so it takes two minutes to turn 360 degrees. Okay. So 180 degrees takes one minute, right? So three degrees per second. That's what a rate one turn is. It's all about how much you're changing direction. Yeah. So if you're going slower, a rate one turn, you're going to need a higher angle of bank to turn through it. If you're going faster, sorry, if you're going slower, you're going to need a lower angle of bank. If you're going faster, you're going to need a higher angle of bank. Yeah. That's why big jet like, you know, when you do a rate one turn in a robin, it's just like this. But then when you're coming into land in your A380, what does it do when it comes into land? It's doing like steep turns as it's coming in, because that's rate one as well. They actually get limited by angle of bank rather than rate of turn. Any questions thus far? Why is the two minutes relevant? As in, is it because if the instruments fail, then you just need to do the cup, use their watch or something? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, so one, it can give you a good way of changing headings. So if you're looking at a compass heading, you go up north and I want to turn onto east, so that's going to take me 30 seconds. So if I turn to the right for 30 seconds, I know I'm going to be heading east using a right one turn. But also, it's just this, it's, it's designed as a procedural, it's just a standard they made for procedural flying. So for example, when we're IFR or we're flying in clouds or doing whatever, so we're only flying on instruments, um, when we're doing holding patterns or reversal turns or anything like that, before they had distance measuring equipment, right? all you had was a beacon on the ground and you had your plane flying along and then it would read the arrow, in this case, is pointing towards the beacon. And then when you get overhead, it loses its mind. And then when you get on this side, the arrow points back this way. So then at that point, you start your, start your watch and you fly out for a minute, and then you turn around for a minute, and the arrow's pointing back this way, right? And if you fly back for a minute, you get back to here. So it's a way of setting yourself up. So for example, in this situation, you have your beacon down there, the aircraft flies in, you turn out, okay, and then you fly out for two minutes, turn around for one minute, fly in and descend down to a minimum altitude, and then the runway might be so it's a, it's, it's a procedural thing, that's why it's there, and that's why we use it. Um, fundamentally, there's nothing special about three degrees a second other than the fact it's procedural. It takes one minute to turn 180 degrees. So that's the basis for like an NDB approach or something? Yes. God help you if you have to fly an NDB approach though. Because if, if you look at your track from the top down, right, you've got your, so top down, Beacon here, runway here. While in theory we're flying straight towards it, what will actually happen is you'll do this, and then you'll do this, and then you'll turn around, and then you'll do this, and then you'll do this. Because the signal is so unreliable, if you keep a needle straight up, <laughs> because everything bends those signals, they're awful. But, mm. And that's why it's classed with a non precision approach. Yeah, but even VLRs are much more accurate. Mm. 
but yeah, NDB is non directional bit games. We get into that a bit later. Actually, I don't think we do. <laughs> Navigation, we get into it. A little bit. But yeah, it's, a, it's an IPART procedure, so it doesn't happen too much at the moment. Once you guys get your instrument ratings and you have the joys of learning about it. Actually, I think by the time you guys get your instrument ratings, they will have taken out NDBs out of the syllabus. Yes. Yeah, they're awful. All right. So, what's the difference between a turn coordinator and a turn indicator? This one? Turn, coor uh, yep, turn coordinator. This one? Turn indicator. Okay? So, this one here, a turn coordinator, gives you a rate of turn and initially it gives you a rate of roll. So, when you're sitting there and you roll in to your rate one turn, as you roll in, that turn coordinator will move and show the aircraft doing this. If you have a turn indicator, when you roll in, nothing will happen. Only once you start turning will it start showing a rate one turn because it's only showing you the rate of turn. The turn coordinator shows you that initial rate of roll. That's why a turn coordinator, really good when you're limited panel because if the wings are level here, then you should be pretty close to wings level. Right, if you're in balance, and not turning, you should be going wings level, right? If it starts going wing down, you can pick it up straight away. With a turn indicator, if it starts turning, that means you've already been started rolling in, right? So you end up doing this a bit more, okay? So turn coordinator shows you an initial rate of roll and the rate of turn. A turn indicator only indicates turn, right? So indicator indicates turn, coordinator coordinates the turn, so it helps the start as well as the actual turn. Okay. Both of them measure a rate of turn, so this mark here is a rate one turn, and that little mark there is also a rate one turn. Okay. They normally have balance balls as well, right. keeping the aircraft in balance is always good, otherwise you have the little bit of string attached to your windscreen, keep the string straight up and down and you're in balance, generally. Um, doesn't indicate an angle of bank though, okay? None of them indicate an angle of bank, but they will indicate a rate of roll. So as you start rolling in, it will show that you're rolling in, okay? This one won't. Turn coordinator also indicates the roll rate, okay? It doesn't give you any pitch information though, right? It will not tell you if you're going up or down. You can be pointing at the ground, and as long as you're not turning, it won't show anything, right? So that's where you have to use things like the altimeter and your airspeed and the VSI. Happy? Somewhat? Why have I lost it on my screen? Here? Okay, so a turn coordinator slash turn indicator, okay, it's a rate gyro. You need to know these. Okay, so a rate gyro. It has freedom of, bleh, freedom of movement in two planes, and it's a horizontal axis gyro. Okay? You need to know this. Right? So a rate gyro, which means it has freedom of movement in two planes, and it's a horizontal axis. Okay? So from the gyro, we can see in this case, we've got the aircraft, it's going this way, right? This is our aircraft, it's going this way. We have our gyro, gyro and its horizontal axis and it's spinning, right? It's got rigidity, it's spinning. Now, we decide we're gonna turn to the left, okay? So as we turn to the left, it feels a force pushing it this way and that way, right? So pushing on the gyro that way, because of precession, what happens? It reflects it at the top. Yeah, so these forces now aren't on the sides, they're on the top and the bottom. Okay? So now we have a force pushing 
on the top here. Does everyone with me and understand this so far? Right? As we're turning, small force here because we're turning the aircraft, that force is then precessed. Okay? So now the whole gyro wants to tilt a little bit this way. Okay? So it tilts a little bit this way, which means the spindle here moves out this way. And see how it's got a little, um, sorry, a crank arm moves and it's got a little spindle through here that's sitting above the pivot point. So it's going to pull this needle out to the left. Right, so as it's turning, it's pulling this needle out because the whole cage is moving, crank arm, pulling this little pivot, pulling the indicator to the left, showing a turn to the left. Does everyone follow through on that? Okay. If the pivot point was here, then it would go the other way. So that's why the pivot point's below this spindle, so it's going to pull it to whichever way it's turning. Happy? This diagram should be in your books. Should. Might not be. It's not good. Okay. It has calibrated springs here, okay? So only so much force can be applied, okay? So it can only show, it's only calibrated to show less than rate one, rate one, or more than rate one. It's not going to give you rate two, or those aren't actual things, but you know, it's not going to start telling you, hey, we're doing seven degrees a second. It's only calibrated to show you when you're at a rate one turn, so when you're at three degrees. Yep. So does the rotor always stay vertical or horizontal? Yeah, so when we talk about gyros, we normally talk about the axis it's rotating on. So the axis of our aircraft's here, right? It's always going to be like that. So the rotor's going to always be spinning that way, this way, right? In the direction. Yeah, depending on which way you look at it. <laughs> yeah. Go. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any questions on turn coordinators slash indicators? Excellent. Change slides. Oh no. My clicky thing's died. Oh no. Maybe it hasn't. Hey. All right. The balance ball. Pretty pretty advanced instrument here. Uh, it's a ball in a tube, which tells you if you're going in balance or not, right? So you have your ball in your tube, you move out to one side, again it's like the acceleration error and compass, you move, it swings out, that's the ball, right? If you've got a force that's not perfectly in balance, it's going to move one way or the other. You're in your car, you turn around the corner, how do you feel? You feel like you're getting pushed out of the corner, so what would the ball do? Yeah, go out to the side. So then in your car, you need more right rudder. So you go around the car and put more right rudder in. Get up there. <laughs> if you do enough flying in one day, you will get confused one day when you're driving. I've done that before. I did it was left here once and it was Great. quite late. I've done like a 12 hour day. I'm driving down the road and for the first about a minute, I was on the centre line. <laughs> so, oh yeah, sweet. Cruising down the road. Nice, good landing. And the person who was with me was like, what are you doing? <laughs> that's, that's not how roads work. Um, okay, so really, really simple. Okay. So it tells us the direction of the G-forces, and it makes sure, basically, that the tail of the aircraft is following the nose of the aircraft. Okay. So it's making sure that when we go into a turn, when we roll in, tail follows the nose. Not when we roll in, tail doesn't follow the nose. Right? You always want the aircraft to be nicely in balance because if you're out of balance, then you have issues with blanketing one wing, you've got less lift, um, this wing's going to stall before the other wing, all sorts of exciting things. Okay? So we want to make sure we're in balance. The ball's not in the center, we're either slipping or skidding. Straight balance flight. We're going straight, we're not turning, we're in balance. Straight flight skidding. Right? We're going straight, but the ball's out to one side. Okay. So in this case, we've got too much left rudder in. So to correct it, we need Bank. to correct it, we need less left rudder and ball right. Yeah, right rudder, right? Get the ball in the middle. Stand on the ball. If the ball's out to the right, push on the right rudder. Okay. If we're in a nice balanced left turn, we're turning to the left, ball's in the middle, tail's following the nose. Right? 
if we're skidding out of the turn, right? So skidding out of the turn, what happens is we've rolled into the turn, okay? But now we're skidding out of the turn, okay? So we're Tokyo drifting. So if you're skidding, skidding out of the turn. So you have too much rudder into the turn, which is causing the plane to slide out of the turn, all right? Think about it like a car. If you're skidding out of the turn, what happens? You're going this way, so the nose is going to be pointed down into the turn, right? So to fix it, we need... Step on the right. Step on the ball. Yeah, right, right. If we do that, it comes back. If we're slipping into the turn, right? Slipping into the turn, that means the nose is out of the turn. Okay, so in this case, it means the left and we're slipping in, right? So slipping in, nose is out, slipping in, so in this case, to fix it, what do we need? Left. Left rudder. And then the tail. Yeah. When, so, when I step on the left rudder, the flaps goes left or so, right? The rudder flap. The rudder. So if you stand on the left rudder, what happens is we have our nice pretty aircraft. I can't, so this is where the stick aircraft comes in. <laughs> the other day. So we have our aircraft. If we stand on the left rudder, we have to create a force that the nose is going this way. So to do that, we need to push the tail that way. Rudder goes that way. Okay. Right. So that creates a force with the airflow, creates some lift, going this way, tail goes that way, nose goes that way. We'll get into that in a second later on today. All right. What are the serviceability checks for a turn coordinator? So when we're on the ground, we want to make sure that they're actually working and it's giving us correct information. So one, if it sounds like the APU of a 787, there's probably something wrong, right? Some aircraft you will turn on and you will hear the uh, gyro spin up. And you turn the battery on, you'll hear the gyro spin up. And you If it sounds like an APU, there's probably something wrong. So make sure it's not ridiculously noisy. There's no failure flags if it's electrically driven. If we have a look down here on our trusty Robin panel, see that red flag there? That means it's failed. Also means probably the battery's off, but it's failed, right? If it's vacuum driven, make sure you have the correct vacuum or the correct suction, okay? And then when we're turning, make sure it's indicated correctly. So when we turn to the left, what should it show? Going this way. Yeah, we turn to the left. If we turn to the right, right. Turn, to the right. turn to the right. What should the ball do? Down there. When we're turning. If you've got no rudder uh, and you're turning left, the ball will be on the right. Yeah, well, it will be on the ground, right? So it's like driving your car. When you turn around a corner, what happens? Skid out of the all right. Um, cool. The artificial horizon, the AH, or the attitude indicator, displays pitch and roll information, right? It's what we call the master instrument. When you start doing instrument flying, your scan is entirely based off this instrument. So when you're scanning, your scan looks like this. Speed. Now you see why instrument flying gets a bit of brain power reducing, right? <laughs> if you guys ever do your instrument rating, there will be a time where we'll ask you what your name is and you'll tell us to stand by because you don't have an inch of free, free brain space. <laughs> because you have to do that, which is alright, that's what you have to do on your PBR base, right? Manage to fly the aircraft. Okay, you have to do that. Alright, well now you have to manage the radios as well and make radio calls and that sort of thing. But to do that, you need to know where you are. So now you've got an extra two instruments, or three, or four, telling you where you are. And you have to interpret those in the right way and have them set correctly so that you can interpret where you are. Um, and then you have to manage all the aircraft systems. So you have to do any pre-landing checks and that sort of thing and set that up. And um, then you have to load approaches and be able to fly approaches. So fly on the correct heading with the correct instrument setting down to the correct altitude at the correct rate of descent based on the wind and based on the ground speed, holding the correct amount of drift. And then someone will give you an engine failure and you have to manage that as well. So you're sitting there and you've got a million and one things going on. So that's why instrument flying can get a bit exciting. But don't worry, by the time you get... <laughs> not, don't let me put you off it, it's great fun. 
Um, all right. So it's our master instrument. It gives us the same information that we can get from looking outside, right? Except it's a little bit less accurate because when we're flying along and we put the nose up this much on the horizon, we get a 200 foot a minute climb. Real easy to see when you're looking outside the window. You can see exactly where the nose is in relation to the horizon. Really, really easy. When you're looking in here, a two degree pitch up is a movement of my finger from here to here. How many of you guys are going to pick that up? Probably not, right? So it gets really, really tricky. The trick is when you're flying on instruments, don't do this, right, until you get to instrument flying. These instruments are basically useless before then because you won't have the hand foot coordination to make it work. But you use the little dot here, and then you basically dis dissect it, or you bisect it with this, um, your horizon line, and you figure exactly where it sits. You go, okay, it sits a third down of that dot, right? That dot is tiny. But if you get it that accurate, that's how you get a nice accurate picture information. But until you've done 30 hours of flying, just look out the window. And even once you've done 100 hours of flying, keep looking out the window. Only if you're in a cloud, then look at that. But until you have an instrument rating, don't go into a cloud. You will die. Hmm. All right. So it's a Earth gyro. You will need to know that. It has freedom of all three planes, but a pendulum or the pendulous veins keeps the rotor always pointing straight down. So it has a vertical axis gyro. So we have our aeroplane, we have our vertical axis, we have our gyro spinning around. Right round, baby, right round, like the record. Right? So it's. Um, connected to various gimbals. So in this case, we've pitched the aircraft up, okay? So if we pitch the aircraft up, we create a down force at the back, which is then rotated through 90 degrees here, which then creates a roll force here, which then, through this pin, <laughs> pin here, picks up the horizon card, and or pushes down on the horizon card as it's pulling up, which shows a slight climb. Because this here stays the same, the card in the background moves, right? If we roll, it creates a force forward, uh, sorry, if, yeah, if we roll, it creates a force forward or back, which, via the gearing mechanism, rolls the horizon card, okay? But for a PPL, we need to know an earth gyro, it's got a freedom of movement in all three planes. It is kept in line via pendulous veins, okay? Or a pendulum, and it is a vertical axis gyro. Questions on that? Cool. Fundamentally, if you ever get confused with the gyros, just break it down to how it should behave. Right? Well, what do I see on an AH? Well, I see pitch and roll. So which way does the gyro have to be faced so that I can get pitch and roll information? Well, it has to be a vertical axis, otherwise I'm going to lose out on one of those pieces of information. Right? I'm not going to get any turning information, but that's okay, because I don't need any turning information. Happy? Excellent. Serviceability checks. One, make sure the gyro is rotating. Okay? You won't be able to hear any noise because the engine is normally running with these ones. Um, no failure flags if it's electrically driven. Also, some suction ones will have flags as well. All right? That's common too. Make sure it's got the correct vacuum. If you're about to perform manoeuvres, so uh, steep turns, loops, rolls, any aerobatics like that, you can cage some gyros, which basically means you pull out a caging knob which aligns it all up. Yeah. And then uh, when you do your manoeuvre, if, if you can lock the cage, it'll just stay there. It won't give you any information, it'll just say you're going straight and level, but it'll stop it spinning around in front of you, because if it topples, it normally, it'll either sit there and most AHs do this. They do this real wavy motion, which if you're ever flying on instruments and that happens, it's quite exciting. Because you're like, that's a very aggressive movement I'm doing. <laughs> oh wait, no, I'm not doing that. Um, but yeah, just be cautious of that. They can't, any of these gyros can topple. Right? None of them have a freedom of movement through 360 degrees in their plates. All right.
So our directional gyro, so our DG, our HI, or our DI, right? There's so many names for this. Um, basically, overcomes the failings of a magnetic compass because in turbulence, the compass is woo, dancing all over the show. You can't read anything it's saying. Okay, so we can use a DI. It's not subject to any of those acceleration or turning errors because it's not a compass, right? And it makes accurate heading holding much, much easier. Because reading this, really easy. Reading the tiny compass at the top, quite difficult. Okay? So it makes life nice and easy. It's a tied gyro. Okay, so we've got a right gyro, an earth gyro. This one is a tied gyro. It has a freedom of movement in all three planes, but it's kept in one plane by an outside force, aka the gimbal and the spring. Right? Write that down, that's important. That will be the answer to one of the questions in the exam. Okay. It is a horizontal axis gyro. Okay. And the way it works is similar to the way a turn coordinator works, but it's got a gearing mechanism when it turns, rather than just being directly connected to a spindle, because it has to show turning through 360 degrees. Okay. Um, cool. <clears throat> well, I'm going to lose my voice. I don't know why. Eh? Some days I can talk all day, and that's fine. And other days it's like after an hour or so. Oh no, here we go. I think it was a CPL ground course, and I was doing it for a week. And by the end of it, I was just sitting up here whispering because I don't know. It's also real creepy when someone whis whispers to you about chakras. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, got that written down? Fantastic. Alright, what are the issues with a DG or a DI or an HI? Okay. One, it loses its alignment due to one, the fact the Earth's rotating. Okay. So as the Earth rotates, we have some error in it. And there's friction in the gyro too. Right? Gyros are not frictionless instruments. Nothing is a frictionless instrument. We haven't figured that one out yet. Okay? We have electric instruments, but they're magic. Um, so because of this, I can't remember what the error is. It's something like 15 degrees and... No. Is it in your books what the error is from uh, the Earth's rotation? I can't remember off the top of my head. Three, uh, three degrees an hour? That's more. as the Earth's rotating, the gyro gets misaligned with where its north should be, right? Um, or where you've set it up as north, so you will get drift. Now, most gyros are designed for where you are roughly in the world to have it compensated out. Because if you think about it, if you're on the poles, right, so you're on the North Pole, and you're facing um, directly south or directly east or west or whatever it is, Right? In 24 hours, that's gone through 360 degrees. Right? So on the poles, over 24 hours, you're going to have heaps of error. On the equators, you're going to have none. Right? So as you're at those higher latitudes, you have more error. Now, it's generally designed out of the gyro. There's calibration for it so that you don't have 360 degrees of error in 24 hours. Right? If you're at the poles. But um, you will still get some error. Okay? Realigning, generally, it's manual. You can get slaved HS, uh, DIs or HSIs, um, which are slaved to the compass. So the compass has a sensor in it, which is then connected back to the DI, and then that keeps aligning the compass and the DI constantly. So it's always aligned, which is great. It's nice and easy. However, 
most aircraft have manual. So every 10 minutes, just look at the compass, oh yeah, light it up. Right. One flight, just leave it. Leave it for the whole flight and come back and see how much error you get. It's normally be like 30 degrees over an hour flight if you're doing lots of turning exercises. It can be quite a lot. Um, two, realign it, push in the caging knob, turn it. Push, twist, push, twist, push, twist. Some ones you have to push in quite hard to turn them so that they actually disengage properly. Others, you don't have to push in that hard at all, it just depends. Um, if you have a toppling card, so a spinning card, so when this gyro topples, the card just sits there and spins, which is also very disorientating, quite annoying. Push the caging knob in, stops it spinning, and then realign it. Serviceability check, so one, noise, make sure one, you can hear a little bit, but not too much, which you won't be able to because the engine will be running. There's no failure flags if it's driven or if they have flags, there's the correct vacuum. And then while you're taxiing, check that the turns are indicating correctly. So when you're turning to the left, it's actually turning to the left. When you're turning to the right, it's actually turning to the right. So when you're doing your taxi checks, it goes like this. So you go turn, so let's say we're turning to the left, okay? So turn, skid, turn. So if you're turning to the left, numbers should be decreasing, right? So turn, skid, turn, numbers decreasing, level, right? Wing should be level. If that's showing the rate of turn while you're turning, then this is buggered. Turn, which is your compass, right? Numbers decreasing. And you go back around to the right. Turn to the right, skid. Um, turn, numbers increasing. Level, turn, numbers increasing. That's your taxi check. Turn, skid, turn, level, turn. Happy? Cool. All right. Um, if we have low rotor RPM, we can get erratic, incorrect indications, or slow response. If it's electrically driven, once it drops below a certain speed, that failure warning flag will show up. If it's vacuum driven, the only way we know is by checking the suction gauge. Some of them have flags, most of them don't have flags, so we need to check the suction, right? That's why when we do our SADI checks, the first S is suction. Okay? Um, often, AHDI uses suction, Tur coordinator uses electricity, that just gives you a little bit of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Redundancy. Redundancy, thank you. Um, so if your vacuum system fails, you don't have, you're not fully left in the dark with a compass and an altimeter and your SB going, uh. um, Toppling, spinning cards, they're not good. If they go for a long time, you can get instrument damage, sometimes, depending on the instrument. So you don't want to let it topple for ages because it'll be incredibly annoying as well as not good for the instrument. Yeah. How was that? Not too painful? Good. Um, normally there's a few questions on these gyros, right? What, taught a gy what sort of gyros they are, how they work, what axis they're normally in, what planes of uh, movement they have. You can anticipate those questions, you normally get them. I don't know, Aspect just likes those questions. That being said, now that I've told you that you'll probably get those questions, you maybe won't get them. <laughs> but now that I've said that, you might. And now that I've said that, you might. Okay. Um, but yeah, last time I told someone something was almost definitely in the exam. It wasn't in the exam for anyone who sat in. Like, what? <laughs> but that's all right. All right, let's take a uh, 12 and a half minute coffee break. So back at... Oh god. Uh, five zero. Okay, zero. So ten to ten to eleven ten to ten? Ten to ten. Go.
All right. So what we'll go through now is we'll go through uh, a bit on properties of air, so the atmosphere. Um, we'll talk about density, pressure, temperature, density, altitude, what it is. We'll go through ISA, so the values for ISA, and then how we use that to calculate density and performance from there. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, so in the atmosphere, it's composed of mainly nitrogen, so 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and all the other stuff's that 1%. All right. So mostly stuff that does nothing really, apart from cause diet is a massive pain in the ass. Nitrogen, oxygen, that's the good stuff that makes our brains work. And then the other stuff, what's that other stuff made up of? Carbon dioxide. That's probably not a majority. But 0 0.0001 is carbon dioxide. Greenhouse. Oh, climate change isn't happening. We don't have greenhouse gases. <laughs> yep, that would be a tiny proportion, though. What do you think the most of it is? So the majority of that 1% is argon, right? And then it's neon, xenon, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and some other stuff. Ozone, and then all the other stuff. Tiny amounts, right? But it's mainly oxygen and nitrogen, right? So that's the vast majority of it. Now, density. So density is the amount of stuff in a space, right? Density of air, fairly low. Density of lead, very high, right? Lead's got a lot of stuff in a small amount of space. That's why it's heavier. Air doesn't have as much stuff. That's why it's less heavy, right? Now, density is a property of mass, but not solely, okay? So don't get confused just because it's heavy that it's very dense. Um, for a given volume of air, so if we take a cubic meter of air, as we go up in altitude, what happens to the air density? Complex. Yeah, goes down. Okay. Now, as we go up, because of that, because there's less air up high, we have less air entering the engine, so we get less power, right? Which means we can climb less, so eventually we top out, right? We get to full throttle, and the engine just can't give us any more than what we've got, so we end up just sitting at zero rate of climb, sitting there. Okay. Also, because the air is less dense, we get slightly less lift being produced for a given true airspeed, right? For a given indicated airspeed, we have exactly the same amount of lift. All right, so um, at altitude, the atmosphere is thinner, less mass for a given volume. And so, for example, at uh, sea level, the standard density Okay, it's 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. Quite a lot, eh? How big do you reckon this room is? How long do you reckon it is this way? Who's a builder? No. Who's got a good eye on it? Six or seven meters. Six or seven meters? Yeah, it's going eight. <laughs> Probably eight meters. What do you reckon this way? Probably more, actually. This way would be eight meters. Maybe six. Alright, let's go with six by nine metres. How tall do you reckon this room is? Two, three. Two, three? Two, two point three? three. Alright, who's got a calculator? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, it's got the school calculator. Yeah, it's too expensive to throw it. The safety thing on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, six times nine times, how high did we decide it was? Two and a half. Two and a half. 35 meters cubed times by 1.225. So the mass of this air, or the you know the mass of the air in this room, 165 kilos. Quite a lot, eh? So density down at sea level, quite low. As we get up high, so let's say top of Mount Cook, so that's around 12,000 feet. 
No? Drops significantly. So up there, it's 0 0.85 kilograms per meter cubed. Right? So that is significantly less dense than it is down at sea level. Okay? Now, what happens to uh, density with temperature? It's less dense the hotter the temperature is. Why? Because hot air rises? Yeah, no, it's not like other pieces. Yeah, because temperature is a measure of energy, right? So if we increase the energy of something, those molecules, wee, start getting more excited. So they start taking up more space. So they move faster, they get further apart. So that air um, parcel will expand until the air in it is at the same pressure as the surrounding pressure, okay? So as the temperature increases, there's less mass per cubic meter. So the density is reduced. If we cool it down, the opposite happens. Okay? Now, in terms of aerodynamic performance, if we're going at a true airspeed, we have less molecules going over the wing for a given true airspeed. Okay? So what's going to happen to our lift if there's less air molecules going over the wing? Less lift. Less lift, right? So now it's harder to maintain lift. So we need to go faster, which is how we get an increased TAS. So remembering that our lift formula is lift is equal to the coefficient of lift times half rho V T squared S. It's a good one to remember, right? Coefficient of lift, that's all about our angle of attack and our um, camber. Half rho, that's all to do with density, or rho is to do with density. Vt squared, so our true airspeed squared, times half our air density, right? So they're proportional to each other. So that basically gives us our indicated airspeed, right? So if we take our true airspeed and correct it for density, minus a few other things, that gives us our indicated airspeed, right? So our indicated airspeed times the surface area, because if we have a bigger wing, are we going to get more or less lift? More, more lift, right? So if we Angle of attack, camber, indicated airspeed, size of the wing. Looks complex, it's not. But it is. But it's not. But it is. It's not. Okay. So pressure, temperature, and density all decrease with altitude. Okay? So as we go up, the air pressure reduces. Right? Why does the air pressure reduce as we increase in altitude? What's the main reason? What is pressure? How do you apply pressure on something? Push it. Push it, right? That's all pressure is. So we have our earth down here, and we have our sea level molecules, and they're getting pushed down by our 1,000 foot molecules, and they're getting pushed down by our 2,000 foot molecules, and they're getting pushed down by our foot molecules, but as you go up, these guys are getting pushed down from all of them. These guys are getting pushed down from all the guys above them. These guys are only getting pushed down from the guys above them. So as you go up, there's less stuff pushing down on that layer that you're in. So as you increase, the pressure is going to reduce because of that. Right? And that's part of why the density reduces um, as well. Does any of that have to do with gravity and the molecules being pushed nah. down? Well, if you had more gravity, yeah. it would pull the molecules down harder, so you'd have a higher sea level pressure. Right. Right. Um, all right. So, ISA is our international standard atmosphere. Get used to this. You will need to know this off by heart because it's just it's used literally every day. So, it's a hypothetical set of atmospheric conditions based on just global averages. Okay. So, in theory, on an absolutely average day. This is what had happened. Why do we have this? What do you think? Do we ever actually have a perfectly standard day? Probably not. I mean, maybe. Once in a blue moon, right? So what's the point? So everyone's on the same field to calculate certain... To calculate the stuff, right? Because if I, let's say I made an aircraft and I tested my aircraft in a really high density day and I said, hey, this aircraft is awesome, it performs so well, it climbs so well, 
It can fly so slowly. It can take off in a tiny amount of distance. It can land in a really short distance. It's awesome. And then my mate, who's dick, copies my plane idea and puts a different brand on it and calls it a Cessna. And then he does all his testing in a really low density day. But now the performance he's got is terrible and awful and it can't climb and it can't do anything, even though it's the exact same plane. So that wouldn't work, would it? So what happens is when we do aircraft testing and that sort of thing, everything's reduced back to ISA. So it creates this set rule. So this is what it is in these conditions. And then from there, we can calculate it out. So we can go, okay, well, we know that the aircraft will behave like this at 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet or 3,000 feet in these conditions. So then we take our current conditions, which maybe it's, a, it's colder than ISA, the pressure is higher than ISA, okay? So the density is gonna be more dense than ISA. So it's gonna be as if we're lower than where we would be in the international standard atmosphere. So then we can pick our point in the international standard atmosphere that relates to the actual day, because that's what all the aircraft data performance is done on. All the aircraft performance data is done on. Does that make sense? So the sea level pressure is 1013.25 hectopascals, okay? Or 29.92 inches of mercury. Okay? So that's the sea level pressure. The pressure lapse rate up until about 5,000 feet, or for any calculations within sort of reasonable rate, we say it's one hectopascal per 30 feet. That's just an average, it's not actually that, um, because obviously the pressure lapse rate from sea level to 1,000 feet is gonna be significantly different from the pressure lapse rate from four to 5,000 feet. But again, we're just trying to bring it down to a standard atmosphere, okay? Sea level temperature is 15 degrees. That temperature will lapse at a rate of 1.98 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet to 3,000, uh, sorry, 36,090 feet. You don't need to know about that top one, I don't think. Um, so what that means is at sea level, the temperature is 15 degrees. At 1,000 feet, the temperature is 13 degrees. At 2,000 feet, the temperature is 11 degrees. At 3,000 feet, the temperature is nine degrees, and so on and so forth, yeah? So that is the standard rate that the temperature lapses at, okay? It doesn't actually lapse that way. Maybe it does, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But that's just a standard temperature lapse rate. Okay? Sea level density is 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay? Standard density. So you need to know these, those are important. Particularly, sea level pressure, pressure lapse rate, sea level temperature, temperature lapse rate. Those ones you will use pretty much every day when you fly. All right, density and performance. If we have high pressure and low temperature and there's no water vapor in the air, what's gonna to happen to the density of the air? Okay, well what's high pressure doing to the density? Stuff's a lot of stuff into the atmosphere. So there's gonna be more or less stuff in a given space. More. So the density is gonna be higher. Higher, okay. <coughs> and now we cool it down. Then what happens? Less density. They slow down, so they get closer together. So then we can fit more stuff into the same amount of space, right? So what happens to the density? Even bigger. Gets even better, right? So now it's even higher density, okay? Now, we had some water molecules floating around in there that were sort of pushing apart all the other molecules, and then we pulled them out. What's that now happened to the air density? So we got rid of the stuff that does, we got entirely rid of all those water molecules that were in there. Let's say originally we had 2% of that cube was water molecules, now we pulled them all out. Now, just there. Even more space to stuff, even more. Yeah, space. we can now put in 2% more of those air molecules. So we're gonna get even higher density. So if we have high pressure, low temperature, and it's dry, we get the best density. Best density means best performance, okay? because the aircraft feels like it's performing at a lower altitude, right? Which is good. If we have really dense day, we've, we're good, we're happy. If we have low pressure, what happens to the density? Gets less. What about high temperature? 
And if we're whacking a whole heap of water molecules in there as well? Even less. Even less, right? So now, our density is awful, right? So we have the worst density. So what's going to happen to our climb performance, our takeoff performance, our landing performance? Yeah, it's all going to get worse, okay? So what we can do is we can calculate things out. So we can go, hey, at North Shore today, it's, let's say North Shore is actually at 1,000 feet. All right, just to put a round number on it, because otherwise this gets too tricky. Um, and the temperature today is, uh, let's say it's middle of winter, early in the morning, it's three degrees. Okay? And the pressure is, say it's a nice high pressure system, 1031. Right? It happens, middle of winter, nice high pressure system. We're not at a thousand feet, but you know, just to make life easy. So first thing we do is we figure out, well, what should the temperature be at North Shore at 1,000 feet? What is the ISO temperature at North Shore at 13,000? At 1,000 feet. 13 degrees-ish. Thirteen degrees, right? Two degrees per 1,000 feet, it is 13 degrees. So the temperature at North Shore reflected in an ISA value. So you'll see this term quite a lot, an ISA temperature. It will say ISA plus or minus whatever the difference is. So what are, what is our ISA temperature? Negative 10. Yeah, we're 10 degrees less than ISA, right? So now our ISA temperature at North Shore is minus 10 degrees, okay? What about the difference between ISA and our hectopascals? So we got 1013 is our normal ISA. Right? And then if we, um, or let's do it the other way around, so if we've got 1031, take away ISA gives us what? 31 minus 13? 18. 18? Yep. Cool. I can't do maths. Alright, so 18. What was the correction for the. Uh, 30 feet per hectopascal. 30 feet per hectopascal, cool. So, feet. 540 feet. 540 feet. Right, so now North Shore's pressure altitude, because we've just corrected for pressure, is 1,000. 540 feet. Right. North Shore's temperature, normally we do this to pressure altitude, but in this case we've just done it to North Shore, is minus 10 degrees. Now the correction for that is 120 feet per degree. So we're now, sorry, this should be the other way around. Our pressure altitude is going to be 1,000 feet minus that, so it's going to be 460 feet. Right? because the pressure is higher, the air gets denser, so we feel like we're lower than we actually are. So then we have to correct for temperature. One thousand two hundred feet. So now the, we actually feel like we're at minus... Someone maths that for me. Um, at what? What's that, minus 740? Is that how maths works? So even though we're actually a thousand feet above sea level, we feel like we're 740 feet below sea level because the performance is really good. Right. We'll go through these in a second when we do performance calculations, but I just want you to see how much of a difference it can make. Right? That's 1,700 feet of difference, which is a lot. Right. All right. When they're talking about dry and wet, is that relative humidity? Humidity, or is relative humidity something a little bit different? So relative humidity is a percentage, right? And it's all about, so relative humidity, let's say it's 30 degrees, mm -hmm. and the relative humidity is 50%. Uh, yeah. 
arbitrary numbers. If we now made it 10 degrees, with the same amount of water in the air, mm -hmm. relative humidity would probably be very close to 100%. Because this temperature here can't hold as much water as this temperature can. Mm -hmm. right? But if you get 0%, that means there's no water vapour in the air at all. But it's all to do with the temperature. So you can have a low relative humidity on a hot day, mm -hmm. and it still have more water vapour in the air than high relative humidity on a cold day, if that makes sense. Right, so it's a percentage of... Uh, Actual it's it's a percentage of the amount of water that it can, that hold. can hold. Then what's the standard unit for humidity? Is uh, there is no is standard reduction because it's so Fuck it's right. very difficult to calculate what water vapour does to performance. We know that if it's a humid day the performance is worse and if it's a dry day the performance is better mm -hmm. but we don't have any values to reduce okay. that or raise it. Alright. So when we get into performance, we'll go through and do some calculations on density altitude. Okay, so what we're going to go through now is a little bit of basic POF, so basic principles of flight, going through some simple aerodynamics, aerofoils, Newton and Bernoulli's theorem, lift drag, and what the lift drag ratio is. Okay? Any questions? Sing out straight away. Alright, so an introduction to aerodynamics. We have a block moving this way, these are meant to be straight lines, the board's curvy. Uh, moving this way so it's experiencing wind from in front of it, right? With me so far? As something moves through the air, you feel a component of wind coming from it. So this here is called our relative airflow, right? Because it's easier to think about the air moving and our object being still than having the air still and us moving through it when we're trying to draw it up. So we draw it up as the object being still and we just draw the airflow moving. Okay? If we do this, we have a large aerodynamic force, right? Because there's a large surface area exposed to that relative airflow. If we put it sideways, same thing, same movement, same relative airflow, we get a smaller aerodynamic force, right? Because there's a less surface area. If we angle it, what happens? What happens to our force? Up because of the increased surface area. So we're going forward, we get a relative airflow from the front, we get an aerodynamic force that's up and back. And it's all to do with vectors, right? So we have air coming here, and then at the end it's coming here. So we have moved that air down this way, right? Every force needs to have an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, because we've moved it down, it's going to have to push this back the same way. It's the same thing if you stick your, car at, yeah, stick your car out the hand window, stick your hand out the car window, and angle it, what happens? It goes up and back. So exactly the same thing that happens with aerodynamics. But that's fairly inefficient, right? Because otherwise we'd all just have bits of 2 by 4 for our wings and it would be fine. Right? It doesn't work so well. Because there's a lot of drag from that. So we create aerofoils. Now, what aerofoils are, is there a component that produces a lift? So real early on, Wright Brothers era, they had this weird, what we call, under wing. Okay? So underneath the wing, it came up, and they created this curved shape, right? So I'm trying to mimic bird's wings. And then eventually, people discovered that that wasn't super efficient. Because what happened when you started going fast and at low angles of attack was the airflow would come up over here, lovely, but then the airflow under here would do that and you'd have lots of turbulence in here, which creates drag. Right. When you're going slow and you had the air, airfoil like that, it was great. Nice and efficient, very good for slow flight. Once you go faster, it didn't work very well at all. So then we came up with a few different airfoils. Now the most common type that's very similar to the second one down here, third one, sorry, is a general purpose airfoil. So it's it's not super thick, it's got the cord at around about sort of 70 to 75%, um, but it produces a relatively large amount of lift for a relatively low amount of drag. High lift aerofoils produce more lift than a general purpose aerofoil, hence being called high lift aerofoils, but they also produce, what do you think, more or less drag? More drag, right? They're bigger, they're chunkier, they're going to produce more drag. So, you can't fly as fast. You can only fly slow. High speed 
how do you think these performed at low speeds in terms of lift? Terrible. Yeah, not that great. Trash, as someone would very intellectually put it. <laughs> um, high speed aerofoils are trash at low speed, right? But they're really good at high speed because they're low drag. They don't need to produce as much lift at high speeds. So general purpose, that's what we use day to day in the um, aircraft that are doing strip takeoffs and landings, generally are something closer to a high lift aerofoil. Uh, airliners, generally of a high speed aerofoil, because they've got big runways, they don't need to land short. But then, right? Okay, so a bit of nomenclature about aerofoils. The edge that leads into the wind, or the airflow, is called the leading edge. The edge that trails behind is called the trailing edge. Right? The thickness of the wing is called the the thickness of the wing. Yep, nice. Didn't come up with a smart name for that one. <laughs> camber is all about the curvature of the wing. So the camber line is a line that's equidistant from the top and the bottom of the wing. Okay? Now the way we measure camber is we measure the difference between the camber and the cord line. So the cord line runs from the very front of the wing to the very back of the wing. The camber line runs the same distance all throughout the wing from the top and the bottom. Okay. Now how we measure if we have a high or low camber wing is we measure this distance here. Right? So that's telling us how a curvature is. So the max camber of the wing, or if they give you a specific number, is the biggest distance between the camber line and the cord line. Because if we increase camber, we increase the curvature of the wing, which means we accelerate the airflow, of the, the airflow more, yep, which means we can produce more lift. But because we're moving the airflow more, we cause more drag too. So it's this constant balancing act. We can't get a perfect aerofoil that has low drag, good lift, good lift to drag ratio, um, doesn't have any drag at all, really good at high speeds, really good at supersonic speeds, really good at low speeds, right? It's structurally safe because if we wanted to, we'd just make a really thin cambered wing, but you'd have no way to support it, so that wouldn't work. So we can't have everything. It's this constant, you know, wow. As a... One flight instructor put it recently, 737 suck at ag work, right? You will never see one doing that. So it's always a balancing act. A symmetrical aerofoil? Have a guess. It's a symmetrical. I know this whiteboard doesn't make that look symmetrical, but it is. <laughs> so it means the aerofoil is exactly the same on the top and the bottom of the cord line. What does that mean? What would that be good for? Why would you? When would you want to have the same performance regardless of which way round the wing is? Hmm? Nope. So it doesn't matter which way around the wing is. Oh, yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> see, so, see the brains whirring there. <laughs> right. So symmetrical aerofoils are generally used on high performance aerobatics aircraft so they can fly inverted almost as well as they can fly the right way up. Huh? For people who aren't doing that, generally we have asymmetrical aerofoils. Most aerofoils are asymmetric aerofoils. Okay? So the aerofoil is not symmetrical on either side of the cord line. Okay? We'll still extend below the cord line to create a nice efficient shape, but it's not, it's not symmetrical. Right? The top is generally thicker than the bottom. Angle of attack, that's an important one. So the angle of attack is the angle between the relative airflow, so the airflow that that wing is seeing, and the cord line. Okay, so that's the definition of the angle of attack, the angle between the relative airflow and the cord line. If we increase that angle, we increase lift up until a point, and then we start decreasing lift again. But increase the angle of attack, we increase lift. Decrease angle of attack, decrease lift. Camber, as we talked about before, it's that line that's equidistant from the top to the bottom of the wing. And the amount of camber is measured from the cord line. 
So what's actually happened here is we've increased camber, not because we've changed the shape of the wing or anything on it, but we've changed the chord line from there to there. So now this distance is the max camber. So flaps increase camber. Think of camberture as cam camber, camberture as the curvature of the wing. Right? Anyone's a sailor in here? No, oh, all right. That analogy won't work either. What do you guys do? <laughs> Full time theory assessor. Full time theory, theory assessor. All right. So, how does an airfoil modify the airflow? So we have the airflow it comes in. Some of it goes over the wing. Some of it goes under the wing. Right. Generally, the bottom of the wing is relatively flat, so it doesn't come too much under. We don't deflect that airflow too much. Okay. And we're sitting at an angle. In this case, the angle of attack is very low. But that airflow that comes over the top of the wing is accelerated and then push back down. So we have that action and that reaction. So that's, that's been uh, Newton's law, right? Every action equal and opposite reaction. So just by bending the airflow, we have to get some sort of force. So that's our reaction. But Nolley's theorem is all about the impurity. So in a sum, in that, yeah, the sum of all the pressures in a streamlined flow is constant. Yeah? So what that means is one streamline is a line like this, right? So that line is a streamline. So that pressure has to stay the same the whole way through here. Right? The total pressure has to stay the same. Now, as all these lines get to this gap, there's a smaller space that they have to get through in the same amount of time. So what happens? Increase the pressure. Well, they speed up, right? So what pressure does that increase? There's two types of pressure, dynamic and static pressure. Static. Increases static. What's static pressure? Uh, Is that the one you get when you're moving? Oh, no, me... It's when you get when you're static, right? Uh, no, me... So your dynamic pressure is going to increase. So if our dynamic pressure increases as we're going through here, this goes up, this has to stay the same. What happens to our static pressure? Yeah. Goes down. So now we end up with all this low pressure on here. Low static pressure, not dynamic pressure. Right? Underneath the wing, in comparison, this airflow hasn't been accelerated, so it's got high pressure. High pressure wants to go to low pressure, or low pressure wants to go to high pressure? High low pressure wants to go to high pressure. Pressure to go to high pressure. I don't know. So when you open a balloon, it fills itself up more. Oh, I <laughs> know. That'd be, that'd be cool. Like, oh no! <laughs> you let it go and it explodes. Um, yeah, so high pressure wants to go to low pressure. So what sort of force do we get? Lift. We get lift. Excellent. Right. So that's the basis of the Nolley's theorem. Okay. Now, in practice, we don't have a perfect venturi. And we don't have string lines that are all the same. Right? And they're going to lose energy to the streamlines above them. So it's not a perfect theory, but a combination of both of them explain pretty well how lift works. If you guys ever become instructors, you'll realise there's about six different ways of explaining lift, and they all hate each other. Um, it's, it's entertaining. Basically, if the speed increases, the static pressure will decrease. If the speed decreases, the static pressure will increase. So it's all about using the static pressure to create a pressure differential above and below the wing so that it comes up. Right? Same reason why if you take a spoon and hang it next to a um, stream of water, right, that low pressure that as it comes over sticks the spoon to the water. Right? Have you ever done that? Put the back of a spoon up to a stream of water? It just sort of sticks itself there. That's not actually Bernoulli's theorem, that's Coander's theorem, but we won't get into that. Uh, but it works off, it all kind of works the same way as long as you don't look too closely. Cool. So we get this lifting force, and it's great. But we also have Newton's theory too. And really what happens is you, when you look at an airfoil, you have your airfoil coming down, you have your airflow. What's happening here? Bernoulli's or Newton's? On the bottom of the wing. You're hitting the wing, you're hitting the wing with the airflow, and then it's being deflected down. Opposite reaction. 
What law is it? Newtons or Bernoullis? Oh, we literally just talked about this. Bernoullis. What is Newton's second law? Second law. Second law. Second law. First law. First law. What did I say? A reaction, reaction, reaction equals to. So we've had a action. So what do we need? Yeah. Opposite reaction. Cool. So then we get a. False. I thought that I just got the last 50, 50, 50 guesses wrong. <laughs> right? Now, as we're accelerating the airflow over the top of the wing, we're reducing the static pressure. There's now relative high pressure here, too. High pressure. Right? Because as it hits the bottom of the wing, you're creating high pressure. As it's going over the top, you're creating low pressure, also creating lift. So they kind of work together quite nicely. Cohen just theory doesn't work with that, but that's right. All right. How does the pressure distribution around an aerofoil change? So what is the pressure distribution? Well, we've got high pressure on the bottom, right? Because as that airflow hits the bottom of the wing, it's high pressure. It's like sticking your hand out the window. You feel pressure on your hand, high pressure. On the top of the wing, it's low pressure, because as the airflow accelerates, that static pressure is reduced. So we have low pressure on the top, high pressure on the bottom. Now, at a sort of normal angle of attack, we have a total reaction and a pressure envelope that looks kind of like this. Now, as we increase that angle of attack, our total reaction or our total force gets bigger, right? Because if we increase the angle of attack, we get a bigger force and it leans back, but it moves forward. Right? So instead of pointing straight up, it starts pointing back because we're getting more drag, but it also starts moving forward because there's pressure in below, it moves forward too. Okay? So it comes all the way forward, and now it's tilted back quite a lot, but we're creating significantly more force. Now, when we stall, what happens is the total reaction reduces, tilts backward, and moves backwards. Okay, so up to the stall, the pressure envelope, it moves forward, okay? And we, when we stall, it moves all the way to the back because this airflow here is now broken away. And once it's turbulent airflow, it's not a laminar flow or a laminar streamline, so Bernoulli's theory doesn't work. So you're kind of just relying on Newton's theory, which is your stick of two by four at the window. That's why we don't fly around stalled all the time, because we may as well have two by four wings at that point. Right? So the total reaction is the total aerodynamic force. So it's the force that we feel, or that the aircraft feels from the wings. Okay? Now, it's made up of two components. It's made up of lift, which is always at right angles to the relative airflow. Okay? And drag, that's parallel to the relative airflow. Okay? So our total reaction, that's the force the wing sees. Lift is perpendicular or at right angles to the relative airflow. Drag is parallel to the relative airflow. I could even wait your time and then go, oh, maybe I'll copy this down. <laughs> Oh, the, the air conditioning. Oh, is that what it is? Uh, yeah. Noisy. You want to switch it off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Better than everyone overheating. Alright, got that down. Cool. Alright, so what is lift? So lift is our... That force, right? Lift is that total um, up force that helps get the aircraft up. The lift formula is that... This. So the coefficient of lift, half rho vt squared times s. I say vt because this v is true airspeed. Right? It's not in the case of airspeed. So our coefficient of lift, so that's all about our lift pressure. Um, now we can actually determine our coefficient of lift through wind tunnel testing and um, 
theories and simulators and science and dumb stuff that I don't know enough about, right? Fundamentally, it's our angle of attack and our camber, okay? So our coefficient of lift is our angle of attack because camber we can't change too much in flight. We kind of can with flaps, but for the purposes of what we're doing, in one setting of flight, just the angle of attacks are coefficient of lift. So then we've got our angle of attack times half rho v squared. Now, half rho v squared is our dynamic pressure. Okay, so it's the pressure that the aircraft actually feels from the end. So kinetic energy is half mv squared. P is the density of the air. V is the velocity of the air. So we end up with this formula half rho v squared, which is the kinetic energy of the air. What does that actually mean? It actually means it's your indicated airspeed. So it's the actual amount of air molecules that you're whacking into. Right? You have more air molecules, you're going to get more kinetic energy from that bit of air, right? So that's what it's relating to. So half rho v squared is all about our indicated airspeed. Okay? Then we have S. Now, the surface area is uh, more or less constant, right? We can change it a little bit depending on which aircraft you're flying, what sort of flat setups they have, but it's relatively constant, okay? So in summary, we've sort of broken down our coefficient of lift half rho v squared s into really that lift's just angle of attack and airspeed. Which fundamentally is all it is. If we go faster, what happens to our lift? More. More. If we get a higher angle of attack, what happens to our lift? More. If we want to fly slower, but maintain the same amount of lift, what are we going to have to do? Increase angle increase angle of attack. If we want to fly at a lower angle of attack, what do we want to do? Or what are we going to have to do? Go faster. Go faster, right? That's it. That's the lift formula broken down. It's just the angle of attack and airspeed. Right? And that's the foundation of everything. If you go too slow, you run out of lift. Right? Don't have enough angle of attack, you run out of lift. And you start sinking. Whoa. <laughs> All right, then we have our lift curve. So our lift curve, so we've got our coefficient of lift here on the side, so our lifting ability of the wing starts from around about minus three, minus four degrees is our zero lift angle, right? Why do you think it's not zero degrees? Surely at zero degrees angle of attack, we'd produce no lift. Why not? Maybe the wings are already fixed up um, a slightly slight angle to help take off. Well, define the, define the angle of attack. Is it to do with the aircraft angle or a wing angle? Spring. Um, right, let's draw a wing at zero degrees angle of attack. Right? That's a terrible wing. Anyway, what's the airflow doing underneath the wing? Static. Nothing, right? Nothing at all. What's the airflow doing over the top of the wing? Though? Yeah. yeah. Still speeding up. It's still creating some low pressure. Right? If we had a symmetrical airflow, oh God. <laughs> I can't draw symmetrical airflow. They're way harder than normal airflows. There you go. Let's pretend this is a great symmetrical airflow. Right? If we had a symmetrical airflow at zero degrees angle of attack, then it would produce zero lift. Right? Because there'd be a little bit of force this way and a little bit of force that way. This one, because it's not symmetrical, there's a little bit of force still going up. That's why most aerofoils have a zero lift angle that's close to minus three, minus four degrees. Happy? Everyone loves principles of flight. All right, so what we're seeing here is we can see that once we go up from the zero lift angle, as we increase the angle of attack relatively linearly, our lift increases, right? Our coefficient of lift increases. Sweet. Then we get to this point, and then suddenly it starts reducing again. Why? Too high angle of attack. Angle of attack is too You're right. Too at much. too high angle of attack, the lift does start. And reducing. then there's the turbulent air. Yeah. So what happens? Oh, I have to draw so many aerofoils today. 
Right? So at four degrees angle of attack here, we have our airflow. Is it not going to be consistent, by the way? I didn't realize that. Airflow is coming away. We have a little bit of separation at the back, but it's just normal. Right? At 12 degrees angle of attack, so here we have slightly higher angle of attack. Jesus. Airflow is coming down, up, over. Separation, there's a little bit more separation than there is on the four degrees. At our, just before our stalling angle, right, we've got a really high angle of attack. I like how my airflows are getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I think it's the same. Right? And it breaks off really, really high. Right? But it's still producing lots and lots of lift. Once we get just after the stalling angle there, right, so we've reached that 16 degrees, even bigger, look at that, <laughs> consistently bigger. <laughs> right, airflow underneath still does what it normally does. Airflow over the top comes up, it doesn't have enough energy to keep turning, so it just breaks away. And then we end up with turbulent airflow behind it. So what does that cause? Disruption. Hmm? Disruption of the airflow. Yep, so the airflow is gone, but what does turbulence cause? Right, think about it as your hands in a river, right, and then you're cruising down the river in your boat, right, and then you turn your hand like this, and you get all the turbulent airflow at the back. Creates what happens? Drag. Creates drag, right? That turbulent flow creates drag. So we slow down. That's why we can't just fly around at 17 degrees angle. Attack just all. We're still producing the same amount of lift we did at 13 degrees angle of attack, but we're producing substantially more drag. So we can't maintain up to you. You're just always a happy person, Nev. Every time I look over, you look like you're about to crack up giggling at something. <laughs> it's really disconcerting. Imagine if I just sat here just like. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. It's terrifying. What? <laughs> Alright, so this is our standard lift curve. Now, if we add flaps, what we can do is we can increase the lifting ability of the wing. So we can increase the max lift at our critical angle. But what you notice is our critical angle, where is it? Perfect. Yeah, slightly less. Okay. And that's the due with to do, to do with the more drag and the way that we're deflecting the airflow with flaps. Okay? Now, if we contaminate the airflow, the aerofoil with anything really, anything from frost, snow, really bad, ice, really bad, bird droppings, happens a lot, um, dirt, insects, dust, pollen, salt, anything like that, that nice smooth laminar airflow we had over the wing is going to start getting disrupted. Now, if we disrupt it lots, we're going to have significantly higher stalling speeds, right? Because that airflow is already getting separated before you're even at a high angle of attack. Reduce lift because it's separated, so it's producing more drag, right? But it's also not able to create that laminar airflow that creates the low pressure that allows us to create lift. Um, so it's really, really important that we have nice, clean airfoils, because if we don't, things start going bad. To the point where I know a guy who flies in here every now and then from Whangarei, and he gets here, and the first thing he does is washes his plane. Right? Because it gives him another six or seven knots just because of the amount of bugs they smash on the way down. Makes a big difference. Alright, what's drag? Nice. Things that slows you down. Yeah, so drag is resistance. Okay, so it's resistance experienced by the aircraft as we move through the air. Right? Same as your car. If your car didn't have any drag, you'd noom along the road piece, right? Once you start going faster and faster, there's more airflow, there's more resistance, you have to use more gas to stay at that same speed. So we have this drag tree, which I will let you copy down now. I'm not even gonna hint at it, write it down. Or find out where it is in the book. And um, so we have the total drag, which is the coefficient of drag half rho v squared s. Sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, drag split up fundamentally into two 
components. We have induced drag, which is the byproduct of creating lift. So induced drag is all to do with the lift production from any aeroflow. Parasite drag is anything else. Okay? So induced drag is where we have our I'm drawing way too many aerofoils today. Ugh. We have our aerofoil. That was a nice one. Yeah. Take just... a of that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Do enough of them. Yeah. Right. So we have our airflow coming down in a way, and we have our airflow coming up over the top. In a way. We have our total reaction points back slightly. Right? This component back here, just from the wing, that drag is our induced drag. Only the wing. Right? So it's all to do with the downwash of this air here. Okay? If we didn't downwash that air, if that air keeps staying straight, we wouldn't have any induced drag. Right? So induced drag is all to do with what we call downwash, or the deflection of air going down. I'll get into that in a second. Parasite drag is anything else. So parasite drag is like what your car has. Right? So you have engine cooling drag, which is the drag associated with what? Cooling your engine. Cooling your engine. Nice. We have profile drag which is to do with the shape of something, okay? So form drag is the shape, skin friction is the surface, okay? We then have interference drag. So interference drag's all to do about airflows meeting and creating turbulence. So think about any corner on an aircraft, most of the time it's got a fairing over it, right? That reduces induced drag. So, uh, not induced drag, interference drag. So parasite drag, what would the amount of drag be on this top one here? Heaps, right? That's like almost 100% drag. You couldn't make that any more draggy if you wanted to. Right? Down here, we've created a smoother shape so that the airflow can change nice smoothly around. Maybe that's, I don't know, 40% drag. Create an aerofoil, we can get it down to as low as sort of 4 to 3 to 4% drag with a really long, slim airfoil. So it's all to do with only modifying the airflow that it's around small amounts and over a long time. So if we stretch that out now, right? if we made this shape longer, so it went all the way out here, that airflow over this time has to change a very small direction. So it's gonna cause a whole lot less drag, right? Because if we just had a circle here, it, has to change. it still has to change a lot, but not quite as much as there. So maybe that's half drag, 40% drag, go back to 3 or 4% drag. Yeah. So drag is kind of like the relative change it over a given time. Yeah, well it's got to do with all changing the airflow, because when you change the airflow it takes energy, right? Mm -hmm. Everything needs energy, you can't move something without using energy. So if you're changing the direction of the airflow, that takes energy. Amish, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. You're holding everyone up, Harry. <laughs> Been here for years. Okay, thank you. I might be able to drop you in by the time we're done. <laughs> all right, then we have induced drag. So induced drag is all to do with the production of lift. So we have our airflow, we have our lift, and we have what we call a modified relative airflow. So we can think of it two ways. Um, we have our standard relative airflow that comes in and then it gets deflected down, right? Now if we add those two together, we get our modified relative airflow, okay? Because that is the actual total airflow that that wing sees. Because the wing doesn't see airflow that comes straight from here. It does at the front, but it doesn't at the back. So we add them together and we get the average. Is everyone still with me here? So triangle vectors. You've got one going here, one going down. Add them together, you get a slight angle there. Now perpendicular to this, so this is what we call our modified relative airflow, is our effective lift. Okay? So that's the actual lift that's produced by the wing. It's the actual force that's produced. Now the difference between that and that vertical force that's perpendicular to the relative airflow is entirely a new drag. Okay? If we go back to that diagram I drew before, there would be a component of parasite drag, which is the frontal facing surface area, right? 
because when we talked about the air not moving at all, if we didn't move the air at all, it would just be the frontal facing area. This is entirely a new strength. Okay? So it's a difference between your theoretical lift and your effective lift. Right? You don't need to remember that off by heart for PPO exams, but just have a good understanding of it. Okay? So reduced drag is all to do with the byproduct of lift. Now, the reason why we get this induced drag from downwash is to do with wing tip vortices. So we know on the top of the wing we have low pressure, right? On the bottom of the wing we have high pressure. As uh, Harry said, this low pressure wants to go to high pressure. If, wait, hang on. Uh, this high <laughs> pressure wants to go to low pressure, right? So we want to, to fill up the balloon. Okay? We want the balloon to fill up the roof, right? So that airflow goes out, around, and over the top. That's what we call span wise flow. So it comes out, around, and over the top. Now the aircraft's moving forward, so it doesn't just sit there and go whoop over the top, right? As it moves forward, it leaves a trail, so it starts leaving a vortice. So as we're moving forward, this is happening the whole time, creating a vortice behind the aircraft. Right? So that's how we get the big wingtip vortices, okay? These big ones here. But we've still got flow going out here and in here, and it is still going off the back of the wing. So as we can see, the top of the wing is going in, bottom of the wing is going out. When they meet at the trailing edge, they start spinning, right? They create trailing edge vortices and wingtip vortices. Okay? Now the wingtip vortices are always the biggest ones because they're at the edge of the wingtips. And that's why there's things like winglets. And that's why airliners make such a big deal out of winglets because they reduce this amount of um, wingtip vortices hugely. So by adding this much metal to an aircraft, you can cut your fuel emissions down by like 10 to 15%, which is stupid for a tiny bit of metal. But it's because of this. Yeah. Now, because these vortices create drag and they're denser, because they've mixed them, mix themselves together, they're a denser portion of air, they're gonna sink. So they create downwash. So that's why the airflow comes down at the back. That's one of the reasons why the airflow sinks at the back of the wing. Okay? So it's all to do with the weight of that vortice that comes down. That's a cool photo, eh? So it's an ag flame just taking, like going around after dumping uh, some spray. Here you can see some tiny little wingtip vortices. Now, if you make the edge of your wings smaller and smaller, those vortices have to get smaller and smaller, and that's what winglets do, right? They take this big section of wing, and it's like this wide at the end, and they make it this wide at the top. So as it comes up, that airflow still has to come up and around to make that vortice, but it's one, it's harder for it to go over the top because this airflow that's in the wing doesn't want to go in anymore, and it creates a significantly smaller wingtip vortice. Is everyone with me with that? All makes sense? Excellent. Then we have our total drag curve. So total drag, when we fly slow, high angles of attack, we have lots of what sort of drag? If we're at a high angle, we're going to be creating lots of wingtip vortices and lots of downwash because the pressure differential is going to be really big. So what sort of drag are we going to cause the most of when we're at slow? Induced. Induced drag, right? Because we're flying slow, we're not creating much parasite drag, because it's like driving your car down a road at 30 k, stick a hand out the window, yeah, bit of wind, not much, right? But induced drag, really, really lots of it, really, really lots of it, jeez, my English is going out the window. You guys are making me go, what? Um, <laughs> as we're increasing that angle of attack, there's a lot more winked at vortices, there's a lot more trailing edge vortices, there's a lot more downwash, therefore more induced drag. As we speed up, the drag starts reducing, okay? So uh, induced drag starts going down because there's a lower angle of attack. But as we speed up, stick your hand out the window of your car, as you speed up, what happens to the drag? More. Goes up, right? So then we get more drag. So then we end up with this total drag curve, which kind of looks like a Nike tick. Um, so as we're going slow, lots of drag. As we speed up, do our minimum drag speed, less and less drag. Then once we speed up beyond that, the drag starts increasing again. So this, parasite drag. This, Mainly induced drag, right? Induced in blue, parasite in red. Aspect ratio, okay? 
Now what aspect ratio does is it's a way of reducing induced drag. Okay? So if we have a high aspect ratio wing, so what that means is we have a really wide wing that's really narrow, there's less time for that airflow to change direction over the wing, right? There's less time for it to develop that spanwise flop because it's only going over this much wing as opposed to a big, big rectangular slob like a robin wing, that's a cirrus wing, right? So the wingtip vortices and the trailing edge vortices on these aircraft with a high aspect ratio wing is gonna be significantly less than those over a low aspect ratio wing because this has significantly more time to develop that spanwise flop. Okay, so the lift to drag ratio is all about our max lifting ability to our drag ability. So it's all about our coefficient of lift over our coefficient of drag. So when we're at low air speeds, we've got relatively low lift, well high lift, because we're at a high angle to attack. But if What's this do? This is the angle of attack. So low angle of attack, we've got how much lift? Not a lot. Not a lot. How much drag do we have at low angles of attack? Thinking about how fast you have to go at a low angle of attack. Not very much. Don't you have to go fast at a low angle of attack to maintain height? So you have lots of parasite drag, right? As you slow down and start increasing the angle of attack, right? We, one, increase lift. But also we're decreasing drag, so our lift to drag ratio is getting better. So at this rate, we're increasing the lift and we're decreasing the drag. So our lift to drag ratio goes through the roof. Then when we get to just around four degrees, that's where we get to what we call our peak lift to drag ratio, our best lift to drag. So we're producing the most amount of lift to the least amount of drag. Right? Then beyond that, once we start slowing down again, because we're increasing our angle, we start we still are increasing lift, but we're increasing drag substantially more, right? Remember the Nike check? So here, drag's coming down, 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 and now it's going up, 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 really quick. So it starts going down kind of gently, and then as we get to those high angles of attack, about sort of eight degrees, our lift to drag ratio starts going down really, really lots. Because as we increase the angle of attack, what sort of drag are we increasing? Induced. Induced drag. And as we increase the angle of attack, we are producing more lift, but nowhere near as much as the increase in drag we're producing. Does that make sense? Best lift to drag ratio is normally around about four degrees angle of attack. That's the magic number. All right, basic aerodynamics done. Questions? Around the room, Kai. Yes. So the the camera of the wing. Yep. That will. That's the trailing part. Oh, that's a. Always a, a equal part of. The, basically half of the um, thickness of the wing. Yes, yeah. at each individual point. Yeah. Okay. So normally a camber curve goes up at the start of the wing and then comes back down. Mm -hmm. Because you've obviously got the... Because it's curved more at the start than when it is towards the end because of aerodynamics. So, yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah, Eric, I can't go faster. No. <laughs> you should have gone at break time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to ask, mate. You can just go... It's not school. Um, John? Um, can I get a copy of the <laughs> recitation? <laughs> no. Have it in your book. Oh, some, some is actually not in the book, though. Yeah, um, yeah I'm sure we can arrange something okay, like that. Thanks. Just remember that the presentation is not a study guide. Yeah. The book is. Okay. The syllabus is. Uh, Devin?
Guess what time it is? Oh, I know why you left. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, one last thing. Sorry, Hammy. So you're forgiven. <laughs> the drag of so when you're increasing your angle of attack. So yep. the angle of attack is referring just to the wing, but even though, but because their aircraft is attached directly to that, yeah. that's sort of where your angle of attack comes from. Yes. So your angle of attack will determine uh, the difference between the um, high pressure on the bottom and the low pressure on top. So is your angle of attack relative to how what the difference is between the two? Well, your angle of attack is purely the angle between the um, between the cord line and the relative the airplane, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got your your aircraft wing. Mm -hmm coming in and you have your cord line so it goes from the front to the back mm -hmm. so that's your that's a straight line pretend it's a straight line um, that's your cord line mm -hmm. so then wherever the relative airflow is coming from here right mm -hmm. the angle between there and there that's your angle of attack mm -hmm. right so that's it but the reason why it also correlates to the pressure differential is at a low angle of attack I need to get better at drawing consistent airflows right the air isn't moving all that much over the top of the wing, mm -hmm. right, from this point here. Mm -hmm. We take the same thing at a high angle of attack. Mm -hmm. Now, that one, this airflow at the bottom's moved more, mm -hmm. but also this airflow's gone from here, up here, and all the way down to there. So it's moved from here to here, right, whereas this one has moved from there to there. Mm -hmm. So we've moved the airflow less, we've changed its direction less, and there's going to be less force, mm -hmm. and there's going to be less change in pressure as well. So that's why it's correlated, but fundamentally angle of attack is just the core line to the airflow. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of. So then how come, why does the air, the low pressure on top, why does it separate from the wing at a point to increase, to induce the drag or like create turbulence around it? Why does that occur? Why doesn't it just stay to because, with the wing? Right, so when you, when you change the direction of the airflow, it takes energy, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to take some sort of energy. You can't create energy out of nowhere. Yeah. That air molecule has so much energy. It's like cool. I'm coming along for the ride. Yeah. It's good until you get to a point where it goes. I'm coming along for the ride. I've 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 got nothing left. I yeah. can't stick to this airfoil anymore. Right. So then it runs out of energy and it can't stick. And then at that point, it goes. Wee. Later, ball. And just sits there. Right. And that's where you start getting that separation. Right. And because of that separation, you get the turbulence because that's where all the other airflow starts getting, losing energy, getting thrown around. Oh, okay, so the, so the distance that it has to travel, like the longer the distance, the quicker the separation is going to occur because it only has so much energy. Is, am I kind of understanding that right? Yes, because yep. at a higher angle, like at this point, it's moved less, yep. so the separation point's going to be back here. Mm -hmm. right. At this stage, it's moved heaps, so the separation point's going to be further forward because it's run out of energy soon. Right. Even though it's producing more force, the separation point slowly moves forward. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Cool. All right, um, Abby, name the principal gases and the percentages that consist of the atmosphere. that make up the atmosphere, name oh. two, and their percentages. Hydrogen, which is CA, and oxygen. Hydrogen? Nitrogen. Nitrogen? Nitrogen? Oh, good. Yeah, nice. <laughs> What's air density, Kai? Um, the amount of uh, mole molecules that you can fit within a certain space, so the more dense, the more molecules you can fit in there. So the amount of mass in some space. Cool. What's standard air density at sea level? 1013.2. Oh, that's the pressure. What's the density? Oh. So it's measured in mass. So in kilograms. One. That's a good start. 1.2? Yep. 2.5? Yep. What? Uh, kilograms per metre cubed. Cool. Alright, uh, Devon, what happens to air density with altitude? Cool. Um, what is the relationship between pressure and temperature, Harry? Um, 
Uh, sorry, yes, wait. Sorry, what is the relationship between pressure and temperature and density? So what do they do? Um, higher temperature um, decreases density. Yep. Um, higher pressure um, increases density. Cool. Uh, what happens with pressure, temperature, and density uh, with altitude in the atmosphere? John? Um, high pressure, low temperature, dry. So what, well, I mean, what happens to, so at sea level, the pressure and temperature and density is something. What happens if we go up 10,000 feet? So oh, higher or lower? okay. At sea level, if you go higher, density lowers. Yep, what about temperature? Temperature gets higher. Temperature gets higher? Lower, warm, lower, lower. lower so. What about pressure? Pressure gets higher. Pressure gets higher as you go up? So there's more uh, stuff pushing down on lower, it. Lower, lower. That's right. Okay, four gets higher. Okay. Cool. Uh, what is the point of the International Standard Atmosphere, Abby? What's the point of the International Standard Atmosphere? Why do we have it? So we have a baseline for comparing things to? Yeah. Cool. Um, what is the ISA sea level pressure, Devon? 1013.25. Cool. Harry, temperature? Um, 15 degrees. Cool. You guys know the exams aren't open, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the approximate temperature lapse rate up to the tropopause and bonus points if anyone can get the altitude? 1.98. Celsius after 5,000 feet? Nope. After 1,000 feet? Nope. 100 feet? Nope. <laughs> so it goes up to the tropopause, which is at a set temperature. Oh, 36,000? Wrong. 36,090. Okay. <laughs> Close though. Um, what is an aerofoil? What's the point of it? What does it do? Gives lifts. How? Um, difference between the pressure from high pressure to low pressure. How does it do that? When angle effect. Yep, but how does it how does it change the pressure? As you as the as well increase in speed. How's it increase in speed? Feel free to someone help him <laughs> save John here. <laughs> Man manipulate the airflow? Yeah, there you go. So an airflow is designed to manipulate the airflow to create one. Oh. What's the leading edge? Front of the airflow. Trailing edge? Back of the airflow. Cord line? Uh, the centre line from the uh, tail of the, I mean the trailing edge of the leading edge. Cool. And um, cord. I said cord line. What's cord? Is it the thickness? Yeah. So the cord is normally the thickness. Um, what's the thickness? What's the cord. <laughs> the thickness. Camber. So cord's normally measured from the cord line up to the surface. Um, thickness is just top to bottom. Okay. Camber? Mm -hmm. Cool, nice. Um, what's relative airflow? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Air yeah, hitting the front of the... The airflow that the wing sees. What's bonus points for what's the modified relative airflow? Kinetic energy. Nope. Oh. Ow. Well, it goes around the wing. Kind of. Back of it. Aspect. Nope. So it's the average between the initial relative airflow and the mo and the whatever happens at the back. 
So you add those two together and you get the multiply multiply relative air flow. So it's like the average over the length of the airflow. Um, what's Bernoulli's theorem in simple terms? What is his theorem? High to low position? Nope. What's the rule? Yeah. Static plus dynamic is total, and total pressure needs to stay constant in a streamlined flow. Cool. Uh, what happens to the dynamic pressure when the speed of the airflow is increased? What happens to the static pressure? Cool. Good. Um, who sucks at drawing? You looked away from me first. Come and draw an aerofoil. One, because this will be fun. And draw the pressure distribution around an aerofoil at like a, a medium angle of attack. Oh, that's shocking. That's all right. Do what you like. We're not. Well, yeah, that is shocking. <laughs> I thought you'd gone the other way. That's right. So then you got to draw the pressure distribution above and below. So you've got high pressure down the bottom. Yep. So I want to see a pressure envelope. So what it what it looks at like a medium what? angle of attack. Yeah. The top part's kind of right. Bottom part's a bit excessive. So, close though. So when they're talking about pressure distribution and pressure envelopes, this is what they're asking for. Good job. <laughs> I feel so much better. I just want to feel better about my air force now. <laughs> so the pressure distribution starts up, comes down, back towards it, and then on the bottom of the wing, you've got the most high pressure up the front and then just a little bit down the back. So you get a little burst down here, right? And then it sort of comes back and in towards the wing, kind of like that, right? So that's at a medium angle of attack. So you have your angle of attack, so you have your total reaction there. At a high angle of attack, what happens to it? Try. <laughs> do you want to, after seeing that one, do you want to try drawing higher angle of attack? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've shamed him now. <laughs> so, <come on. laughs> Would it be you've got a, a bigger area what? on the bottom? Yep, what happens, to, well, let's start on the top. What happens to the um, total reaction on the top? Moves back. Oh. So total reaction moves forward as we increase angle attack. So it goes from here to here, but it tilts back, right? So it's now pointing slightly further back, and it's bigger. And our pressure envelope on the bottom, because we're at a high angle of attack, there is more high pressure at the front, so we have a slightly bigger pressure envelope up the front, but this one gets higher. Make sense? So as we increase angle of attack, total reaction moves forward, but it tilts back slightly. That's probably a bit extreme. Then when you stall, what happens? Almost equal. What happens to the total reaction when you stall? It gets less? Yep. Which way does it move? Back. Yeah, so it moves rapidly backward and it gets less. Right? So then your pressure in the low kind of looks like that. Sweet, good job. You planning on doing an instructor rating one day? Okay, you're going to draw an air force. That's all right. When, uh, when you do your instructor rating, you, you will spend hours on a whiteboard just doing this. And just sit there. How many guys do any spare time? We, we do. Like, so <laughs> when we're bored on a rainy day, we come in here and everyone draws like the nicest aerofoil they can do. And then we get our boss to come in and go, who do you think drew which one? <laughs> <laughs> that 
it's yeah, there's some weird things. What most people do is what's called the whale, which is what you did there. So I do the curved bottom and then the round top, and it looks like a whale. <laughs> <laughs> Just all right. Still looks like an airplane. But... Cool. It's not a very official one. No, <laughs> it is an airplane. You're not wrong. Um, <laughs> all right. What is the total reaction, Kai? What's it made up of? Uh, the pressure differential between the top and bottom. So it's a, what is it? Vector, like a force vector, right? What's it made up of? So there's, a, there's one that's perpendicular to the relative airflow and there's one that's parallel to the relative airflow that make up the total reaction. One starts with L, one starts with D. Lift and drag. There you go. Nice. All right. Um, well, we just did that and that one. What's the lift formula? Angle of attack and S. What's the full lift formula? Oh, shit. Um, coefficient lift half P rho. Go kids. V squared <laughs> point S point, point S decimal S times S times S. Yeah. The point is more than times. Okay. Right, so our lift formula is lift is equal to the coefficient of lift times half rho V T squared times S. What is S? Displacement? Surface area. Surface area? Of what? What, what sort of surface leading. area? The wing? Yeah, but the whole wing, inside of the wing, outside of the wing, just the front of the wing, the top of the wing, the bottom of the wing? Whole wing. The, the plan form area of the wing. So if you look bird's eye view, the biggest you can get it from bird's eye view, that's your plan form area. Sweet. Um, All right. Oh, should I make someone else draw? Yeah, well, this is fun. Devin, you looked away first. Oh. There you go. <laughs> All right, come up and draw a um, a lift versus angle of attack graph. <laughs> so what happens with lift as you increase angle of attack? So draw a graph, so an L. Yep, nice. I'll do it. Yep. Oh well, <laughs> that's all right. Good start. All right. What happens with lift as you increase angle of attack? Uh, goes up until a certain point, right? Okay, so draw that. Nice. <laughs> I feel bad because Kyle looks so gutted when he was out that we have to get, we have to clap Devon. <laughs> cool. So our lift versus angle of attack graph comes up, starts at about minus four degrees, right, goes up to about 16 degrees. Comes up like that, right? Comes up fairly linearly, and when we get to 16 degrees, drops off quite quickly. What about drag? What happens with drag at low angles of attack? High or low? Is it? High. Why? What sort of drag's highest at low angles of attack? Parasite. Yep. So then it comes down, right? Yeah. Then what happens? Goes up. Goes back up, right? So then, what we're able to do is plot our lift to drag ratio. So we can see here, that's the biggest gap, right? So that's where there's the most amount of lift. Then it slowly reduces to a point, and then it very quickly reduces. So that's where our lift to drag ratio chart that looks kind of like that comes in. So here, lift to drag ratio is nothing right at that point. All right, then as we come up to four degrees, this is not the scale, so. <laughs> there you go. Um, that 
that's our most lift over drag, and then as we keep increasing the angle of attack, we're getting slightly more lift, but heaps more drag, so our lift to drag ratio is decreasing. So is that where you get your, your best angle of climb and your best rate of climb? So our, yes. With um, angle, are they referring to angle of attack? No, so generally that's done with um, power available and power required. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. power, what well, thrust required is drag, mm -hmm. power required is a little bit more than that, right. but your power available at um, a given air, so it's drawn to airspeed instead of angle of attack. Mm -hmm. right. So then your power available looks something like that. Mm -hmm. And then your excess power, so your most excess power, that's going to be your best rate of climb. And then if you plotted that out, which looks kind of like this, you draw a tangent to there, that's going to give you Vy as well. And the top is going to give you Vx, so best angle of climb. And if you draw a tangent to the bottom of here, that's going to give you best range. And if you draw the bottom one there, that's going to give you best endurance. They can, can get lots of these graphs, but unfortunately they're just arbitrary numbers. So. It doesn't really help unless you have actual specifics. Any questions on lift to drag ratio? Not on power available and power required? We'll go through that. Haven't you? You would have gone through that at the start, wouldn't you? With Matt? No? Okay, we'll have to go through that at some stage. What is the best angle for the best lift to drag ratio? Four degrees. Cool. Um, What does aspect ratio do to induce drag? So a high aspect ratio wing means it's really long and skinny. What will that do to induce drag? Increases it. Increases it. Decreases it. Decreases it, yeah because there's less time for that spanways flow to develop. Cool? All right. Questions on what we just talked about in the quiz? Enjoy. Sorry, can you just go over aspect ratio one more time? Yeah. So aspect ratio is all about span over core. Yeah. So when we're talking span, we're talking the wing length. Yeah. So if you have a high aspect ratio, mm -hmm. large span, small core. If you have a low aspect ratio, you may have the same surface area, mm -hmm. thus the same amount of lift, mm -hmm. significantly less drag, significantly more drag. Right. Because induced drag, that's your angle change. Mm -hmm. This has only changed that much direction. Mm -hmm. So it's going to create a smaller vortice. On the same angle, this one's now changed that much distance, so it's going to create more um, vortices, more spanless flow, more induced drag. So I got around, that round the right way, span over core, or over span. But what's the span again? How long the wing is. Oh yeah. yeah. So if you have a long wing, low cord, you'll have a high aspect ratio. If you have a short wing, low cord, you'll have a low aspect ratio. So something like a robin has got an aspect ratio of 8 to 1. Right? Something like a Cirrus can have something like uh, 12 to 1 or even 15 to 1 or more. Right. So long and skinny versus short and fat. Good. So that's where you get a more efficient aircraft. Yeah. So what, um, what big aircraft do is they've got swept wings, right? So they have a large area here, mm -hmm. but it almost tricks the aircraft. So here you've got quite a lot of spanwise flow, but there's not that time, much time for it to develop. Mm -hmm. Whereas out over the wings, as you get further out, it gets yeah. smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So the overall aspect ratio of this wing would in average be the same as that, mm -hmm. but they've managed to make it thicker in here so they can get more lift and use large flaps mm -hmm. for landing. Right. But then they've swept it out to the wingtip, so the wingtip vortices still quite small. Rather than if they did this shape, the wingtip vortices would be bigger, because the wingtip's bigger. Okay. 
that's why they use straight points, as well as other reasons. But I don't think we go into that, so that's right. That answer your question? Excellent. All right, you guys good? Did you want a quick coffee break? What's that? Wait till 12. No, we'll wait till we're done. Might send you off at 2 now. <laughs> Just cause. All right, so we're going to go through flight control. So we'll go through the aircraft control axes. We'll go through the aircraft controls themselves, slipstream, trim tabs, balance and balance tabs, and flaps. Quick, sing out if you have any questions. So what are the axes of control on an aircraft? We have the normal axis, which is straight up and down, so that's through the top of the aircraft. So the aircraft will do what around that axis? Your. Right. Yep. So yours the magic word. Right. We then have the longitudinal axis, which runs from nose to tail. What does the aircraft do around that axis? Pitch. Oh. Roll. <laughs> it's a weird pitch. Yep. So roll around that. And then we have the lateral axis, which goes from wingtip to wingtip. Pitch. So the aircraft will pitch, pitch around that one. Right. Nice. So pitch is controlled from the tail plane of the elevator, right? So we have our aircraft at the back. We create a small angle of attack on the tail plane. So that creates a small force, either down, pitching the nose up, or up, pitching the nose down. So we use a small angle of attack, so a small force at a large distance, creating that force to pitch the aircraft up and down. Okay. So pitch is controlled via the big hand, no, the control column in the aircraft. So if we pull back, nose up, push forward, nose down. Okay. Deflecting it, create a force, pitch the nose up. Nose down. Happy? Roll. So roll's controlled by the aileron. So these are normally located at the outboard edge of the aircraft because, again, small force, large distance, makes it more efficient, right? If we had them in here, we'd have to do heaps to get them to roll the aircraft. Okay. So you'd have to increase the angle of attack. If they were moved in, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but you know, you have things like spoilerons and that, but we won't get into that. But most aircraft we have aileron's. So what happens? You move the stick side to side. Okay. In this case, we've moved the stick to the right. So what that does is it brings the aileron up on the starboard wing, brings it down on the port wing, so the aircraft will roll to the right. Right. Wee. Okay. Your that's controlled with the rudder. The rudder flap. Right. So we use the rudder and the tail plane okay, via our feet. Nice hairy legs here. Right. Don't know who this is. Pretty ratty shoes. Eh? Must be an instructor. Um, so we've got the rudder pedals down here. You can see the brakes at the top as well. So if we push on the rudder pedals, that creates a small force on the tail plane, allowing us to yaw. Again, it's all about small forces at large distances to create a force on the aircraft. The other reason, and that's mainly why the tail is always so far behind the aircraft. If you have, if you get bored, Google an air truck. Okay? It's this tiny, short, little, weird aircraft with a massive tail plane. Um, it's got two tail planes because it's such a short arm that needs such a big force to do it. Right. Slipstream. So slipstream, you have a clockwise rotating propeller. Okay, so it creates this corkscrew of air going around the aircraft. Now, this slipstream does a few things. So as it comes around the aircraft, what it does is it comes up, hits on the side of the rudder here, pushes on it, causes the nose to yaw to the left. So when we increase power, we increase slipstream, right? Therefore, increasing the angle of attack and the force on this here, yawing the nose more to the left. So as we increase power, we need right rudder to keep the aircraft straight and in balance, right? The other thing it does is because we have this nice slipstream uh, corkscrew of air coming back, it's also pushing heaps of air over the tail plane here. Right? So this tail plane is getting lots and lots of airflow over it. So even if we're flying at a really slow airspeed, we might have lots of airflow going over the tail plane, which means it's going to be much more effective. Right? The ailerons, they're out of that slipstream. So if we're flying slow, there's less air going over them, they're going to be less effective. 
dog effect on takeoff because the prop's spinning this way, it's trying to roll the aircraft that way. Oh no! <laughs> Landing gear. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's the wheel. I was going, oh, I need that wheel. <laughs> yeah. Alright, stand by, just doing a tyre change. What was that? He said it took Two. three years to figure out what torque is. Oh. Does it? What failed every single question of the force at a distance. So from that effect before, is that why it's easier to bank or roll at a faster speed because there's more airflow? Uh, so the pressure differential will be greater? Because the it's less about the pressure differential and more just about the fact there's more air molecules going on okay. in the ions. So if there's more air, you're a, you will be creating more lift, but so it also means they're more effective when you change them. So it's a greater force, which from Newton's one would mean you've got a bigger Roll force. Roll force, yeah. But it'll also be heavier. Yeah. Cool. So torque effect on takeoff, prop spins that way. Yep. Which wants to spin the aircraft this way. So as it comes down, it compresses on this wheel. Right, if you push down on a wheel, it causes more drag. Pulling the aircraft this way. So on takeoff, what do we need? Right rudder. Right rudder. That's why right rudder is our instructor's favourite word. So we say it all day long. Right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. Right rudder. Then we drift off to the left. So if we hold in right rudder, we stay straight on takeoff. Yeah, nice. All right, trim. So here we can see a trim wheel. There's various different types of trim wheels. Sometimes they're wheels, sometimes they're handles above your head, sometimes they're electric, depends. Right? But what they do is they relieve the control loads on the tailplane. So when we're cruising along, um, we're going to have to push forward really hard to maintain the appropriate input so that the aircraft is maintaining the strain level. Right? That's going to get pretty tiring pretty quick, right? You'll have your foot wedged up against it, like, trying to hold yourself straight and level. Too hard. We use the trim tab, so it creates a little force at the back of the tab, at the back of the tab, at the back of the elevator, okay? And that allows us to trim it out so that the elevator sits at the correct angle of attack so that when we let go of the controls, the aircraft just keeps staying straight, right? Rather than we let go and the aircraft goes, whee! Or the other way. Balance tabs, so control balancing. So controls are balanced, either mass balanced or aerodynamically balanced. So this is a form of aerodynamic balancing, okay? So this one's got a balance tab. So there's a more pressure coming on the front and it's in front of the hinge line, right? So when we apply the rudder, the aerodynamic force on that wants to help hold the rudder there. Right? So that's gonna make the controls easier or harder to use. Easier. So it allows us to reduce the amount of input we need, or the amount of force we need to modify the um, rudder. We can also have inset hinge lines. So in this case, we've moved the hinge in towards the rudder tab there. So that means the center of pressure, or the, where the force is acting, is closer to the hinge line, okay? Which means it's easier for us to control it, right? Because there's less res resistance. If that resistance was all the way out here, we'd need like iron thighs to try and control it. Okay? So if we move that center of pressure closer to the hinge line, it's easier to control. Okay? Um, anti-balance tabs, so anti-balance tabs are what we have on anything with an all-moving tailplane. Now the reason for that is when you look at an all-moving tailplane, right? so we have our tailplane, Pivot point's there, right? So when you apply a deflection to it or whatever, Jesus, that's bad, anyway, right? You've got, you're creating an angle of attack this way, but some of your force is in front of the pinch line and some of it's behind. Now, if most of that force is in front of the hinge line, what's it gonna do? Keep changing. It's gonna lock it there, right? So then any time you do a slight change, it's just going to lock straight to one way or the other. Now if we put a balance tab in there, it comes up this way, creates more force at the back, bringing it back to neutral. So an anti-balance tab right, allows, us, allows it to um, provide field, so it makes it harder to control it, which is what you want with an all-moving tailplane. 
because if it's too easy to control, there'll be no feel, and it can be quite hard. If you've flown the Robin before, you will notice they are a little bit pitchy because of that. Right? Especially when you're slow, it's quite easy for the controls to get very light, so they're quite easy to pitch around. Whereas a 172 doesn't have an all-moving tailplane. It has an elevator, and then it has the, sorry, it has an horizontal stabilizer, and then it has the tailplane at the back there. Right? So there's nothing in front of the hinge line to push it there. So you have to haul back on the controls to do it. So they may have a balance tab, which makes it easier to control. Happy? All right, flaps. So flaps are normally located at the inboard section of the wing. What do they do? They help increase lift, right? So we can come in slower, so we can land slow, which means we use up less runway, which is good. Um, they also give us a steeper angle of descent because they've got more drag, right? Which is good because that means we can clear obstacles. Um, low wing aircraft, so initially, because the drag's below the center of gravity, create a pitch down. It'll also cause the aircraft to fly with a lower nose attitude as well. Right, so as you put the flaps down, the aircraft pitches down. Most aircraft, to be honest, when you put the flaps down, still tend to balloon a little bit. High wing aircraft, <laughs> I just realized that's a robin and they've just taken the wings and put it up the top. I haven't seen that before, that's quite fun. Looks like a tech them. <laughs> Looks worse than a tech them. Um, with a high wing aircraft, the drag's above the CG, so it'll create an initial pitch up. That's where you get that balloon from but the nose will be lower in the end, okay? So when the flaps lower, there's an increase in lift until the aircraft decelerates, and that's when you put flap down, you feel the aircraft balloon up if you're not managing it. So you may need to pitch forward to stop that balloon up. Then when you bring the flaps up, the aircraft will sink. That's why any time we're bringing flaps up, we make sure we've always got full power on, we're clear of obstacles, we're accelerating, and then we bring the flaps up. Because the last thing you want is there's a tree here, and we decide to go around. We go going around, and then we go full power, and we haven't even got to the carpet, so we've still got kind of half power on, because carpet reduces power, right? And then we go, all right, 65 knots, set the climb, and then flaps up, and then hop bam right? Not fun. Whereas if we go, all right, full power, carpet off, set the climb attitude, 65 knots, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, lower the nose, flaps up, cool, keep climbing, Happy. Good. So always avoid of raising flaps until you're well clear of obstacles and accelerating. Okay? Now, in some aircraft, for example, a Robin, the last stage of flaps provides so much drag and so little lift that you just can't climb with it. So you have to bring the flaps up. But you also have to be aware that you will sink when that happens. So you have to manage it. Any That's questions? Fast. What's that? That's fast. What are the aircraft control axes? So the normal axis, which runs up and down, yep. right? So what do we do around that axis? Your. Or your, your right? Axis. It's a lateral axis, wingtip to wingtip. What do we do around that one? Roll. Roll. Pitch. <laughs> you guys might want to study up on that one. Then we have the Nose to tail axis, right, so our longitudinal, that's our roll, go. Um, how does the elevator work? How do we control the elevator? If you uh, pull back on the control column, then the um, elevator on the tail plane uh, goes up, which creates... Uh, it goes up? Moves, like, moves so when you pull back... No, 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 it go, it goes, uh, when you pull back it goes uh, down. So, so it goes down? Yeah, which makes the tail plane fly down and pitch the tail. Cool. Happy with that. Ailerons, if I want to roll this way, which way am I going to move the control column? So I want to roll this way. So move it to the right. Yep. That's very weird for me. Move it to the right. <laughs> right. So when we do that, what happens? What are these guys at the upper edge of the wing called? Ailerons. Ailerons. So what do they do? The one when we roll to the right. The one on the left goes down. 
The one on the left goes down. The one on the left. And yeah, there's the opposite. Up. So that one creates a small downforce here. This one creates a small upforce here. And we roll in. Go. Um, rudder. If we want to yaw the aircraft to the right, what do we do? Step right. one to right. Cool, and what does that do back here? Push right. Moves the tab from like that to like that. Right. Which creates a small force this way. You already know. What slipstream? And what does it do? The force rotating around the aircraft from the prop. Yeah, so it's the it's the airflow coming back from the prop. Right? So it does a few things. What does it do? It uh, yours the aircraft to the left. Yours the aircraft to the left? Yep, because that corkscrew comes underneath, hits the tail plane, yours the aircraft to the left. What else does it do? Um, it pushes more molecules over the tail plane. So, what's that mean? It means that um, you can um, climb and descend easier than and rolling is more difficult because there's less molecules going over the um, angles. So you can pitch and yaw easier? Yeah. So your tail plane's more effective? Yep. What about uh, when you increase power on the ground? Just on takeoff. Pushes torque to the left wheel. Yeah. Pushes down on this one, right? Makes that wheel flat. Causes drag. Rolls to the left. So what do we need? Right rudder. Right rudder. Alright, what's the trim tab at the back do? Makes it makes you easier. Yep. Um, yeah, so you don't need to step on the rudder all the time. Mm -hmm. What is an anti balance tab for? Um, it makes it harder to control. Yep, so what's it used on normally? Wings? Uh, you shouldn't be moving flaps. your wings. Uh, nope, not flaps. Elevator? Yep. What sort of elevator? Um, An all moving tailplane. Yeah. Right, so where the whole thing moves. Right. So when half the tailplane is fixed and there's an elevator at the back, then you don't need an anti balance tab. Which way does an anti balance tab work? So if I pull up, which way is it going to go? Isn't that going to make keep it going in that direction? So if I move the elevator this way, which way is the balance tab going to go? Up to the bottom. Yeah, up more. Right. So it's creating an even bigger angle of attack at the back to push it back down. So even though it's an anti-balance tab, it actually goes the same direction as the back of the elevator. Balance tabs go the opposite way. What do flaps do? Increase lift and drag. Increase lift and drag. What do they increase more? Slippery um, theory. Not necessarily. Increase the camber. They do increase the camber. Out of lift and drag, what do they increase more? Drag. Do they? More lift. Why, yeah. do we use, why do we use flaps for takeoff then? We want to create more lift. It depends what um, angle the flaps are. Full flaps. So flaps will never produce more lift than drag. Right. I don't know. I can't think of a case where they do. Because otherwise, we would fly around with flaps down. Right. Makes sense. So the reason why we use them for takeoff, why do you think that is? Because you only need like you don't need that higher than airspeed for takeoff compared to when you're like cruising. But if we, if we have a better lift to drag ratio without flaps, that's going to give us better climb performance. So why would we use flaps and ruin our lift to drag ratio? Because we're on the ground. What, what do you mean by that? Like, uh, <laughs> to clear obstacles. Yeah, kind of. Well, we still have a better angle 
of climb with the flaps up. We still get better performance with flaps up. Flaps down makes the performance worse. But what happens is when we're cruising down our runway, if we have flaps down, we get airborne here and climb out like this. And there's our trees here. If we get, don't use flaps, we get airborne here, well, let's take it to the extremes, so we get airborne here and climb out like that. So that's why some aircraft you take off with flaps and others you don't. It depends where this crossover point is. The Duchess, for example, we never take off with flaps because the crossover point is like here. So there is no point. We're much better off taking off without flaps. A Robin, crossover point's quite high. Ultimately, you always climb out at a better angle with flaps up. But you'll get off the ground sooner with flaps down. Go. Cool. All right. Um, than a refresh of a snooze. How is that crossover point determined? The one you were saying before, so... Again, it's kind of an arbitrary example, but it, yeah, just in testing, I'll figure out if the aircraft climbs at a better angle mm -hmm. to clear obstacles. Because mm -hmm. um, all they're really concerned about is a 50-foot obstacle. They don't. So if they know you can clear a 50 foot obstacle quicker with 10 degrees flaps than you can with full flaps, then all they're concerned about is that. Mm -hmm. it's that. That won't do any testing after that anyway. Okay. If you have to clear a 200 foot obstacle, mm -hmm. use flaps up. If you don't, flaps down, or whatever it might be. Okay. Cool. All right. So what we're going to go through is we're going to go through the forces on an aircraft. So we'll go through a bit of performance on takeoff and the use of flap, which we have just covered. Um, force on the climb, then we'll go through power curves. So how do we get our best rate of climb, max altitude, and then the movements as well. Cool. Any questions from that last, uh, last one? No? We're we happy? No. I want to go home. All right, so what are the forces acting on an aircraft? Well, on a car on the ground, I didn't even know the such was going there, but that's all right, we'll go with this. On a car, we have weight, right? That holds us down. If we didn't have weight, we'd all be floating around. It'd be a lot more interesting. Opposing that, we have a ground reaction, right? We have that support force from the ground, because if we did it, we'd just sink it to the ground in our car. We have thrust pushing us forward. It comes from the wheels, right, driving us along. And then in opposition to that, we have drag. So in this case, we're in equilibrium. We're not going up or down because the ground's supporting us. And we're not accelerating or decelerating because our thrust is equal to our drag. So we're traveling at a constant speed. In an aircraft, it's fundamentally the same. We still have weight acting down, but this time, instead of a ground reaction, we have lift from the wings opposing it, thrust pulling us forward, drag holding us back. Fairly straightforward. So on straight and level, Lift is equal to weight. If lift is equal to weight, we're not climbing and we're not descending. So, so we're maintaining altitude. If thrust is equal to drag, that means we're not accelerating or decelerating, so we're maintaining a constant airspeed. So the aircraft's entirely in equilibrium. Now, if we change our speed, right, we want to maintain lift and weight the whole time. Okay, so if our lift is requirement is this black line up here. If we want to go slower, we're going to have to increase the angle of attack, right? If we go faster, what are we going to have to do to the angle of attack? Decrease. Decrease it, exactly. So we've got to make sure that we're, if we're flying slow, straight and level, we're going to have a higher angle of attack if we want to maintain the same altitude. Okay? If we want to fly 
fast straight and level, then we're going to have a lower angle of attack if we want to maintain the same altitude. Now, weight and lift are equal and opposite, but they're not acting through the same point, right? Our centre of pressure or our centre of lift is not the same as our centre of gravity. Centre of gravity is normally just slightly before our centre of pressure, okay? So if, imagine that's a steering wheel, right? So we have our steering wheel and at the back is lift pulling it up, at the front is weight pulling it down. Which way is it going to turn? To the right. So what's going to happen to the aircraft? Imagine we pull those two strings tight, what happens to the aircraft? Pitches down. Yeah, it'll pitch down. So the lift and weight couple give us this nose pitch down. Now, thrust and drag give us a pitching up moment, right? But they're significantly smaller than that lift and weight couple. Now, if we don't do anything, because that uh, lift and weight couple is so big and the thrust and drag couple is so small, we still have a nose down pitching tendency, right? So the aircraft still wants to pitch down. If we didn't fix that, what would happen? Yeah, we'd just always keep crashing into the ground and life would not be very nice, right? So we have a small force at a large arm, right? So a small tail plane that force allows us to equal out our lift and weight couples so that the aircraft no longer has a pitching tendency up or down. Everyone with me? Anyone not with me? All right. How much power is required for straight and level? Well, at a certain speed, if we go any slower, we will stall, right? We try and maintain altitude and go too slow. We exceed the critical angle. We stall. The aircraft starts sinking. So at this point here, that's how much power we need to maintain our stall speed. Because right? our stall speed is set with power at idle. Yeah. So power required for straight and level looks a little bit like this. Now the reason why it goes below the stall speed is the stall speed is with power at idle. So if we're at full power, we can actually go slightly slower than the stall speed. Yeah. Because we have a vertical component from the thrust. Right? Yeah. Our power available at sea level looks a little bit like this. Yeah. So at this point here, where these cross over, that's our minimum speed, right? So if we're at full power, going as slow as we can, that's our minimum speed. Then as we accelerate, we've got less power required, so that's good. We have our larger excess power, so we can speed up. Um, and then at this stage here, where we're flying around here, we can climb, we can descend, but we don't need anywhere near as much power to maintain strength level. So we have fairly low power required. As we start going faster and faster and faster, our power required goes up. Why? Because we have to overcome drag. What sort of drag? Reduce. Parasite. Parasite, right? Because you're going faster, so you stick your hand out the window and you can't. Okay. Till a point where you don't have any more power. So you're at full throttle, as fast as you can, and that's it. That's how fast you go. So that's your max speed, that's your minimum speed. That's your minimum power required speed. Okay? Now, what happens with altitude is it starts coming down. Uh, this one's showing you a bit of propeller loss as well, because the power from the engine isn't directly translated into power available. Okay? What happens with altitude? Eventually, it's going to get there. Do, 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 do. Oh, now we're going into range. All right, we're going to talk about this thing. So, minimum level speed, maximum level speed. If we draw a tangent from here, right, to use the least amount of power for the most amount of tasks, right, this is going to give us our best range. So what this graph is telling us is this is how far we're going in the space of time, right? Now what we're trying to do is figure out how far we can go using the minimum power. So that's why we draw a tangent to it. Now wherever this meets gives us our best range in nil wind conditions. If we have wind, we have to move it forward or back to select the appropriate one, right? Because if we have wind, for example, if we had a tailwind, we'd get better range if we flew slightly slower and were exposed to the tailwind for longer, right? Where if we had a headwind, we'd actually get slightly better range if we flew faster and were exposed to the tailwind for less time, okay? Now, ma maximum endurance, 
is the minimum power, right? Because if we have the minimum power setting, we're going to use the least amount of fuel. So if we use the least amount of fuel, we can stay in the air longer. Endurance and range are not the same. Right? We can putt around up in the air for ages and not use much fuel, but we will also not go anywhere. Okay? What happens with altitude is our power available starts reducing. Right? Now, because our task starts increasing, this also starts increasing and goes like this. So we get a higher max speed because our TAS is going to be higher, right? but also our minimum speed is going to come up and our excess power is going to go down. More excess power we have, the more climb performance we have. So as we go up, they get closer and closer and closer until eventually they meet. And then that's your max altitude. You can't go any higher. That's it. You are at both your minimum and your maximum speed at the same time. All right, forces in the climb. So here we've got our aircraft that's going uphill, right? This is our relative airflow coming down. Okay? Now, to start with, we have weight acting down. We need weight acting down. Because if we don't, things have gotten very weird, right? What do we have that's opposite to the relative airflow? It's holding us back. Drag, yep. So we've also got drag. If we add those two together, we get a total reaction. Right, so we add the two together, do triangle vectors, you get a total reaction. Now we need to have something that opposes that, right? Otherwise the aircraft's not in equilibrium. Thrust. Yep, so thrust is one of them, lift is the other. Okay. So that total reaction is made up of lift and thrust. But from what I can see here is that lift is less than weight and thrust is more than drag and how are we in equilibrium? on a Tuesday, um, right? Because we are in equilibrium, because this total reaction is equal to this total reaction. But it definitely doesn't look like it. What happens when you have your car parked on a hill and you have the brake on? It wants to go down the hill, right? Does it want to just magically jump off the hill though? No, so there's a component of it holding it onto the hill there's also a component of it wanting to pull it down the hill. And that's what's going on here. So we have this rearward component of weight. If we add that rearward component of weight to drag, it's then equal to thrust, mean, right? Now we're in equilibrium. Lift is equal to that horizontal component of the weight. It all works out nicely. So now, the pretty picture makes more sense. Happy with that? So on a climb, lift is slightly less than weight, okay? Thrust is equal to drag plus that rearward component of weight. But the important thing is both total reactions are the same, so we're in equilibrium. Okay. All right, types of climb. So there's three main types of climb, VX, VY, and cruise climb. Now, our best angle of climb is a VX climb. You will need to remember this. So VX, the way I remember best angle or best gradient, X has lots of angles. Therefore, VX, AA. All right? VY is the other one, and the other one is best rate. Right? Why are you climbing so fast? I don't know. Best rate. Okay, VX is best angle. VY is best rate. And the cruise climb is something in between. Now... Vx is going to give us obstacle clearance, right? It's going to give us the most amount of height and the least amount of distance. It's not going to get us higher, though, than Vy will, right? In a minute, Vy is going to get us higher, okay? But in a minute, Vx is going to get us clear of obstacles. Cruise climb, once we're up nice and high, we don't get. So basically, how you actually use them, well, after takeoff, you use a Vx climb, Right? Clear the trees. Then you want to get up nice and high so you've got options. If the engine stops, you use a VY climb. And then once you're on track to Christchurch, you can start a cruise climb because you've got enough altitude and you want to go somewhere rather than climb. So that's what happens. VX, best angle. VY, best rate. Oh. <laughs> Alright, so... 
excuse me. In a climb, the aircraft needs more thrust than in level flight for the same airspeed. Okay? Now, the reason for that is to overcome that recoil component of weight. Right? That's why. Because as we pitch up, there's a greater component, rearward component of weight. Because if you take it to the extremes, where you've got thrust, you've got the max power you've got, so you're at max power, and the drag is equal and opposite, and you pitch up, you've got some rearward component of weight, and you don't have any more thrust, what's going to happen? Cool. Where you start slowing down, and eventually you get to that situation, right? So, at the extremes, that excess thrust is really, really important because it's well, not at the extremes any time because that gives you your climb performance. Okay? The vertical component of thrust, okay, so the component going up, so there's a component going forward and the component force going up, happy with that, helps supplement lift. So that's why when lift is less than weight, we can still keep climbing up and make it. Uh, a constant part as we're going up. Cool. Best rate of climb, so how do we determine best rate of climb? Well we determine best rate of climb when we have the biggest margin over what we require for straight and level flight and what we have. Right? Because again, take it to the extremes. If you have no extra power, you're going to get the lowest rate of climb possible. Right? You're not going to climb. If you have lots of extra power, you're going to climb really well. So, the best rate of climb, that speed, happens when you've got the greatest power um, available over the power required. So you've got the greatest excess power. Propeller inefficiency, so what that means is that the power available is less than the, so the actual thrust you get is going to be less than the engine due to the fact that there's torque and inefficiencies. Okay? So just through the inefficiencies of an engine and spinning stuff round, you will lose some power. Which makes sense, because if everything was perfect and we had no losses due to inefficiencies, life would be very easy. How can we determine best rate of climb from power curves? Well, it's the biggest gap, right? So that biggest gap there, that is VY. Okay. Now, if we reduce the power available, our max speed starts reducing, then eventually we get to a point where our max speed and our minimum speed are exactly the same. We call that coffin corner. Because you can't speed up, and if you slow down you'll start descending, but if you, you just can't speed up because you don't have any more power, so you're stuck. Which is not so good. Right. Thrust. So, thrust required looks very similar to drag, right? Because it is. Thrust available looks like this. So as we increase in speed, we lose efficiency from the prop, okay? Which we'll go into this afternoon. But basically our VX, or our best angle of climb, happens when we get the biggest excess in power, uh, sorry, in thrust over drag, okay? Because thrust, is what's helping pull us up. So if we have the most amount of thrust going up and the least amount of drag, given in that ratio, we're gonna get the most amount of up in a short distance, right? Excess power at one power setting at the top, Vy, on a tangent, Vx. You don't have to remember these graphs, just be able to interpret them. So this one here is thrust, that's our power, uh, thrust required, aka drag. So the biggest gap between thrust and thrust required is Vx, so that's our best angle, right? In terms of excess power, so we're not thrust, this is power this time. The most excess power, that's Vy, right? We talked about that before. And then the tangent here will give you your best angle as well. So it's giving you the most amount of power for the least amount of falling. Right? Same way we determine range, except the other way around. So we want the most amount of power for the least amount of forward is going to give us our best angle. What happens to power as we climb? We 
did talk about this. While you're climbing, your airspeed decreases. Yep. So for a given indicated or for a given task, your indicated airspeed is going to reduce. Yep. So to climb out at the best you want, you're going to have to fly faster in terms of true airspeed. What else happens? What happens to the air? It gets less dead. So what happens to our power available? Less. Gets less, right? So our engine performance gets reduced, okay? our power required gets increased, because if we want to maintain an indicated airspeed, we need to fly at a slightly higher task. Eventually, if we climb, we get to our max altitude. That's it. Right? Can't climb, can't, can't do anything, can't speed up. Maximum and minimum speed are the same. It's kind of the same as Goffman Corner. We call it our absolute ceiling. Okay? So our absolute ceiling is where you have a zero rate of climb. You will need to know this. Okay? So your absolute ceiling, you have a zero rate of climb. It's where your power available is equal to your power required. Your minimum speed is exactly the same as your maximum speed. So what things could affect our climb performance, bearing this in mind? Don't all jump up at once, I'll start picking you at random. There's only five of you, so it's pretty easy. Alright, Abby, what's going to affect our climb performance? Or what is something that will affect our climb performance? There are so many options here, and you've done the lesson, so you should know all of the answers. Wait. Wait. Good. I thought you were telling me to wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wait. Abby. Huh? Now you have one less option. Yeah. Lift. Nope. Okay. Nope. I mean, kind of, but... No, it's for a given climb, they're the same. But what's going to affect our performance? Air density. Yep, so how? What's that going to do? So as you increase the altitude, air gets less dense. What does that do? Um, it's like less molecules going. Ah, oh, there we go. Nice one, Abby. Good. <laughs> you have less power. Okay, so we know that Vy is the speed at which um, we've got the most excess power available, right? So what happens if we fly at a different speed? What's going to happen to our climb performance? Oh, it's going to be less. It's going to get worse, right? Um, what about what we were talking about with takeoff and landing performance? different settings of stuff. Flaps. Flaps, yep. So what's that going to do to your climb performance? Um, it makes more drag, but also a little bit of lift. Does it make your climb performance better or worse? Better. Oh, we just talked about performance. <laughs> worse, right? Um, what about if you're turning? Mm. Yeah, worse, because your lift, instead of pointing up, is now pointed into a turn, which is not good. Right. What if you have a headwind? Worse. Worse if you have a headwind? Oh, yeah. So you have a lower ground speed while climbing at the same rate of climb? Better. Better what? Better performance. So you'll get up higher quicker? Um, yeah. 
Really? Uh, no. No? Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You will go up high quicker. So if you climb into a headwind for one minute, you'll get higher than if you climb into a tailwind for one minute. So if I'm climbing at 500 foot a minute, and I climb into a headwind for one minute, I will get to what height? Okay, and if I'm climbing at 500 foot a minute for one minute, and I climb with a tailwind, what height will I get to within one minute? Isn't that the same? Yes. So what's different about our climb performance? Or is there nothing different if we're climbing into a headwind or a tailwind? What happens to your ground speed if you're climbing into a headwind? It's less. It's less. So if you're climbing at the same rate of climb but with a lower ground speed, what happens to your path? It becomes shorter, so then your actual angle is more. There you go. So your angle is better, right? Your angle of climb is better. You don't get anywhere higher or quicker, but your angle and your obstacle clearance is better. If you take off with a tailwind or you climb with a tailwind, your angle is worse still takes you the same amount of time. If you're climbing at 500 foot a minute, you're climbing at 500 foot a minute regardless of where you point the plane. But if you point the plane downwind and there's trees in the way, you better hope that you can climb a little bit quicker than that. Cool? Make sense? All right, forces in the glide. Someone name a force or the first one. Drag. What? Drag. How about the first force that's always there? It doesn't change. Weight. Weight. weight, all right, we have weight. So then we need something to oppose that, right? So what opposes weight? Lift. Yeah. But lift is perpendicular to our relative airflow, so it's going to go out this way. So that's not going to oppose it, is it? Drag. Well, drag goes out this way. So that's not going to oppose it either. Both of them. Total reaction. Which is made up of lift and drag. So you're kind of right. Okay? But again, this picture doesn't seem to quite add up. Why? Based off our previous discussion on climbing, what do we think we need to add into this picture? Because we are in equilibrium, because weight is equal to our total reaction. It's all the same. Thrust. We had no thrust, we're gliding. R. R C W. Is it RCW? It's now forward, right? Because we're going forward. It's just a uh, minor nuance there. Right, so our forward component of weight is equal to drag. Our lift is equal to that weight times cosine theta, um, or our horizontal component of weight. Total reaction equals weight. Aircraft's in equilibrium, right? Because these total reactions add to each other. Forward component of weight and drag equal and opposite, therefore not accelerating. Nice. You can see your guys' brains just like, what? So our um, rear component of weight is when you've got thrust. Rear out. component of weight is just when it's going backwards in relation. It's, it's yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. So when you're. Moving. When the plane's going forward and it's in front of you, then it's a forward component, and when it's behind you, it's a back right. okay. rearward component. Doesn't matter too much. Okay. All right. Excuse me. So when we're gliding, if we glide at the best lift to drag ratio speed, so we're getting the most amount of lift for the least amount of drag, if we glide at whatever speed that coincides with, we should get the most range, right? because we're getting the most amount of up, the most amount of lift, for the least amount of drag that's trying to stop us. So that's gonna give us our best range. Now if we fly five knots too fast, we're gonna get less range, because we're just gonna be flying at a lower lift to drag ratio. But if we fly five knots too slow, we're gonna find ourselves losing significantly more distance than if we flew five knots too fast, okay? So if you're gliding, and you find yourself doing anything other than the best glide speed, you should be erring on the side of slightly too fast rather than slightly too slow. Unless, of course, you're trying to get down quickly, then maybe you'd want to slow the aircraft down. 
Happy with that? Makes sense? Cool. Flaps, not going to help our glide performance. So if we want the best range, we want to glide with no flaps. Right? If we use some flaps, we're going to get more drag. We will get a little bit more lift, but we'll also get more drag. So we're going to descend on a steeper angle. Again, good for getting into fields. Good for getting obstacle clearance on a glide approach. Right? So that's good. Descending into or out of a headwind. So we're descending through a thousand feet at 500 foot a minute. Are we all happy? It's going to take us 200, uh, two minutes to hit the ground. If we glide into a tailwind, what's going to happen to our glide performance? Better. Is it better? What changes? Speed. Ground speed. Ground speed changes. So our range increases. Increases. What about into a headwind? Decreases. Decreases. But what's bad about a tailwind? Decreases the angle. Yeah. So if you're trying to get into a field and you want to land as slow as possible, but you have a 30 knot tailwind, you're now landing where you'd normally land at 55 knots, you're now landing at 85 knots, which is 60 kilometers more than you would need to. Right? Which is a lot. So you always want to land into a headwind. Because then, if you're landing into a 30 knot headwind, where you would be coming in at 55 knots, you're now only coming in at 25 knots over the ground. Which is, man, cruisy. Might not even ding up the plane at that speed. Right? So we get a better, better glide range on a tailwind, but it doesn't affect our rate of descent, okay? So we always want to land into a, into a headwind, but if we're trying to get to a field or get to somewhere, using a tailwind's good. Um, you know, the example again of when that prop ran away and we're going down to New Plymouth at night, if we'd turned around and gone back to Hamilton, things might have been a little bit different, because that was into wind, right? So it would have taken significantly longer to get there. So sometimes going downwind with a tailwind is better because you've got more range, so you can get places, you can get to that better field. You just gotta make sure you're landing into wind. Alright, what factors affect glide performance? Well, if you have power, what's going to happen to your glide performance? Really? It'll get better, right? Because you're not gliding anymore. You have power, right? If you um, change your airspeed, what happens to your glide performance? From your best lift to drag ratio, what happens to your glide performance? It gets worse. What about flaps? What about weight? Increase. Increases glide performance? Decrease. Decreases glide performance? Weight. Does it change it? Kind of. It does change one thing. What's going to be bigger if you've got more weight? Other than weight. What component of weight will also be bigger? What component of weight will also be bigger? Other than both of them. What important one will be bigger? If you're heavier, what's going to be bigger? I'm literally pointing at Forward component of weight. Excellent. Your forward component of weight is going to be bigger. Which means you're going to have to go faster, right? You'll accelerate until you're dragging or something. Then, because you're going a little bit faster and you're a little bit heavier, your lift's going to equal out. So all that happens is these arrows will just get a bit bigger. Does your path change? No. What does change is your speed. So now you're going faster. So you'll get to the ground quicker, you will still cover the same distance as Joe Bloggs who's there on his own versus you with your three big friends and all their luggage. So weight doesn't affect your range, does affect your speed. Maneuvering, what's that going to do to your glide performance? Decrease it. Decrease it, nice. Headwind, tailwind, we've talked about that. Yeah. Alright, forces in a turn. How do we turn an aircraft? Roll. We roll it, yeah, we incline the lift factor, right? So we need to turn the aircraft in 
or we need to lean the lift vector into the turn to create some sort of force that's going to pull us in there. Okay? So in straight level flight, lift's equal to weight, that keeps us at the same altitude, right? In a turn, we have to turn that lift in, that creates a horizontal component of lift that allows us to turn the aircraft. What we notice though, is what's our vertical component compared to weight? The same. Is it? Because that's the same. It's smaller. It's smaller. Right? So if we don't do anything, what will happen? Descend. We'll start sinking. So how do we fix that? We can up pull. Yeah, we need to increase the lift somehow. So we can either increase the airspeed or increase the angle of attack. Now, most aircraft, it's not practical to increase the airspeed, so we increase the angle of attack. If we do that, we increase the vertical component of lift, so it's equal and opposite to weight, and then we don't sink. Huh? We also get a bit of centrifugal force, okay, or centrifugal reaction, and then we have our what we call our apparent weight. So that's the weight the aircraft actually feels, and that's where your g-force comes from. Right? In a steep turn, same thing, strain level, medium turn, same, same thing. In a steep turn, that lift's gone down quite a lot now, eh? so we need to increase it even more to get the same vertical component of lift. So now to do that, we've increased the angle of attack quite a lot. Right? So what's that going to do to our drag if we're increasing our angle of attack? Increase it, right? So now we've got more drag and we're pulling more G to get more lift. So we're going to start slowing down, right? There's lots of drag, so we're slowing down. The aircraft now thinks it's this heavy, right? Because you have to produce this amount of lift. So we call that load factor. So load factor is this lift over the weight. So in this case, it might be 1.2 times the lift. 1.4 times the lift, so it's 1.4 times heavier. Okay? That is our oh, induced drag. You don't need to know that, but it's going to Okay, so load factor is the ratio of lift over weight. So in this case, we've got this much lift, and the aircraft actually only weighs this much. Right? It's also the same as our apparent weight. So if we look at our apparent weight and go, our apparent weight's 1.2 times bigger than the weight, our load factor will be 1.2 times bigger than the weight. Okay? Now, our load factor increases exponentially with an increase in angle of back. So at zero degrees angle of back, zero load factor, right? At 45 degrees angle of back, we have 1.4 load factor. So now the G we're feeling is 1.4 times what we normally do. At 60 degrees, it's 2G. At 75 degrees, it's 4G. Right? Now, the important thing to know is that the load factor increases our stall speed, right? Because weight increases our stall speed. So if we're heavier, we're going to stall at a higher airspeed. The aircraft thinks it's 1.42 or 4 times heavier. So how much lift do you have to produce? Four times more. Yeah, 1.42 or four times more. Which means your angle of attack... Needs to increase. But it can only increase to so much, right? You need more power. So then you need more speed. And power is the buffer. Now the way it, the stall speed increases is by the square root of the load factor. Okay? So if the square root 1.4 is 1.2, so now our stall speed increases by 20%. Okay? So where we previously stalled at 58, we now stall at 60... I can't do maths. My brain's not working. 68-ish. Yeah, 68-ish. Right? Excellent. Uh, at 60 degrees angle back, it now increases by 40%. Right? So now we're stalling at 80 knots, 84 knots, something like that. At 75 degrees angle back, our stall speed is now double. So where previously we stalled at 58 knots, we're now stalling at 116. You guys who haven't flown a Robin yet might know this, but Robins don't really do 116 knots. So if you try and pull into a 75 degree angle of bank turn, you will stall. Right? Unless you have super turbo, afterburner, supercharging everythings to give you thrust 
he won't be able to. Okay. Now when we're turning, we have something called overbank. So what overbank is, is the outer wing. How much further does the outer wing travel than the inner wing? A lot. It still takes the same amount of time to do a turn though, right? So what does that mean? It's not fast on the outside. Which means what? More gravity. What else does it mean? Producing more lift. There you go. So it's producing more lift. So what's that going to do? Increase the rate of turn. Not quite. This happens when we use ailerons, right? More lift on one wing, less lift on the other. So what's going to happen? Right inside the point is going to... Yeah. You're going to end up rolling into the turn. Yeah. Whee! Which is not good. Okay. So we have to use aileron to maintain that. So sometimes we have to use some off aileron. Yeah. Climbing and descending turns. When we're climbing, yeah, we're experiencing a component of airflow from above, right? Because as the aircraft's coming up, it's experiencing a little bit of wind from above the wing. So what happens is on the inner wing, we have this total vector, right? So on the inner wing, we're going slower. Happy with that? So if we add the slower airspeed to our little component of airflow coming from the top, we have an angle. So that's quite a small angle of attack on the inner wing, right? Then on the outer wing, which is going faster, we have a slightly lower line here, which gives us a bigger angle of attack between this and the wing means the outer wing's got more or less lift. More. more. So what happens in a climbing turn? You want to overbank even more. In a descending turn, it's the other way around. Okay? In a descending turn, the inner wing has a higher angle of attack because you're experiencing a component of airflow from below. Right? So the angle between here and the wing is bigger than the angle between the outer wing. So in a descending turn, the aircraft wants to roll itself. Like so. Brains fully poked. All right. That's forces on an aircraft. Okay, it's 12.25 now. Come back here at 1.25. Go have a break, have a coffee, eat some food. Remotivate themselves, you guys are heartbroken. <laughs> Alright. Any questions from that last section? Nope. Excellent.
goal. So that's what a spin looks like. as soon as he uh, jumped off the... Uh, what's going on here? Hang on. As soon as he jumped on the wheel, right? So then the pilot had to use ailerons to keep the wings level, and then going slow, lots of weight, close to the stall, using ailerons, and woo, into a spin. Which is exciting. And uh, yeah, most aircraft aren't certified for spinning. Alright, this one. Okay, so what we're going to go through is we're going to go through a bit of stalling and spinning. I know we've covered it a little bit. But we'll, uh, we'll continue on. So we'll go through critical angle, stall symptoms, stall speeds, um, controls at the stall, and then appropriate stall recovery. Then we'll go through a bit of wing drop stalls, so the incipient spin and then spinning, and then spiral dives as well, the difference between the two. Sound good? Yeah, woo, nice. Love the enthusiasm, guys, it's great. Um, okay, so what's a stall? So a stall is when the wing exceeds the critical angle of attack, okay? So that streamlined flow separates from the upper surface of the wing, right? As soon as that happens, um, you get a considerable reduction in lift and a nice big increase in drag, which is a very interesting uh, combination. So it can occur at any speed. So the stall speed that we see, so VS, the uh, calibrated or the, the listed stall speed in the flight manual is the stall speed when the aircraft's in strain level, right? The power's off, it's at max all up weight in the clean configuration and at 1G. So it's not turning, right? Straight and level. So it's not pulling any extra G. So that's where the stall speed comes from. So the critical angle is the angle where the airflow can no longer maintain uh, laminar flow over the wing and can no longer um, support it. When that happens, you get the rapid rearward movement of the center of pressure and a reduction in lift, which creates that nose pitch down, which we can see here. The aircraft is still at 15 degrees angle of attack though, because the aircraft's sinking, so the relative airflow is now coming up from below. Okay. So the aircraft's coming down, even though it's pointing down a little bit, the aircraft's coming down like this. So the relative airflow is still coming from underneath. So it's still exceeding that critical angle of attack. Yeah? Happy? Good. So what are the symptoms of the stall? So prior to the stall, well, if you're stalling from strain level, you're gonna see a slow airspeed. If you're doing a 75 degree angle bank turn, you're not gonna see a slow airspeed. Right, you're going to see 114 knots. Yeah? So sometimes you see a slow airspeed if you're in strain level. The controls are going to start getting less effective. Right? You'll get a higher nose attitude. The nose will start coming up. Again, if you're in a turn, where's my OHP thing? It's gone. Right? If you're in a turn, so we're cruising along the horizon here. Straight level, normal, high nose attitude. Easy to see, right? In a steep turn, normal, high nose attitude. Significantly harder to see. So when you're in a turn, it can be quite hard to see that high and low nose attitude. Right? So you've got to be cautious of that. Then, after that high nose attitude, low decreasing airspeed, sloppy controls, you'll start hearing the stall warning. If it's working, that normally comes on at about the stall speed plus 10 knots. 
Okay. Then we get the buffet. So what the buffet is, not buffet, buffet. So the buffet is when you have your Zero, believe me that that's an aeroplane. Yeah, nice. So this aeroplane is stalled, so the airflow is coming from here and it's breaking away, it's broken away. What the buffet is, is it's all this turbulent airflow hitting the tailplane. So you feel that shaking. That's why big aircraft have stick shakers. It's to simulate the feeling of the buffet. So you get used to hearing, feeling that, and going, oh, that's the buffet. Cool. When you're in a aircraft with a um, low wing T-tail, you may not get any buffer. Right? So sometimes, if the aircraft's tail is high enough and the elevator's at the top, you may not feel buffer as well. Now, in most aircraft, you'll feel the airflow separating, so you'll be able to feel that vibration. Um, as the aircraft get bigger and bigger, you get hydraulic systems, you lose the ability to feel that. So that's when you start implementing simulated feelings like that, like a stick shaker, for example. Everyone still with me? Cool. Then, so the buffet isn't the stall. The buffet's just before the stall. Right? It will continue through the stall, though. But you will feel the buffet before the aircraft stalls. Sometimes, like it'll buffet and stall almost at the same time. Other times, you'll feel the buffet and hold it there, and it will take a while for the aircraft to stall. Just depends on which aircraft you're in. At the stall, once you've stalled, because the center of pressure goes rapidly rearward and your amount of lift reduces, you get an uncommanded nose pitch down. So even if your stick fall back, the nose will go from here and down, it will drop. Depending on the aircraft, depends on how much it will drop. Then the aircraft will start sinking because you have lost lift. Right? Fairly straightforward. So if stalling is exceeding the critical angle, how do we unstall? Decretation. So how do we do that? No doubt. Yeah, check forward. Right? So the only way to unstall an aircraft is to reduce the angle of attack. So we check forward. We don't use power, we check forward. Now what full power does is it lets the aircraft accelerate quicker so we can reduce the height loss, because we want to reduce that. The other important thing is we want to make sure we keep straight with rudder. Okay? We never want to use any aileron at the stall, okay? because for example that Islander, they would have been quite close to the stall, wouldn't have been an issue, but because the pilot would have been using aileron, just as they were slowing down, spin. So we don't want to use aileron. So aileron's neutral, check forward, full power, rudder to keep straight. So as you go through to full power, what rudder do you need? Right, right rudder, cool. But if there's any unwanted yaw, you use your feet to stop it, okay? Because spinning is yaw and roll and yaw and roll and yaw and roll and yaw and roll, okay? So if you stop it, you break the cycle. So early on, if this starts your starts developing in a stall or a stall recovery, opposite rudder, stop the yaw, you won't need to respin. Cool. So what it increases the stall speed? Well, anything that requires additional lift to be created. Okay? So if we have more weight, if we're heavier, we need more lift, right? Otherwise we won't maintain altitude. So if we're heavier, we need more lift. Therefore, for that given amount of lift, we'll have to be at a higher angle of attack. If we reach that high angle of attack at that airspeed sooner, we're going to stall earlier, right? So if we weigh more, we're going to stall earlier, so we're going to have a higher stall speed. If we're in a turn and we have a higher load factor, we're going to stall earlier, right? Because the wings are producing more lift to maintain altitude. No. Um, if we have ice or damage, right, it's going to substantially reduce the ability of the wing to produce lift. So we're going to need to be at a higher angle of attack to produce the same amount of lift. Therefore, we're going to stall sooner 
and at a higher air speed. So ice or damage, that can increase our stall speed. Right? If we have a forward center of gravity, okay, the nose pitching down moment is more. Right? Pull the strings tight, nose pitching down moment is more. So we have to produce a bigger down force on the tail plane. But because that is a down force, we also have to supplement that with additional lift. Right? So we have a higher requirement for lift. So that's why it's really important we keep the aircraft within limits. Yeah. Conversely, if you did fly the aircraft with a rearward CFG, you could provide lift on the tailplane, and then you would have a lower requirement for lift. But the problem with having an aft CFG is if you stall, you might not be able to recover, because this will happen. And then you can't check forward enough, because the CFG is too far aft. And then you just follow your way down. Not good. Right? So either way, it's really, really important that you keep your center of gravity within limits on the aircraft. We'll go through that in a second. Okay? Um, really, the only people who operate comfortably with large aft CGs are big airliners. Okay? And that's because it's more fuel efficient. But their limits are... All right, what decreases the stall speed? Well, anything that requires less lift. So if we add power, we have a small vertical component of thrust there, right? Ah, yeah, vertical component of thrust. Supplementing lift. So if we're supplementing lift, we'll stall at a lower airspeed. Take it to the extremes. If you have enough power to hover off your propeller, what's your stall speed? Zero. Zero, right? I mean the wing's not doing anything at that point, right? But in theory, take it to the extreme. Flaps, they decrease our stall speed, right? Because they give us a higher lifting ability of the wing. So if we have a higher lifting ability of the wing for a given angle of attack, we're gonna stall at a lower airspeed. Slots, so slats and slots. Slats and slots are a fun one, okay? So slots are the gap, slats, other bit at the front. Okay? So this bit up here is a slat. The gap is called a slot. Now what this does is it actually increases the stalling angle. So it increases the critical angle. The reason why is because it's basically reinvigorating the airflow over the over the wing. Is that because it's able to take air from a lower angle and re yeah. move it? So if you take a normal wing that's at a high angle of attack, right? If your airflow comes up over and it separates. If we take the same wing, but put a slat and a slot in it, it's a terrible drawing. Anyway, comes up and over, and it would normally break away here, but what happens is this airflow comes in underneath and pushes down, and it re energizes that airflow, so now the airflow breaks away here. So even though these wings are at the same angle of attack, that one's stalled, this one isn't. Because that slot created by the slat increases the stalling angle. So slats create slots. That's a tricky one to remember. You will need to know the difference between slots and slats for your exam. So slats create slots. Slots is the gap, slats is the piece of equipment. So would you class that as it creates additional lift or it just keeps the, the lift that you have? It you doesn't have. create additional lift, it just so like you can see here, Slots down at a low angle of attack do pretty much nothing. At a high angle of attack, though, that's when they come into play. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, if we have a rearward CFG, we may have an up force on the tail plane. Therefore, a lower requirement for lift. Therefore, a lower stall speed. If we go too far back, though, then we have control issues. Right. I, um, as a kid, was quite heavily into remote control aeroplanes, I'll admit it, but don't tell anyone. And there's a saying amongst people who build planes, and it's, a nose-heavy plane flies bad, a tail-heavy plane flies once. Right? Because if your C of G is too far aft, you will not be able to control the aircraft. On that point, I'm going to show something horrific. Um, 
Was it that crash? Yeah. Oh, have you seen that one? Oh, that's right. I want to show you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, really my fun. Yeah. That was the did you the Afghanistan yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. Who showed you that one? Matt. Steven. Steven. Is that what? No, um, oh. Rob did. For what? Apple. For law. <laughs> How did he connect that one? Cargo. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Jesus. I was going to do that for my weight and balance one. Now I've run out of videos. <laughs> yeah, find we can stream watch it. You're a sadist. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can rewatch it if you want. It's pretty brutal. Um, cool. So... What happens to the flight controls near the storm? Well, they get less effective. Why do they get less effective? So airspeed? Yeah, right? Less airspeed, less airflow, they get less effective. Okay. Now, what the aircraft is designed to do is most aircraft are designed to stall at the wing route first. So they have what's called washout. So the wing tip is actually at a slightly lower angle of attack than the wing route. So it's encouraging the aircraft to stall at the wing root in here before the wing taps. Why would that be? If I lose a little bit of lift on the wing tip, what happens? Yeah, right? Small force, large arm, big movement. If I lose a little bit of lift just in here, what happens? Not much, right? So if you're if you're losing stuff at the outside, so your center of pressure has moved in, you have an aircraft that's really unstable. If you still have lift out on the wingtips, your aircraft's really stable. It's like holding it at the wingtips versus holding it straight from the middle. Okay? So the aircraft, most aircraft are designed so that they stall at the wing root first, okay? Because it gives you a little bit more control. It means it keeps the Aileron's effective, which are located at the outer end. Yeah. And the tailplane is normally rigged at a slightly smaller angle of attack than the main uh, wing. So when the main wing's sitting at four degrees angle back, the tailplane's at two degrees. So that way, this doesn't stall. Because if this stalled before the main plane stalled, things would get very exciting, right? Because how do you recover? you've got issues. So the tail planes generally rigged at a lower angle of attack. Okay. They can also have flow strips, which are those that little diamond looking thing there. Right? Flow strips help separate the flow nice and easy. Because okay. it's a real sharp point, so the airflow can't go over it nicely. So it encourages it to stall at the wing roots because it creates a more stable stall. Should you use aileron near the stall? No? Very timid nose. <laughs> okay. If we're in the cruise and the aircraft, I don't know, a bit of turbulence, aircraft rolls to the left, how do we fix it? Right rudder. Right, right rudder. Oh wait, no. <laughs> roll right. Yeah, we roll right, right? So we move the control column to the right. So we decrease the angle of attack on this wing. We increase it on this wing. Left comes back. Right. If we're close to the critical angle, and we now use this, where's my? Okay. So now the aircraft's sitting here. So the aircraft's right on the critical angle. Yeah. And we're going to pick this wing up. So we pick the wing that's just come down up. What are we doing to the angle of attack on this wing? Increase. Increasing it. Let's say we increased it by three or four degrees. So now we're here. What are we doing to this wing? Decreasing. Decreasing it. Let's say we decrease it by three or four degrees. Now we're here. Which wing has more lift? The right one. That one's on the right, that one's on the left. This wing actually has more lift because we've decreased the angle of attack on it. This one has less lift. So what happens? Roll into it. Whee! In we go. 
Now, what happens to drag with the increase in angle of attack? What happens to our drag past the stalling angle? Yeah, it's heaps, right? It's like this. So we've now increased lift, decreased drag, decreased lift, increased drag. So now we end up with an aircraft that's, was it the stall? Nice, nice, nice little wing. Oh, okay, we'll fix it. Okay, less lift, more drag. Less lift, more drag. Good. Boom. That easy. Awesome, right? Cool. Yeah, so don't use that on close to the stall. Yeah? So, if you have a wing drop, or if there's any yaw, use rudder, okay? prevent any further yaw. Okay? If you end up wing dropping, or you're very close to the stall and this happens, what do you do? Can't use ailerons. What do you do? Rudder. Could use rudder. But you are still operating close to the stall, so if you use rudder while you're close to the stall, you might end up spinning it the other way, which would be fun. What do we do? Power or pitch? One of those answers is correct. <laughs> pitch. Yeah, what do we do? Pitch. Down. Down. Reduce the angle of attack, because if we reduce the angle of attack, and these wings aren't close to the stall, then we can use anorons again. Easy. Simple. So yeah, you've got to be very careful using anorons close to the stall. Okay? So a spin is a condition of stalled flight. Okay? It's a spiral descent around the normal axis. Okay? So we have our normal axis going through the top. Okay? So it's a roll and a yaw and a roll and a yaw, and a roll, and a yaw, and a roll, and a yaw, around the spot, around this normal axis. Right? Now, there's very little forward movement here. So your airflow in the spin is coming from down here. Right? So your tailplane doesn't become very effective at all. Yeah? So it's just sitting here, just cruises. Yeah, nice. <coughs> Ground's coming up pretty quickly. So I'm losing like 2,000, 3,000 feet a minute. Nice, cruisy, keep going, keep going, keep going. Then what happens? Oh, you guys are morbid. We recover and then climb back to altitude. <laughs> yeah. So, put it this way. Someone who intentionally enters a spin in an alright aircraft, not a great aircraft that's spin recovery, so not something that's fully aerobatic, take over a thousand feet to recover. If they do it intentionally and recover straight away. When are you operating slow and low to the ground and using aileron quite a lot and that sort of thing? Landing. Landing, right? You're coming in, you're going slow, you have to turn a few times, right? You turn from downwind to base, base to final. You don't use enough rudder or you have a wing drop stall and you enter a spin. You're stuck. Bye bye. See you later. So don't enter spins, they're bad. Unless you want to, then they're fine. Yeah. You will lose lots of altitude. So the recovery from a spin is check the throttles closed, because if you use power, you'll do what's called a flat spin, which is like this, which looks really cool. Unless you're in it and it's not intentional. But looks really cool. Can't recover from it though. Because you have the airflow is coming from here. There's no way you can reduce the angle of attack. Okay? Make sure the flaps are up. Again, flaps keep the spin flat. Okay? So once you do that, power off, nose will come down, flaps up, nose will come down, and then you end up spinning like this. You're still stalled, you're still spinning, but the nose is a lot further down now. Then as you're spinning, full opposite rudder. Okay? So in this case, what rudder would we use? Right. Yep, right rudder. Stop. That'll stop. Then check forward, reduce the angle of attack. Then what happens? Keep going down. Yes, yeah, so what do we do? Increase. Pull up. Yeah. Ease out of the dive. Pull up. Right? So, be really careful though, if you do do spin training, yeah, and you leave your rudder in too long, so let's say you're spinning in something like a, um, like a slingsby, 
that has huge spin inertia, so it takes about two and a half turns to get out of the spin. So you start applying the rudder. So you're crapping yourself right now because it's done another two turns. And then it stops. And then you leave your rudder in too long and whoop, oh, now you go the other way. So you use left rudder and now you're doing another two spins. And then you go, oh, oh, okay. And now you've just lost 4,000 feet of height. Which if you're only at 3,000 feet doesn't work, right? So you have to be quite careful. So power off, flaps up, full opposite rudder, pause, because it won't instantaneously happen, right? If you're in something like a Robin, like the aerobatic aircraft we have, it, you can let go of the controls and it'll recover from a spin, unless you're in a fully developed spin, which you have to hold it into. But in most aircraft, pause, because it'll take half a rotation or a full rotation for the spin to stop. And once it stops, centralize the rudder, as you check forward. Then from there, just power off, make sure the power's still off, he's out of the dive, climb away. <laughs> you guys are like, I don't want to fly, it sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> you won't spin if you don't use aileron or rudder close to it. If you're in balance and wings level and you're not using aileron close to a stall, you won't spin. And if you start yawing, so you stall and then this starts happening, so wing drop, then you check forward opposite rudder, you won't spin. If you turn from base onto final and you realise you've shot through the centre line, right? So let's say the end of the desk here is centre line, I'll do it in a left hand circuit because that's what you guys fly. Here we go, look, factually correct. So coming in, they go, oh shit, there's the runway. Oh no, we don't start turning, okay. And you don't put in enough left rudder, and then you go, I need to get back to the runway, and pull, you're gonna stall at a higher airspeed, right? And now you're out of balance because you didn't put in enough left rudder. And spin. Right? But if you go, oh, I cooked it, I went past the center line. Okay, 30 degrees angle back, lower the nose, get some airspeed, come back, come back, come back. Okay, back on center line, cool. Okay. Right? Be fine. Americans have a tendency to do that. Right? That's why a lot of them die. Stop it. Moral of the story, stay in balance when you're on short final. That's why instructors get real antsy when you're out of balance coming into land. Which if you haven't done any flying, you'll find out soon. And if you have done some flying, you now know why. Alright, what's the difference between a spin and a spiral dive? Spins around the normal axis where the spiral dive is around the longitudinal axis. Nope. There's one big difference between them. If you're uh, if you're spinning, you're flat. But if you're spiral diving, um, no. Kind of. If you're flat, what's your angle of attack? Zero. Zero. What? Minus. But the wind's coming from up here. You're stalled. Yeah. Right? A spiral dive, you're not stalled. Okay? So a spiral dive is a high airspeed, unusual attitude. A spin is a low airspeed, so you'll see low and fluctuating airspeed in a spin because you have very little forward airspeed. A spiral dive, you'll get to 180 knots like that. Right? Commonly what happens is when you're in a turn, you get disorientated or whatever it is, and you let the nose drop, and then you go into the turn and you go, oh no, I'm, I'm, I, I let the nose drop, I need to raise the nose. So you pull back, you keep pulling back, maybe you get it back up, or maybe you don't. And then you just keep pulling into the turn, and now you're overbanking and pulling basically closer to the ground, right? So then you started at, you know, 90 knots, steep turn, lovely, lovely. Oh no, pulling, 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 120, 130, 140, 150, 160. And then at this point you're doing like 2,000 foot a minute down towards the ground. You know, most people don't uh, cook themselves from spiral dives because they plow into the ground. It's because they pull too hard and the wings fall up. Fun fact. Right. So a spiral dive is if you basically let the nose get too low in a turn, steep turn, and just keep trying to pull through, but don't pull enough to bring the nose back up. 
you'll just keep pulling it into the spiral dive and the nose will get lower, you'll overbank and you'll just keep speeding up and speeding up. The main time this happens is when people, VFR pilots, so like what you guys will be, accidentally fly into cloud or get disorientated in really bad weather and they get the leans. Have you guys done human factors yet? Okay, you'll learn about that later. They get the leans, so they've been, did a little turn, they thought and then they feel like their wing's level, so then they look at the instruments and roll wing's level and go, oh no, that doesn't feel right, because your brain now thinks you're turning right, because it centralised itself in that turn, then when you roll wing's level, it now thinks it's going to the right when you're not. And then what most private pilots do is they don't trust the instruments and go, well, this feels better, I'm going to do this. And then you're in a turn, and you just slowly end up doing that. And then you realise that you're going too fast and the nose is down and all you're seeing is brown on the AH and you're going, well, this isn't good. So you pull up and then you're doing 180 knots in a robin and pull full back. Yes, the wings just go, whoop. <laughs> it's not good. Right. Recovery is real easy, though. Close the throttle because the power is not helping the situation. Roll the wings level and then just bring the nose to the horizon. Because what happens is the horizon's up here and you're banking like this. You're not actually pulling to the horizon, right? You're just kind of pulling down towards the ground. If you pull the power off and roll the wings level, you're like 10 degrees below the horizon. Easy. Nose back up. Sweet. Happy. So it's all about situational awareness. If you know what's going on, and you find yourself, even if you're out practicing, right? If you guys do commercial flight tests, you do max right turns, even when you're doing steep turns, you find yourself doing it, just stop what you're doing. Close throttle, wings level, out of the dive. Add the power back in, give it another go. Don't sit there and try and heave your way through it. And then you're going, oh, I'm doing 150 knots in a robin. This is exciting. <laughs> Make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. I don't know. Do you want me to repeat that question? <sighs> All right. <laughs> Guess what time it is. <laughs> All right, uh, what happens to the streamlined flow over the upper surface of the aerofoil? Uh, when stalling? Disrupt it. Yep. What's the, what's the S word that describes it? What my parents are. What? What? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Okay, what happens to uh, lift and drag at the stall? Increase. Increase lift? No. no? What? Decrease lift. Okay, what happens to drag? Increase. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Alright, Kai, give me a symptom of the stall. This one. Stall hold. Cool, stall warning. John, give me another one. Symptom, um, spin. Symptom of the stall? No, so leading up to the stall. Oh. Before we stalled. The whole stick shaker thing. What's it called? <laughs> A buffet? <laughs> yeah. Buffet? Buffet. Yep. Devin? Nose lips. Hmm? Nose lips. Yep, high nose attitude. Harry? Oh, slow SV. Cool. One string. Abby? Nice! Hey. See, I knew you guys listen sometimes. That's right. I just have to scare you with stalling. See, now when you guys come to school, stalling, you'll be like... <laughs> 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 just so you know, it's, it's spinning very rarely happens, unintentionally. And the main one is when you're turning on the final on a bad day and you let the aircraft get too slow and pull through. If you don't do that, you and you stay balanced and you don't get too slow, what do it? 
And then when you're stalling in a controlled way, you're stalling in a controlled way, so you're not going to find yourself spinning. Um, all right. How do we recover from a stall? Pitch stuff. What does that do? I increase the increase the uh, angle of attack. You increase the angle of attack. So what's the critical angle? What's the number? Ish. Yeah, 15, 16 degrees. So how do we recover from the stall? Negative. Negative. Right. <laughs> I mean, you will be recovering from the stall, but <laughs> just reduce the angle of attack, right? Below the critical angle, and then you'll recover. All right, what does load factor do to our stall speed? Devon. Uh, no, nope, it doesn't help us pass the exam. Harry, what does load factor do to our stall speed? Um, it de uh, oh, increases the stall speed. It's like he's teaching himself. Oh, it increases it. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Weird. I feel like someone said that earlier on. Um, Devin, what does weight do to our stall speed? Uh, okay. Um, what does altitude do to our stalling indicated airspeed? What do you think? There are three options either increase, decrease, or stay the same. Stay the same. Stay the same? Did you read that from the book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because your indicated airspeed, you will stall at the same indicated airspeed regardless of what altitude you're at. Your true airspeed, your stall speed will change, right? Because as the air gets thinner, you're going to be going through the faster in terms of true airspeed. But, because but if you're doing airspeed. 70 knots indicated, you've still got the same amount of air going over the ropes. So you still have the same stall speed. What if we add power? Increase speed. Increases our stall speed. Stall speed yeah. It increases our speed. So what's our stall speed? Higher or lower? Higher. It's higher if we add power. Less. Yeah. Right. It's less if less we add up. power. It's the same. It's the same if we add power. Well, I can tell you one of those answers is correct. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think, guys? The trio at the back? Decreases? Why? Why do you think that? Because was one of the <laughs> 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 Alright. If we have an aircraft pointing like this, what components of thrust do we have? We have a component going this way. And we have a component going that way. What's this component called? No. Nope. Lift comes from the rear reaction. Nah, this one's just called a vertical component of thrust, right? So there's a bit of thrust that's pulling us up. So is that going to help lift or hinder lift? I.e., if we have that, can we have less lift? Yes is the answer, right? It's helping keep the aircraft up. Again, take it to the extremes. Yeah, helicopter it. Right? Stall speed, nothing. Blow the nose, a little bit less power, that's our next stall speed. Okay? So, if you add power, you're helping lift. So your requirement for lift is less. If your requirement for lift is less, your stall speed is less. If your requirement for lift is more, your stall speed is more. So, for example, in a turn, you have a higher requirement for lift to maintain altitude, stall speed higher. If your aircraft weight is heavy, you have a higher requirement for lift, so your stall speed's higher. As you increase in altitude, your requirement for lift is still the same, so it stays the same. As you add power, it helps lift, so your requirement for lift is lower. So your stall speed is lower. What about flaps? 
What do you find? Yeah, because they decrease your requirement for lift. What about damage, ice, frost, or other contamination of the wings? I didn't definitely read that off the syllabus. Increases speed. Why? Because it makes it heavier. What's that? It makes it heavier. Makes it heavier, damages the airflow, generally requires our require increases our requirement for lift. Cool. Speed. What are the possible consequences of using ailerons near, during, and in the recovery from a storm? Spin. Spin. Nice. Define the term auto rotation. Put your phone aside away. Hmm? No. Oh. Haha. <laughs> you just said it before. Auto rotation. Spin? Yeah, a spin. So, what conditions lead to a spin? Use of ailerons near stall speed. Yep. What's the main thing though? What has to happen for a, stop, for a spin? If both wings stall at the same time, what happens? Pitch down. Yeah, this happens. So, what has to happen for a spin? One wing higher than one wing has to stall first. So anything that causes one wing to stall first will cause a spin. If they both stall at the same time, you'll just stall. Right? Pretty easy. Uh, okay, is spinning a stalled condition of flight? Yes. Cool. Was that a guess? No. Was that a guess? Was that a guess? Okay. Um, what's the difference between a spin and a spiral dive? There's no stalling yes, in a spiral. What's that? There's no stalling in a spiral. Yep, so you're not stalled in a spiral dive and. Faster airspeed. Yeah, you actually have a high airspeed. Okay. Um, what actions can be taken to avoid a spin? That's once you're in the spin. How to avoid a spin? Higher air speed. Yeah, don't stall. That's a good one, right? If you do stall, make sure. Flaps up. Maybe you're stalling with flaps down. Increase power. Nope. Pitch down. Right. Yeah, so if you're operating close to the stall and you find yourself getting too stall on the nose. Make sure you stay in balance, so use your feet to stay in balance. If you're out of balance, you'll be getting. So one wing will stall first. Stall, right? So, yeah, stay in balance, don't stall. Increase your airspeed on the approach. If it's a really turbulent day where you have to use lots of ailer on the approach, don't fly the approach very close to your stall speed. Pretty easy. All right, now what's the standard recovery? Kai, first step. In a stall? Uh, from a spin. From a spin. Uh, right, right. Nope. Drop the alarm. What if you're spinning to the right? Then left, off the right. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, John? Drop the alarm. Engine off. Engine off. <laughs> <laughs> All the mixture. <laughs> we might as well go down reduce, in style. <laughs> reduce power. Okay, throttle a light on. Next step. Flaps up. Flaps up. Next step. Opposite rudder. Opposite rudder. Next step. Pause. Yep. Next step. Check forward. Check forward. Next step. So, spin, 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 power off. Okay. Flaps up. Okay. Opposite rudder. Okay, pausing. Pull up. Okay. Pull up. Oh, we left the rudder in too long. Oh no, it's now we go the other way. <laughs> Central. Centralize the rudder. <laughs> and then he's out of the way. Yeah, yeah, don't leave that rudder in because you'll sit there and be like, yes! Oh no! Uh, yes! Oh no! Uh, this time! Yes! Oh no! Then after that, we do then throttle in. 
Yeah, nah, I'll just, just leave it off. I'll talk. Like, full <laughs> front. Would you have to be full <laughs> throttle before any point in it? You won't need full throttle. Like, because your nose, you'll be nosed out. Like, you will, you'll have to be quite careful when you ease out of the dive because you can get quite fast. Um, if you're doing aerobatics, it sucks. Because when you're doing aerobatics, you have to fly nice vertical lines. So it's all about how it looks. So you fly a vertical line, and then you enter a spin, and then you have to spin down, and then you recover. And then when you recover, you kind of recover. Oh, man down, <laughs> you recover like this. So if you're doing arrow, you have to push forward into the dive. So you fly a vertical line down, and then maybe do a roll, and then pull out, and then into a loop. It sucks. <laughs> you guys should do arrow stuff. It's fun. I know, I just said it sucks. <laughs> Competition arrows is rough. All right. Um, I have to teach you about that. I'm about to teach you about that. What are the primary flight controls? Kai, what's one? Uh, aileron. Okay, John, what's another? Um, rubber. Devin, what's another one? Left. Okay, what are trim tabs for, Harry? Um, well, holding the um, elevator in a certain uh, position so that if you let go of the controls, it continues uh, on that. Like, cool. Through. What's an anti balance tab? Hmm? Goes with the flaps. With the flaps? No. The flaps, the things. The things? All moving tower planes? Yes. <laughs> you know, you're just saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the point of flaps, Abby? They increase lift. Cool. Um, what's the whole point of control locks in an aircraft while it's sitting on the ground? Stop the wind getting the controls and smashing them around, All right? What happens if we don't take them off before flight? Instruments don't work. The instruments don't work if your you control locks are can't fly. There you go. <laughs> you can't move the controls. <laughs> so you'll be trundling down the runway, and then you want to go right rudder, and you'll be like, why can't I go right rudder? It's happened before. All right. What's the normal operation of use of flaps? Or what are the considerations when we're using flaps? When would we use flaps? Take, uh, take off and landing. When can we not use flaps? Cruise. Why? Speed. There you go. What speeds? What is the talk? Yeah, speed. Talk to me about it. I ran out of question there, so. What are the speed considerations? How do we know we can use it and we can't use it? On the um, airspeed indicator, it's got a white. Line that uh, you can't use. Uh, can't use flap in the white arc? Oh, no. Uh, can you use flap in the white arc? White arc? Yeah. We can or we can't? We can. Okay. What's the top of the white arc called? Um, I'll give you a hint. Starts with V. VSF. Nope. It's a, a VS is a small speed. So the top of the white arc. Oh, oh the uh, F O. No. Oh, yeah. extension. V C V E F. Yeah. No. V C V F E. Flap extension V F E. Flap extension F E V F E. Cool. Sweet. Excellent. Good job. All right. It's gonna be tight. What's the ICAO unit for distance? Nautical miles. What's the other? Okay, that was that was a dumb question actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do we measure distance across the ground in aviation? Kilometers. You said the answer before. Yeah, it's not kilometers. Sorry. How do we measure distance across the ground in aviation? So, uh, one aerodrome to another. Miles. Yeah, nautical miles. How do we measure visibility? Kilometers. Yeah, or meters. Cool. How do we measure time? What was that? Second. It's been three billion four hundred and fifty-three seconds. <laughs> no, 
thousand minutes. Fifty two seconds. Fifty three seconds. Specifically, what hours and minutes? So twenty four hours. What? Zulu time. So what's that? Uh, GMT or UTC zero? Yeah, UTC. Cool. Uh, how do we measure velocity? Distance of the time. <laughs> School kids. Um, <laughs> try again. How do you know how fast you're going in a plane? Oh, yeah. Uh, the speed indicator. Which is measured in? Knots. Cool. Uh, how do we measure mass? Kilograms. In New Zealand, kilograms are sometimes pounds. How do we measure volume? This is where aviation starts getting messed up. Meters cubed. Nope. Well, I mean, for density, yes. Think fuel. Liters. Yep. So generally, liters, sometimes gallons, oils, and quarts. Cool. How do we measure temperature? Degree Celsius. Yep. How do we measure altitude? Feet above me and sea level. Cool. That's all good. Just making sure I haven't missed anything for you guys. Alright, that's um, <laughs> just to make the stone. Excuse me. You guys remind me of me when I was at school. Now I realise why I was called cool to remind <laughs> Burn! <laughs> Alright. Uh, carbs, we did that. Fuel injection, we did that. Oh yeah, diesel. So diesel fuel has a lower flash point because they run at higher compression with higher cylindric temperatures. So it was a lower flash point? Yes. Yeah. No, wait. Oh, higher, no. Flash flash point. Point. <laughs> higher flash point, sorry. I thought you'd repeated what I just said, <laughs> and then I realised you had it. I was like, what? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so diesel has a higher flash, higher flash point, which makes sense because you think of petrol, you think of it's more volatile. Um, cool. Um, fuel, done, 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 done. Magnetos, we've done. Solid state emissions, we have to do. Yes, detonation, no. no. But it would be because it's got a higher flash point, mm -hmm. it's significantly harder to get detonation and pre ignition of the de diesel engine. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's compression ignition mm -hmm. and it's kerosene and there's no stuff in it. So it's got to overheat like for it to get to that stage. So um, is, it normally, is it normally more compressed in a diesel engine than it is? So your compression ratio will be higher in a diesel? Generally, yes. Okay. So to create that enough compression for it to flash? Uh, yes. Or for it to yeah, because yeah, you're, you're not compressing the diesel, you're compressing the air. Yeah. And when you do that, it heats up. And then it heats up to a point hot enough for the diesel to burn. In, combina oh, yeah. in combination yeah. with the really hot cylinder air temperatures. Right. That pressure instruments we've done. Have we gone through engine instruments? I don't think so. I don't think we have, have we? I don't think it's actually on here. But that's right. This is why we have syllabus. Done that. Done that. Done that. Sorry, bear with me one second. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything out. Have we gone through ELTs? Yeah. Landing gear? No?
extra bits will have to come at the end. That's right. All right. So what we're going to go through is go through propellers. Okay. So why do we have propellers? What rotational velocity is? I'm sure you can have a guess about that. Forward velocity, helical motions, and then the forces on propellers. Okay. Propeller performance. And then having a look at constant speed units, which is what I sort of had a quick discussion on yesterday. So a propeller converts power output from the engine into a useful straight line force called thrust, because if we had this just spinny crankshaft sitting at the front of the plane, we would do absolutely nothing. Now there are two types of propellers. Well, there's kind of three types. There's fixed pitch, variable pitch, and then the other type is adjustable pitch which is where you can adjust it on the ground, but you can't change it in flight. Okay? Um, I, not common in GA aircraft, sometimes common in microlight aircraft, um, but these are the most common ones you'll see, fixed pitch and variable pitch, otherwise known as CSU, or constant speed unit props. Okay? So basic principles of a propeller. You have your propeller, and it's spinning around this way, right? Blade face is the side that sees the airflow, okay? Play back, so a side that doesn't, direction of flight, this guy here is called a spinner. Now, your blade speed is going to depend on the RPM and the radius. So if you're spinning slower, your blade speed on this inner arc here is going to be quite slow. Blade speed on the outer arc is going to be higher or lower? Higher. Higher, right? Then if we increase the RPM as well, obviously we're going to increase the blade speed because we're spinning it faster. But the tips are always moving faster than the roots, right? Anyone know what a Harvard is? So it's a, it's a warboard uh, trainer, two-seater trainer, and they have propellers that have supersonic propeller tips. So they have this very distinctive noise because the propeller tips, the, about this much of the tips are going through the sound barrier. Um, so they have this very loud, very distinct noise. It's quite cool. Not very efficient, though, because... Don't worry, um, but it's not efficient. So forward velocity, what, it, what is it? Well, it's when the aircraft starts moving forward. That is forward velocity. Now, the velocity in the air that flows up over the blade is made up of both the rotational velocity and the forward velocity, right? So the propeller's coming down this way. That's its rotational velocity. But also, it's moving. So it's seeing airflow from here. So if you add them together, this propeller blade is actually seeing an airflow kind of from here. Because you're adding this one to that one, so you get a combined force up the side. Now, propellers follow a helical motion, right? If you put a propeller, it's just like a corkscrew. If you put it in, the, in a tub of jello or something like that and spun it, it would move forward in a helical motion, okay? Now, the helix angle is the angle between the, um, that's wrong, pretty sure. Disregard that, I don't think you need to know about helix angles in experimental wind pitch. Oh no, you can use so, it. It does go in there. So the helix angle is the angle from the um, plane of rotation to the blade face. Okay, so that's what's known as the helix angle. Right. Then the angle of attack is the angle from the... Um, so we've got our rotational velocity and our forward velocity, which creates a relative airflow. Now the angle between that relative airflow and the blade face, or the chord line, they're commonly the same, but they're not necessarily the same, is our angle of attack. Okay? So that angle of attack is going to create what? Yeah, well, it's going to create lift, and then it's going to create drag, and we can split it up and we can get into lifted drag. We'll go into that in a second. Blade twist. Why would we have blade twist? Why would the tips be at a different angle to the root? Yeah, because the tips of the blade are going faster than the root. If they were all at exactly the same angle, then what would happen? The force on the tips would be huge, force on the roots would be nothing, so you get a blade which would eventually bend and snap. Right? 
So it's set up so that there's a uniform distribution of force throughout the propeller blade. So forces acting upon a blade, we have our RPM or rotational velocity, our forward velocity, and our relative airflow. From that, we have lift, we have drag, add them together, we get our total reaction. Now we can also split that total reaction up into thrust and torque, right? It's just a different way of labeling the forces coming off there. Ultimately, the force is going this way. Okay? But we get thrust, which is that forward um, force that pulls us through the air, and torque, which opposes the engine torque. So if we didn't have torque, it would just keep speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. So torque equals out the engine torque so that the RPM stays the same. If they're not the same, then the RPM is going to change. Um, so, relationship between RPM and airspeed. So, if our um, forward velocity is increased, so if we start going further forward, so we're going faster, right, our relative airflow is now coming from an angle over here. So, now the angle of attack has changed, right? So, in this stage here, this angle here is greater than this angle over here. So as we go faster and faster, the angle of attack on the blade gets less and less. That's why if you fly an aircraft with a fixed pitch propeller, you have a power setting and you lower the nose and start speeding up, what happens? The RPM starts speeding up. Right? Um, if we reduce our RPM, so we start slowing down the engine, okay? The um, angle of attack is also reduced, right? Because we're decreasing that angle. If we increase the engine RPM, angle of attack's increased, which makes sense, because if you increase the RPM, do you get more or less power? Or more or less thrust? More. 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 And if you decrease it, you get less. Makes sense. Speed up. If you sped up and you got more thrust, you'd never slow down, right? you'd never stabilise at a certain speed. You'd just keep slowly speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and speeding up until the wings fell off or something exciting like that. Right? Now what a CSU does is it avoids that scenario of once you speed up, the angle of attack gets so small that you don't get any thrust and you just can't speed up anymore. Right? So as we speed up, okay, it changes the pitch of the propeller. So we have this angle of attack, okay, producing a set amount of torque. As we speed up, we increase the angle of the blade, so we increase the heel of angle, and now we have the same angle of attack. Same torque, engine RPM stays the same, we're able to produce the same amount of thrust, even though we're going faster and faster. Now, eventually it gets to a point where you hit the stop and then you can't do it more. But a CSU is kind of like a gearbox, right? With a fixed pitch propeller, it's like cruising around in third gear in your car. Anyone here drive manuals? One. Oh well, that's an analogy that I've, I've got. Someone drives a manual car, excellent. Um, it's like driving around in third gear. So when you're driving in really slow speed, the engine's struggling, it doesn't work very well. When you're driving at medium speed, it's great, works sweet. When you try to go to high speed, the engine's revving the shit out of itself. It doesn't work that well. It's not efficient over a broad range. A CSU, we can have a really fine pitch at slow air speeds, so we can get lots of RPM, lots of thrust, which is good, but then at high air speeds, we can coarsen it out so we can take big chunks out of the air and make the propeller nice and efficient. So we get this sort of what we call peak efficiency, efficient, efficiency, peak efficiency envelope for whatever the CSU is, so that from 120 knots to 160 knots, 180 knots, whatever it may be, your propeller can work at peak efficiency. Right? So that's why CSUs are so great. Great. Good. Um, okay.
twenty dash six. Oh yeah. Why is a constant speed prop better than a fixed pitch prop? Peak efficiency. What does that mean? Uh, it's like a gearbox. You can um, get the most efficient um, kind of RPM out of it. Back up attack. Yeah, you get the most efficient angle. Keep an efficient angle of attack through different forward air speeds. Um, okay, what's the blade angle? Exactly what it sounds like. The angle of the blade. Yeah, so it's the angle between the RPM or the relative or the plane of rotation and the chord line. So that's your blade angle. Okay. Um, then your pitch angle. So if you have your plane of rotation and your forward airspeed, then you have an angle of attack on that to the blade, right? That's your angle of attack. The angle below that, back to the plane of rotation, is your pitch angle. Uh, why do we have blade twist or helical twist? Because the tip of the blade moves like faster than like whatever it is. Like, don't want to yep. Cool. Um, Alright, if we have a constant throttle setting on a fixed pitch propeller, what's going to happen as we increase airspeed to the RPM and the angle of attack? So we have a constant power setting and we lower the nose and start speeding the aircraft up. RPM is going to be higher but your angle of attack is going to decrease? Yep. Everyone happy with that? So as you speed up, there's less of an angle between the blade and the relative airflow. So the angle of attack reduces. Because of that, the RPM also increases as well. Um, all right, so with a constant speed prop, when we're, who remembers how we set power on a constant speed prop? Nope. Well, I mean, yes, but not in a turboprop, in a piston aircraft. Hmm? Throttle. Yeah. But what, what is... You don't jump in a plane and just go, I'm going to give it this throttle. You look at a gauge, don't you? Yeah. Yep, so what one? What instruments tell us? Should we set up here? No, not RPM. Well, it's a constant speed prop, so the RPM stays the same regardless oh. of what power setting we have. Ah. It's all to do with the amount of uh, air going into the inlet manifold. Nope, no one? Manifold pressure. Yeah? Okay. So when you're increasing power on a constant speed prop, it's rich pitch power, okay? So increase the mixture, increase the prop RPM if you need to, then increase the manifold pressure. If you're reducing power, you do it the other way. So you reduce the manifold pressure first, then you reduce the RPM, then you blend the mixture, okay? It's important that you don't, when you're increasing power, firewall the throttle and then push the RPM full fine, because when you increase the power, what happens? Yeah, well it starts wanting to turn the prop more, right? And because of that, the engine wants to speed up, but it won't because it's got a CSU. 
so it'll start taking really big chunks out of the air, right? If your RPM setting is too low and you've got too much power, that's like putting your car into fifth gear and flooring it while you're still at the lights, right? It's really bad for the engine. So you always want to make sure, generally, RPM settings and manifold pressure tend to line up. For example, if your cruise power is 2,400 RPM, generally your cruise manifold pressure is 24 inches. For example, if your climb, power, climb RPM setting was 2,500 RPM, your climb manifold pressure is normally 25 inches. It's not often that it's what we call over squared or where the manifold pressure is significantly more than the RPM because it's taking too big a chunk and it's putting a lot of strain on the engine. And that's on a piston engine? That's on a piston engine. And a turbo pump's different? Uh, same principle, mm -hmm. it's just different gauges. Okay. Don't ask me about the gauges, I can't, I don't know enough about it. Um, cool. So increasing power, increase the RPM, then the manifold pressure, decreasing power, decrease the manifold pressure, then the RPM. You'll probably get questions on it. Um, done that. Why would we have a reduction gearbox in an aircraft? Why would we not have a direct drive? So why would the uh, crankshaft not go directly to the propeller? Too fast. Yeah, so what could cause it to spin too fast? Or what things, excuse me, what sorts of engines spin too fast? Because most piston engines, or most piston engines we use, don't spin too fast, right? They're sort of normally up to 3000 RPM at the most. Fuel engine. Oh. What sort of engines spin really, really quickly? Jet engine. Yeah. So if you take a turbine and want to stick a prop on the end of it, are you going to have a prop spinning at 12 to 18,000 RPM? Probably not. <laughs> that would be exciting. Right? So what would you do? Slide it down with the reduction gearbox. Slide it down with the reduction gearbox. Um, most micro lights, for example, have Rotax engines in them. Which are smaller, lighter. They're more. They're closely, closely, closer related to a motorbike engine than a plane engine is. Um, so they run at higher RPMs. They run at five thousand RPM. That's still quite quick for a propeller, right? So again, reduction gearbox. Bring it back down to normal propeller operating speeds. Okay. Everyone with me? All right. Round the room, questions on propellers. What are they normally made out of? Uh, wood, aluminium, or composite, so carbon, carbon, and aluminium, or fiberglass, fiberglass, and aluminium. Are there some that you can only use on it, on, that can only be used? Some materials um, that are required on a CSU? And where you adjust, because you'd be adjusting the pitch. Yeah. Is that done on the blade or is that done? So a CSU prop will have a, you'll have the propeller blade sitting out the side and then in the mechanism that's attached to it, mm -hmm. you'll normally have, there's a few ways of doing it. Sometimes it's oil pressure, sometimes it's fly weights. Mm -hmm. But you may have weights that sit out here. Mm -hmm. So as the engine RPM speeds up, those weights want to go out more, and then that's rigged up to a gearing system which coarsens the blades. Sometimes it's purely based off just oil pressure and sensors, but it works off the same way. So as, an, as the prop spins faster, there's more centrifugal force going out, right? So if it's um, counterweights, then those counterweights get pushed out, which in turn will course, coarsen the propeller back to the speed it wants until it stabilizes. If it's oil and it's got a sensor, normally there are still little flyweights in there, right? They're just not big counterweights that do exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, we'll go out to the hangar and have a look at the yak because that's got counterweights and it works the same way. Does that answer that question? Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? No, all right. Speak now or forever hold your pieces. No? Cool. All right, let's have a chat about the 
about comments. And by let's have a chat, I mean YouTube time. Uh -huh. What was that? <laughs> I always look so guilty in that thing at school. I don't even understand what he's saying half the time when he's whispering. <laughs> so. Okay. I've been telling you for some time now that there could be ways to upgrade our legacy aircraft at significantly reduced cost. And that's to use equipment that's not certificated necessarily, but has already been torture tested in experimental aircraft. This week, Warren Morningstar takes a look at replacing the most antiquated part on your engine. Very, very different, very nice. Dave Hirschman is always trying things to squeeze more performance, safety, and utility out of his RV3. And because the RV is an experimental, he can do things you can't do yet with a Cessna or Piper. But he thinks you should be able to. Magneto's used to exist in cars. And they don't exist in cars anymore for some really good reasons. Airplanes have, an even, more com have even more compelling reasons to use electronic ignitions because they fly at, at, at high and low altitudes. It's all about timing. Well, Magneto is pretty old technology. It's a fixed timing point, which means it's a compromise between takeoff power, where the ignition timing is retarded to a point where there's no detonation, and you know, advanced enough, I should say, to uh, to give efficiency during cruise flight. Now, compromise is a dirty word nowadays, but electronic ignition gives you the best of all worlds. And Dave is going modern with electronics from EMAG out of Texas. From a pilot's perspective, what I expect to gain from this is easier starts, um, better lead and peak operation, more range, and less fuel flow. But as I say, there is no free lunch, but in this case, the costs are pretty low. It, it would be if you have a, a totally flat battery somewhere out in the field, and you need to get home, and you need to hand prop it. The EMAG will not support that. But each EMAG has its own internal alternator, so it will work without battery power as long as the engine is turning more than 900 RPM, and it's more reliable than a Magneto. And the Magneto has um, plastic gears in it, and they're just known to, to become embrittled over time. The EMAG has only one moving part, and it easily fits in the same space as the old Magneto. And there's another benefit. I always get a great amount of joy when I go out and <laughs> buy these buy these uh, these replacement automotive plugs. An aviation spark plug costs forty five bucks. The automotive plug, just two fifty. And they're better because the automotive plugs provide a, a, a you know a bigger, longer lasting spark that burns the fuel more thoroughly and cleanly. So why aren't we still limping along on antique max? Well, because for the moment. The FAA won't let us use all electronic ignition. Warren Morningstar, AOPA Live. All right, so solid state ignition. Again, it's like what's in your, uh, it's like what's in your car. Basically, it's um, the main advantages of a solid state ignition is the fact that you can change the ignition timing on the go, so it can be calibrated for each RPM setting or each throttle setting you have, hang on, I've got these lights on the wrong way, um, so that it's really efficient. Because on takeoff, you don't want the um, spark too advanced because the RPM is relatively low because we're at a low airspeed. Okay? Um, if it is too far advanced, then you're getting close to pre-admission detonation and that's not good. In the cruise though, because the engine RPM is generally higher, right? Because you've leveled off, you may be using a higher engine RPM. Having an appropriate spark advance means that you can develop the most amount of power, which means you can be more efficient in the cruise, and you'll be able to generate more power, which means you'll go faster, which is better. Downsides of a solid state ignition is they require their own alternator, so they require 
some sort of redundancy. Um, and most aircraft that have this also have a magneto as redundancy because with a alternator, as you remember, you need some sort of electrical charge to get it going. So if the battery is dead, you can't hand prop something with a solid state ignition, whereas with a mag you can, um, because it's a generator, it works off that principle. Um, but yeah, the, the system itself still works the same, it still generates a spark, but you're allowed to time it in a um, slightly more efficient way. There, um, the solid state ignitions can be, what was I going to say? Um, need to have appropriate uh, like self-monitoring functions or self-integrity checks on them so that if there is anything wrong with the ignition timing system it can let you know because it's not like a mag where it's just it's either working or it's not your solid state ignition may through some rpm range have an entirely incorrect setting which is going to stop the engine right or cause some serious damage so that's one of the downsides of uh, solid state ignition. Again, it's not certified for use in GA aircraft yet, but it is something that is probably going to come in the in the near future. All right, um, engine instruments. So engine instruments, TACO gauges. So um, for tachometers or RPM gauges, there's a few different ways of doing it. Okay. So one way is you'll have the a flexible drive shaft cable connected to the um, engine, so that'll spin at crankshaft speed. And then at the end here, you'll have a um, you'll have some flyweights sitting on a spring system. I can't draw springs. How do you draw springs like that? I don't know. All right. Now, as that spins, those flyweights move out. As it moves out, it'll basically pull a gearing system. against another gearing system which goes to your instrument. So as you increase speed, those um, centrifugal flyweights move out, changes through a gearing system, it shows that the RPM is increasing. That was straightforward. The other type you have is a drag cup type. So what a drag cup is, is you have a, um, a cup, right, like this, sitting there, and then you have a magnet which is connected to a flexible drive shaft cable which goes to the engine. Now that magnet spins around, okay, and round and round and round and round and round, and round, and as it does that, it's creating a force on this cup. So if we looked at the back section, as it starts spooling up, okay, this cup is also going to want to move this way. Now the cup's connected to a little spring, so that as it spins up and up and up, it gives slightly more and more force, and it's calibrated out using the spring so that the cup turns and that can turn a RPM gauge. Okay. Uh, these ones are better because you can use, you can connect this, so the drag cup itself, which is nice and close to the engine, to a um, electronic system via sensors that just replicates the movement. So you don't have to have a flexible drive shaft that goes all the way to the back of the instrument panel, um, or any shafts that go all the way to the back. You can have it electrically passed there. So that's how the RPM gauges work. Uh, manifold pressure and boost gauges, they're either using, let me get this one correct, because it's either board on tubes or capsules, I can't remember off the top of my head. This is all in chapter 10. Yeah, that's what I thought. So manifold pressure gauges um, use a capsule system. So the same way your static pressure or your, um, or your airspeed indicator works, your, this is connected to your inlet manifold, okay? And then connected to a little tube which has a gearing system which then goes to the needle, right? As you increase the manifold pressure, this expands. As it expands, pushes this way, moves the needle. 
Makes sense. So it's just a simple capsule that as you increase pressure, it expands and contracts. Now, for oil pressure or something that's of a higher, excuse me, um, higher temperature, you have what's called a bordon tube. So for the bordon tube, it'll be fixed at a point with the oil coming in, and then the tube itself is normally curled, and then this end here will be connected to a gearing system. Okay? As the oil pressure increases, pressure inside this tube increases. So what does the tube want to do? It wants to straighten out. As it straightens out, the end of the tube moves. Okay? And then that move is calibrated to show pressure. So that's how it's connected for a direct reading oil pressure gauge. If it was an indirect reading, it would have a similar sensor to how the drag cut method works, and then it would be sent by electrical signals to the uh, instruments. Then a vacuum gauge works much the same way, except instead of filling it with pressure, it's sucking pressure, so it's squeezing in on the board on tube. Okay. What that does is it curls it up, and then that's then calibrated to read inches of mercury or whatever it may be. Okay. Um, Aneroid capsules don't work for vacuum pumps. So just pull the load of the air out. All right. Um, from that, outside air temperature gauges. So outside air temperature gauges are normally using... Oh, we to to CHTs. Yeah, you don't. That's weird. Well. So outside air temperature gauges are usually done using a um, bimetallic strip. So they have a coil of metal, then they'll have a coil of a dissimilar metal attached to it, right? So they're bonded together. Now what happens is if the temperature increases or decreases, right? One of these strips will move more than the other, so one will expand or contract more than the other, and that coil will either wind up or unwind, depending on which way it's working. So it's all off the basis of dissimilar metals. That's then connected to, at the end, a gearing system with your needle on it, pointing to the temperature. So that's a pretty common way of doing it. All of these are very fragile ways of doing it, so they're not really practical for much else other than a fixed aviation use. And now there's a whole lot more of um, like electronic gauges that use significantly easier sensors and smaller sensors rather than the big manual chunky ones. Um, then from that, they have... Um, okay. What do we have to do? Fuel quantity. So fuel quantity, you have your tank. We had a bit of a chat about this before. So there's two types. You can either have capacitance indicators, which have probes that come down like this. Yeah? And these probes measure, let's say the fuel is here. They measure the voltage difference between this one and this one. Or well, they measure the, the resistance between the two. And they know that at these settings, where the fuel is, it will read so much, and that's how they calibrate it. These work really well for really random shaped tanks. That can be quite hard to accurately calibrate, because if you do it this way, you can calibrate them really nice and accurately. And they're very, these indicators themselves, when they're working, are really accurate. The other type is ye old. Float, right, which is connected to a um, variable resistor. So as the float goes up, it changes the setting on the variable resistor, increasing or decreasing the resistance. That then goes to your crappy fuel gauge. And then the needle does this. <laughs> right? But that's how they work. So it's all based off variable resistance. So as the float moves, it changes the resistance on the variable resistor. Sweet. All right. Any questions on those last couple of things? All right.
GPS. Wants to tell me how GPS works. Satellite. Satellites, cool. So the way GPS works is we have the world and we have our satellites floating around. Normally, they're in what's called a geosynchronous orbit. So what a geosynchronous orbit is, is that means that they're sort of above the same point for most of the time. Okay? So they try and stay aligned up with a geographical point on the Earth. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want to cover everything that needs to be covered. So these satellites are floating all around the world. There's normally um, heaps of them. At a minimum, there's 24 that are working at one time for the GPS system to work. So for the GPS system to work, basically the way it does is this will send out its navigation message once every couple of seconds. Um, and on that, it's got Almanac data. random code. Okay? Now, the almanac data, that's where your phone goes. I think the GPS should be here at this point in time. The GPS then updates that data in your phone or your receiver or your GPS and goes, actually, I'm now here and this is where I'm predicting to be in the next seven years or whatever it is. Okay? It also sends the time, so this time's really accurate. It's on an atomic clock. Okay, so the atomic clock is incredibly accurate. Um, to keep all the satellites in sync. And it also sends itself its own sort of code that with that almanac data and the time should be received by your phone at a certain point. So what the receiver does is go, well, I'm expecting to get it now. And it doesn't, it gets it half a second later. It then compares that with where the GPS should be in space and goes, okay, it took this long Therefore, I'm this far away from the GPS. So then it goes, I am on an arc like this from that GPS. But then this GPS also does the same. So it goes, I'm on an arc this far from the GPS. Right? So now you know somewhere in space you're in between these two spheres around these GPSs. Right? If you get three GPSs, so let's get a third one in there so that it actually overlaps with all of them, right? You now know that you're somewhere in here. It's significantly more accurate than that. So the way a GPS works, you need three at least to obtain an un unambiguous fix on the surface. Okay? Four will give you altitude information as well, right? Because it can position you in space. Now, the atomic clocks, they work on a breakdown of atomic material. That's how they work. So they take a... Um, material that breaks down at a very specific rate and then that's put in the clock, put in the satellite and then they measure the breakdown of that and that's how they get the time nice and accurate. 
All you need to know is that the navigation message contains the almanac data and pseudo-random code, and the pseudo-random code is compared um, to what the receiver has, and the time difference is how they figure out the distance from that specific satellite. If the GPS is not working in an aviation GPS, you will get something called a integ warning or a RAIM warning. Okay? Now, RAIM is Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. You probably want to write that down because you'll also probably forget it. Okay? Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring means that inside the GPS, it goes, okay, well, I need this many satellites to obtain a good fix. Right? So I need this many. If I don't have this many, then I can't accurately figure out whether one of these GP, uh, satellites is giving me crappy data or not. So then you get a rain warning, which is going, hey, I don't quite think I know where I am. Something's not right. I can't figure out if one of these satellites is giving me crappy information. If you get an integ warning or an integrity warning, that means you have no accurate position fix at all. Right? Other than that, you don't need to know much more. For PPL stuff, it's fairly straightforward. Um, limitations of the GPS system. So there's a few different types of um, GPS. There's Navstar, which is now known as... Oh, is it Navstar? Yeah, Navstar, which is GPS. Um, then there's Galileo, which is the... Europe, is Galileo European or Russian? No, Glonet. Squonus? I don't know. Anyway, there's Navstar or GPS, Galileo, and Glonass. I think Glonass is Russian. But anyway, those are the three types of GPS. The United States runs the GPS or Navstar. Um, that's the one that tends to be used the most. What they used to do was they used to restrict the accuracy to civilians. Now, recently they've signed contracts saying that they will, even, even under war, they will not restrict this due to the fact of how useful it is in aviation now. Um, but just be wary of that if old uh, orange man with the toupee starts going grumpy on everyone, the uh, GPS might stop working <laughs> properly. So just be cautious of that. But Because um, that's what they used in Nam and that sort of thing. They could pinpoint things down to about half a metre and no one else could use a GPS within about 400 metres. And it was it's set up so that the states can't have, I don't know, the Russians use their GPS, use the state's GPS system to put a nuke on the states. Because imagine that. <laughs> you spend all this money on this infrastructure and then another country uses it to blow you up. You're like, well, that was a cock up. Um, TCAS. So TCAS is a, I don't actually know what TCAS stands for. TCAS is. Traffic collision avoidance system. There you go, that's the one. My brain farted. Um, TCAS basically uses transponder information, picks it up um, from other aircraft and goes, hey, there's an aircraft here, and then warns you about that. So it'll go, hey, aircraft at 12 o'clock low, same distance, or whatever it is. Um, there's two types of TCAS. There's a TCAS that just receives okay, and goes, hey, there's these aircraft here. And then there is also TCAS which receives and sends, and that's what all the airliners have to have. And that's where if the airliners are on a... Um, on a conflicting path will say uh, traffic pull up, traffic pull up, and the other TCAS will go traffic descend, traffic descend, or whatever it is. Um, that's how TCAS works, very basically. Again, most um, light aircraft you fly won't have TCAS or TORS. TORS is a terrain awareness warning system, it tells you where the ground is. So if you're looking like you're on a predicted path to run into hard stuff, it will say, terrain, pull up, terrain, pull up, or it'll give you terrain warnings. Um, it has to be up to date. If it's not up to date, then there may be cranes or anything like that. Obstacle data might be out of date, and it may not do the correct thing. But fundamentally, TORS stops you running into, or alerts you when you're about to run into hard stuff. All right.
Okay, landing gear. So, the two type, common types of landing gear is a tricycle, right? Which is where you've got your two main wheels and your nose wheel. Okay? Now, benefit to this is you've got much better forward visibility. So, in your. Oh, God, now I have to draw a plane. How do you draw a plane? Like this, and then like this, and then there's a canopy that goes like this, and this, and then like that, and then like that. This. Oh god, it's it's gone out of scale. Oh well. Then you have your, your main wheels here with your spats on them. The wheels. And there's another one back here like this. Go okay, right. And then there's a nose wheel with another spat like this. Oh god, that's a big spat. All right. Anyway, you get oh here we go now. We'll do this. Ah, oh, nice. And then All right. <laughs> that is horrific. Oh, hang on, we need a wing <laughs> and a tail plane and, and, a, and a hinge line <laughs> and a static port and a propeller. All right. This is, that was way too much effort to say. So basically, you can see over the nose. <laughs> In a tricycle aircraft, oh god, here we go, uh, like this, and then like this, it's going to be a high wing tricycle. Anyway, so there's a little wheel out here, it's hiding behind you, and then we've got the main wheel. So it looks like a plane. <laughs> the tricycle, right. <laughs> on a tricycle aircraft, the wheel is on the is it is on the wings. What? Is the wheels on the wings for the tricycle? Or That's a it... tricycle. This is a tail wheel. Oh okay. <laughs> no, so the wings up here. Oh all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's an aw it's an awful drawing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, with a tricycle aircraft, you can see over the front to so get better forward visibility. But your prop clearance, quite low, right? But when you're steering it, your center of gravity is in between all the wheels, okay? So if I turn to the left, and then I stop turning, the center of gravity isn't trying to keep pulling me left, it's trying to pull me straight. Because when I turn to the left, my center of gravity is now going out this way, right? Because it's going out of the turn. It wants to pull the nose wheel back, so we're going in a straight line. Which is cool, it's stable. Right? So we can see lots and we're stable when we're on the ground, but we have low prop clearance. Tail dragger aircraft have lots of prop clearance, right? But they can't see over the front. So old little Johnny here, who's been chained to a I don't know, to one of those those ball things, who's stuck on the runway, he can't be seen and he gets mowed over and it's very sad. Right? So no arms on. What's that? No arms, so he would be able to wave the thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all detail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. What I'm trying to say is there's not much prop clearance and you can't see over the nose. Now in a tricycle aircraft, you have your wheels here and your tail wheel at the back and your center of gravity is behind the main wheels, right? Because if it wasn't you'd tip over and who knows. What happens is when I want to try and go away Johnny, when I want to try and turn to the left, what happens to my center of gravity? It wants to go that way too. So suddenly my center of gravity is also trying to pull me into the turn. So if I turn too quick, what happens? I get spun around. So if I'm landing, as you touch down and get too much of a wobble on, your centre of gravity is going to overtake you, right? And then you're going to spin around. Which is bad. Because <laughs> doing 180s in aircraft isn't like a cool manoeuvre. So, downside of tri uh, tail wheel aircraft is on the ground you can't see much, so little Johnny gets run over. And also, 
you've got an unstable steering. So as you turn, it wants to continue turning you. So you have the probability of doing what's called a ground loop, which is where you're coming in to land and your high wing aircraft touch down and you get a little bit out of balance and that little bit translates into a lot. And then what normally happens is as you do that, the wing hits the ground, right? So sometimes you do it that way, sometimes you do it that way. Right? It does happen quite a lot too because it can be a handful, especially in high powered tailwheel aircraft it's quite a high risk. Does that awful illustration explain that? Excellent. Don't laugh at my drawing. <laughs> All right. Oh, and the steering for a tricycle is by the nose wheel, right? You turn the nose wheel, follow it where you go. With a tail wheel, sometimes you have a steerable tail wheel, so you just steer the tail wheel around. Other times you just have a skid, so you use differential braking. So you brake on the left and it starts turning you around to the left. All right. Okay. Did you guys talk about airframes at the start? Yeah. yeah. Did you talk about the material on airframes? Yeah. Composites? <laughs> Delamination? Yep. That's our performance. <sighs> All right. Do you guys want a quick breather before we crack on with this last block? Yeah. Go take ten minutes. Go grab a coffee. Go have a stretch, and then we'll crack on with these last two stuff. Okay, so we're going to go through performance, so how to calculate um, density altitude, how to calculate takeoff and landing performance using P charts, and the practical use of that, and the illustration. So, we've already gone through this. What does altitude do to aircraft performance? Decrease. That makes it worse. Cool. Aerodynamic performance, what does altitude do to the aerodynamic performance for a given true airspeed? Makes it worse. Cool. Power required or excess power, what happens with altitude? Yeah? I'm seeing a lot of blank looks for something we've just gone over. Right? It gets less. So as we go higher in altitude, we have less power or less excess power and we have a slightly higher requirement. Okay? So pressure altitude is the altitude in ISA that has the same pressure as the real altitude. Okay, So it allows for performance ca comparisons between um, where we are and ISA. So the way we calculate um, the way we calculate Pressure altitude, so we take the elevation of the field. Right? So elevation is uh, 500 feet. And then we take into account the pressure. So the pressure today is 990. Okay? Then we figure out the difference from ISA. So 1013 minus 990 gives us what? Can use a calculator. 33. 33? 20? 
23. 20, is, that, is that right? 23? 20, 23. 23. So we have 23 times 30. Because we're correcting for 30 feet every hectopascal. Everyone's still with me so far? Okay. Is what? Six and ninety. Cool. So then we add that to our elevation. So five hundred plus six hundred and ninety. One thousand one hundred and ninety. Right. So now our pressure altitude is this. So at our field, that's five hundred feet high with a pressure of nine ninety. The equivalent altitude in ISA is 1,190 feet. That's our pressure and altitude. Right? So that's how high we think we are. Okay? Mm -hmm. We... Are you close? There you go. Okay? So 1013 minus the QNH gives you the difference in pressure times by 30 equals the... Um, Pressure correction plus the aerodrome elevation gives you your pressure altitude. The other way we could do it is just set 1013 in an altimeter. And that would give us our pressure altitude as well. So that's another way of a quick cheat of doing it. Yeah. Temperature. So temperature, what does that do as we increase temperature? It makes the air more or less dense. Less. Less. Cool. So what happens to our performance? It gets worse. Excellent. So density altitude is correcting for air, temperature, and pressure. So pressure altitude figures out what it is with allowing for pressure and ISA. Density allows for temperature on top of that, okay? So density altitude is, by definition, our pressure altitude here, corrected for any difference in temperature from the international standard atmosphere. Okay, so we'll take this temperature. Remember how before we figured out what it was in ISA? So we figure out what this temperature is in ISA, then we apply the correction to it, and then it's nice and easy, okay? So let's say at 1,000, well, what should the temperature be at 1,190 feet? What should it be at 1,000 feet? What's the, te what's the temperature at sea level? What's the lapse rate? 1.98. 1.98, or 2 degrees per 1,000 feet. So 1,000 feet should be 13 degrees, all right? So 500 feet would be half a degree, yeah? It's not quite 500 feet, so we'll just round it down. Keep it 13 degrees to make life nice and easy. If you want to get real into it, then you can calculate the exact temperature it should be at that pressure altitude, otherwise 13 will do. Then we compare it to the actual temperature, which is, uh, I don't know, let's say it's the, I don't know, somewhere nice and hot on a summer's day, somewhere in the upper plains in the States. Right? It's worse in the States because you have a field at 3,000 feet, that's also 30 degrees in the deserts, like in the high Sierra. Yeah? So, what's the temperature in ISA? So this temperature is ISA plus what? ISO plus, what's the difference between 13 and 34? 21. 21? Yep, so it's ISO plus 21. So that is the temperature at the airfield. That is ISO plus 21, which is also 34 degrees. Now the correction factor is 120 feet Per degree. 
Yeah. So if we're 21 degrees off, how much correction is that? 21 times 120. Yep, which is what? 2,520 is the correction. So then we add that to our pressure altitude, which gives us 3,710 uh, 3, feet. So this airport, which is only a little bit higher than North Shore, has a density altitude of 3,710 feet, nearly 4,000 feet. The aircraft performs a lot differently at 4,000 feet than it does at sea level, right? So that's a massive difference. On a hot summer's day with low pressure. Right? So this is why density altitude is so important. Okay. So when we're uh, calculating density up here, we can either do simple calculations like this, right? So elevation plus or correcting for Q and H gives us our pressure altitude. Figure out the ISA temperature at the pressure altitude. Figure out the ISA temperature that's actually at the aerodrome, and then correct for it at 120 feet a degree. Then add or subtract that from your pressure altitude depending on whether it's going up or down and then go from there. Performance charts will normally ask for pressure altitude and temperature. So if you have your temperature and your pressure altitudes, you're good. On your nav computer, you can run through and do these calcs as well. Okay? To calculate the density altitude at an aerodrome, you need to know one, the pressure altitude, and two, the temperature deviation, which is this, ISA plus Cool? Okay. Alright, so let's uh, go through an aerodrome that has a pressure altitude of 1,500 feet and a temperature of 18 degrees. What's the first thing we do? written on the board, guys, come on. Right. So what should ISA be at 1,500 feet? What should it be at 1,000 feet? So if we go up 500 feet? Be 12 degrees at 2,000 feet. Uh, ah, sorry. No, you're right. Why did I? Yeah. No. Nah. Right. 12 degrees. My brain is probably on the same level as yours right now. <laughs> right. So ISA is 12 degrees. So then the temperature of the aerodrome, in terms of a deviation, is what? ISA plus six. Six times one hundred and twenty. What's that? Seven twenty. Seven twenty. Nope. All right. So seven twenty. We've gone up seven twenty plus our pressure altitude of one thousand five hundred feet. Does everyone follow that process? No. Not at all. No, we just the six come plus six. 
ISA plus the 26 temperature. So ISA is 12 degrees. Yeah. The actual temperature is 18 degrees. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the temperature at the aerodrome is ISA, which should be 12, plus 6, because it's actually 18 degrees. So that's another way of expressing the temperature at the aerodrome. Okay. Right, that's exactly the same as saying it's 18 degrees. Yeah. Does everyone follow that? Cool? Okay, I'm going to get you to do one in a second anyway. If you ever get stuck, always just think up and down. Right? So if it's warmer, does that make the air less dense? If it's less dense, that's the same as going up. If it's more dense, that's the same as going down. Okay? All right, let's do this one down the bottom. Okay, pressure altitude to 400 feet, ISA. Um, the temperature deviation is ISA plus four. So tell me what the actual temperature is, and tell me what the density altitude is. So the temperature deviation from ISA at this place is ISA plus 4 degrees and it's got a pressure altitude of 400 feet. Just do it to the nearest degree. Who's got it? No one? Okay, what's the ISA temperature at 400 feet? To the nearest degree. What's the ISA temperature at 400 feet? Call it 500 feet. All right, let's go back a step more. What's the ISA temperature at sea level? Okay, what's the lapse rate? Two degrees. Okay, so what's the ISA temperature at 400 feet? To the nearest degree, so call it 500 feet. 14, okay. So the ISA temperature is 14 degrees. Now the temperature deviation is ISA plus 4. And ISA is 14 degrees. So the actual temperature is 18. 18. Cool. That's not important now because we've already got the ISA temperature. Now, the deviation is 4 degrees. So how do we correct for that? What's the correction? How many feet per degree? 500-ish. So 120 feet per degree. Right? So then if it's plus 4 degrees, so 4 degrees times that 120 foot correction gives us 480. Good. So then that 480, it's warmer. So it's as if we're going up in altitude, so it's going to be added to our pressure altitude. So if we add that 480 to our pressure altitude of 400 feet, what do we get? 880. Excellent. So that is the density altitude of this place. Is 
everybody happy how we got there? Cool. Um, I, I saw, the, oh. At 1,000 feet is 13 degrees, right? Yep. Then we work out from there. Well, the lapse rate is 1.98 degrees per 1,000 feet. 1.98. So you know that for every 500 feet you go up, the temperature goes down by just under a degree. Right? So if we went up 4,000 feet, you know it would get 8 degrees colder, mm -hmm. or thereabouts. All right, what's humidity do to aircraft performance? Someone other than Kai. John. Um, not good. Not good, why? Slower. Destruct airflow. Not necessarily, it's just less dense than air because that water vapour is displacing the air, right? So the water vapour weighs less, the water vapour does less than the air when we fly through it. So if it's a high humidity day, our performance is going to be worse. There's no easy way to correct for and measure for humidity, but if it's a really high density altitude with high humidity, we should definitely be making an allowance for the fact that it's very humid. Cool. Cool. All right. What does takeoff distance require? Well, takeoff distance required is the distance that it takes for us from a standing start to clear a 50 foot obstacle. Okay, so that is our takeoff distance required. Takeoff distance available is the takeoff distance, is the, the surface we can use, the amount of distance we have, including any stopways or anything like that that are properly sealed. So that's our takeoff distance available. Okay? Now, lots of things are going to affect our takeoff distance. Temperature and pressure, density, altitude are going to have a massive impact. Because how does our engine perform at high altitudes? Nowhere near as well. What do we need for takeoff? Lots and lots of power. So if we have less power, our performance and our takeoff performance is going to get much, much, much longer. Okay? The air is humid, we're going to use up more runway. If the aircraft's heavier, it's going to take us longer to accelerate. We need more lift. We have to go faster. It's going to take us more runway. Okay? If the runway surface is contaminated, or if it's grass or something like that with lots of drag, it's going to take us a long time to accelerate. So runway surface can have a massive impact on our takeoff distance. Runway slope. If we're going uphill, it's going to take a long time to accelerate. If we're going downhill, whee, rocket ship all the way down, pop off the ground nice and early because we can accelerate quicker. If we're into a headwind, we've already got a free 5, 10 knots of airspeed, maybe even 20 knots of airspeed, just by pointing into the wind. If we have a tailwind, we have to make up an additional 5 or 10 knots before we get the appropriate airspeed to lift off. Flaps depending on the aircraft, it's going to make us get off the ground and clear a 50 foot obstacle either sooner or later, depending on the aircraft. Power off, we want to make sure we're taking off with the appropriate power setting. In most light aircraft, it's full power. Right? If you're in a turbocharged aircraft, then you have to set takeoff power. If you're in a manifold pressure aircraft, sometimes you have to, uh, sorry, if you're in an aircraft with a constant speed unit, sometimes you have to set takeoff power as well. Normally it's full power. If you have ice on the wings, or contamination, or damage, you smoke a bird on the way down, that's going to affect your takeoff distance, because you have a higher requirement for lift, so you're going to use more runway to get up to a faster speed. Right? We're all happy with that. All right. So temperature, pressure, humidity affect air density. If we have low air density, that's when the aerodrome's high, the QNH is low, the temperature's high, and the humidity's high. Low air density means bad engine performance and bad aerodynamic performance. Now P charts allow for our pressure, altitude and our temperature. What is that called? 
what is pressure, altitude, and allowed for temperature? Density. Density, altitude, right? So if we correct pressure, altitude for temperature, that gives us a temp density altitude. Uh, a heavier aircraft is going to use significantly more runway to clear that 50 foot obstacle. Okay. Runway surface. So if we have increased friction between the wheel and the runway, it's going to take longer to accelerate, we're going to use more runway. Okay. P charts sometimes give you information on uh, different surfaces. If there's not a P chart, you have to use the aircraft flight manual. There'll be a table in it with performance going at this altitude, with this um, power setting, you will take up this much runway. Right? And then from that, you have to find the happy middle ground. If the aircraft manual doesn't specify surface type factors, you have to use what's an AC 91-3. Uh, okay? So that gives you the performance um, factors so that you can apply the buffer for the different surfaces you're taking off on. For example, if you're taking off on grass, you need to add an extra 14% to that which is a say, uh, paved runway. If you're a commercial operation, you have to add even more on that. Runway upslope, it's going to take longer to clear that 50 foot obstacle. We're going to use more. Nil wind, we have a shallower climb gradient, right? If we have a headwind, whee, we rocket ship off the ground. We have a tailwind, run into the tree, not good. And the takeoff of the tailwind, right? Tailwinds are how people end up in the trees, all through the fence. Now on the P chart, which is in that little uh, group of pages I gave you there, it'll specify the use of power and flaps. So flaps in the takeoff position, which is 10 degrees, full power. Rotate at 54 knots. Climb out at 65 knots. Okay. If we don't do that, then we're not going to get the performance that we've calculated on that P chart. Contamination will have worse aerodynamic performance. Can increase weight. So ice, for example, that's going to increase weight. If we have any damage to the lifting services, now our aerodynamic performance is going to be reduced. Okay. So before takeoff, we need to make sure that there's no damage and there's no ice left on the wings. Okay? That photo is actually from a South Island trip we did in August in South Island. So that's New Zealand. Wind shear on climb out. So wind shear is when you descend through or climb through a layer where there's different winds. Right? So in this case, as we climb up, we have a 20 knot headwind and we pop through the wind shear layer now we've got a 10 knot tailwind, so our climb angle is going to be reduced. So we have to be quite cautious. Landing distance is very similar to takeoff distance, right? It's from a 50 foot obstacle or from a 50 foot above the landing threshold to coming to a full stop. So our landing distance required needs to be less than our landing distance available. Otherwise things get exciting, right? Again, temperature and pressure, they do have an effect on landing, nowhere near as much as on takeoff. Why? Have a guess. What's your aircraft power setting on landing? Idle. What's your aircraft power setting on takeoff? So on takeoff, we have to take into account engine performance and aerodynamic performance. On landing, really, it's only aerodynamic performance. Okay. Humidity, aircraft weight, runway surface, runway slope, wind, flaps and power, they all make an effect on our landing distance. Right? It's the same as takeoff. You need to use P-charts. Heavier aircraft, it's going to take longer to slow down. You're going to use up more runway. Okay. Again, we have correction factors for landing. Right? So we need to make sure we have the appropriate numbers because if we say, oh, we can just make it into that grass runway, but we don't apply the 20% correction or 18% correction, 
for landing at that grass runway, we have actually fully overcooked it, and you're not going to be able to land it. And if you try, it won't go well. Right? Everyone with me? Yep, sweet. Um, wet runways. Wet runways make braking action awful, even on sealed runways. Probably marginally worse on sealed runways than gravel runways, to be honest. Um, aquaplaning, not fun. Right, you get on the brakes and then suddenly you've got no braking action at all. The wheels are just locked up. Landing with a runway upslope, awesome. We stop at a really short distance. Landing with a downslope, sucks. Right? You want to avoid that, unless there's a real strong headwind. Headwind component, again, we're going to come in at a steeper angle and we're going to be able to use less distance. Okay? We're going to touch down at a slower airspeed, uh, sorry, touch down at a slower ground speed, so we're going to be able to stop the aircraft nice and quick, which will be good. Headwind, right? Sorry, that should say tailwind. We land with a tailwind, we're going to end up taking significantly longer even to touch the runway, and then once we touch the runway, we're going faster, so it's going to take a long time for us to stop as well. Landing with the tailwind is another reason why people like to go through the fence. Don't do it. Again, what's in the P chart? Make sure you actually fly this, because if you don't actually fly that, if you come in at 70 knots, or with power on, then you're not going to have the accurate information you need. You might as well throw the P chart out the window. Wind shear. Got to be real careful of that on approach. Using power lots. If you use power lots, you mitigate the effects of wind shear. Alright, so P charts, what do we need? Well, we need a Q&H reference, we need the air temperature, we need the weight of the aircraft, and we need the wind. Okay. So the wind is 0, 030 0 at 10 knots, so what runway are we going to use? Zero 03, nice. So we're going to take off on zero 03. So takeoff distance available 738 meters. Sweet. Okay, so as long as we have less than 738 meters of takeoff distance required, we're good. So we come to our P chart and we go, okay, the temperature is, what, what was it? 1013. Right? So we plug in our pressure altitude. So our pressure altitude is just our elevation in this batch, right? So, 212 feet along here. Then our temperature was, what was it, 25? Come along the top, 25 degrees, right? Draw a line up there, okay? So this is our starting point. Then from our starting point, we go across to our weight, right? So max all up weight, 800 kilos. Then from there, we go up to this first line, so line A, line A, private operations, paved runway. Okay? These are all air transport operations, the other lines. So we don't want to use the other lines. Right? Even if it's a grass runway, we still use the paved runway under the 91 one and then apply the correction factor because it gives us more wiggle room. So we've come up to our line, then we go across to our slope. Right? Now 03 has a 0.3% upslope. Okay? I don't know, 0.3 or 0.5 percent in this case, just to be conservative, and then we follow this line going up here, right? So we have to sort of match a line that intersects with um, in between these, so we can follow it back up. So we go to the center, right? Zero, that's our starting point. And then we follow this line back up till we get to 0.5, and from there we go across to zero again. Then we figure out how much wind do we need, okay? So we've got 10 knots of headwind, so we're going to be somewhere in a line along here. So we can draw an imaginary line, follow that line down, until we get to here. And from there we just draw a line across and go, okay, I need 510 metres. Me. Get confused, there's diagrams and instructions, right? So even in the exam, it's diagrams and instructions. So really, it's not too much excuse to budget this. Okay? 
So pressure altitude, that's the only thing you may have to calculate. The elevation is 212 feet. The pressure is 990. What's the, what is the pressure altitude? Oh, it's 600 feet. Okay, 600 feet, draw my line. Temperature, 25. Okay, intersect it, come across to my weight. I'm actually at 750 keg, so I'll start there. Okay, go up to my line. Okay, going up. That's to line A, that's where I'm going. Across to the slope. Okay, so we're going up to 0.5. So we're going to go up to 0.5, no. come across to the wind, there we go, 10 knot headwind, so coming down to 10 knots, and come across, oh man, now we only got 460 metres that we need, choice being light. Does everyone follow that process? Who's utterly confused by that? I like how you two both nodded as well, we're just like, yeah. You know if you don't understand, you're allowed to ask, right? All right. Do this one with me. Take off chart. Okay. What does this say? Kids at the back. Cool. So what's the pressure altitude of North Shore under 1013? What's our pressure altitude if our elevation is 212 feet? The elevation is 212 feet, the QNH is 1013. What's our pressure altitude? Do we have to calculate this or is this in a table? The pressure altitude? Yeah. You will have to calculate it. Oh. But if the QNH is 1013 and the elevation is 212 feet, what's the pressure altitude? What is the ISA sea level pressure? 1013. But it's 1013 today. Ah, oh, so it's ISA sea level. So that means our elevation is our pressure altitude. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So now we know, okay, well, our pressure altitude is 200 feet. Cool. Draw a line in there. Mean, right? Confused yet? Wait, draw a line where? See where this blue line is? Yeah. Yeah. So all these lines, you just follow the angle of them and then draw a line that's kind of at 200 feet along there. Okay? Yeah. Then from there, you go, okay, well, what's the temperature? Temperature is 25 degrees. Okay. So we come across, we find 25 degrees. We draw a line down from 25 degrees. Good. Good. Nice. Then we go, okay, well, they intersect right here. That's my start point. Happy so far? Yeah. Who's lost? No one? Good. Then from that line, we look at the instructions and it goes, okay. Come across to the line like this. Okay. So we're going to come across to these lines. Now we're at max all up weight, which is 800 kilos. So we're going to go to the 800 kilo line. If we weren't at 800 kilos, we'd go to whatever weight we were actually at. Okay. Back to the instructions. All right. Well, it says put a line up to this one. Okay. So what line applies to us? Well, there's A, B, C, and D. Line A, private operations, paved runway. Line B, air traffic transport ops, paved runway. Line C, air transport ops, metal runway. Line D, air transport ops, grass, grass runway. Well, we're a private operation and we're operating on a paved runway. Line A, so this guy. So we go up, following the instructions, up to our line A. Right. So then this is our next starting point. What do the instructions say? Okay, go across to the next column. All right. So then we go across to the next column, and there's a zero mark here, the big bold line. So that's our zero mark. Right. Now at North Shore, on the aerodrome information, it says slope 0.5 up, or 0.5 U. So that means there's 0.5% upslope. So this is in percentage. So on the 0.5 line, we draw a line all the way up. 
Now we don't go where these intersect because that wouldn't be correcting for it. So see how there's all these lines here? Right, coming down? There's no line exactly where we are, right? So we have to draw our own line. So that's where we get our ruler and our pen and go, well, this line's like that and this line's like that, so happy middle would probably be like that. So we'll put it in like that, draw our own line, right? So now we have our own line that intersects on the zero where our other part is. From there, we just follow this line up. If it was 3%, we'd follow it all the way up to 3%. If it was 2% down, we'd follow it all the way down to 2% down. It's not, it's only 0.5% up, so we'll follow it up to here, and that's our next starting point. All right, let's look at the instructions. Okay, so we've done our correction. Now we have to go across to the next bold line. Okay, so we go across to the next bold line. Whee! And then we get to the zero line, right? You still with me? Sweet. Now we know we have 10 knots from zero to three zero, so we can draw a line down the zero, 10 knots if you want, otherwise you can just leave it and imagine where it is later on. Now, there's a line here to follow down, and there's a line here to follow down, but there's not a line at our starting point. So we need to make our own. So we go to our starting point, and we make our own line. Whee! All right. Then we follow that line down till we get to 10 knots. If it was 20 knots, we'd follow it all the way down to 20 knots. Right? But it's not 20 knots, it's 10 knots. So we follow it down to 10 knots. There. Then we look at the instructions and go, okay, then we have to draw a line across. We come over here and draw our line across. Then on here, there's our scale, so we can read it off as 510 meters or 505 meters, whatever it is. Got it? Less confused? Is anyone now lost? Okay. We will crack on. Landing follows the exact same process. with landing, you'll notice there's no temperature, it's just pressure altitude. So we calculate our pressure altitude over to our weight and then follow the exact same process. Right. The only difference is takeoff has temperature, landing and this one has no temperature. Where's that required takeoff distance, with, uh, that, that calculated takeoff distance required? Our 510 meters. Yeah, wait, what, what figure did that just calculate? Our takeoff distance. Okay. Because it said takeoff at the top of the P chart. Okay. Right? If it says landing, you'd go through. Okay, well, my elevation, 200 feet. Or my pressure altitude, 200 feet. Across to my weight, then up to the line that applies to me. And from there, where do we go? Across to the next bulb line, so the zero line on the slope section. And then from there we pick the slope. So we have to draw our own line because we're not bang on the line. And then we'll go up or down depending on the slope. We go up to 0.5. And then from there, where do we go? Across to the next zero line. And then at that line, we have to draw our own zero line. Or our own um, in-between line. And go, okay, well how much wind is there? Alright, there's 10 knots of wind. So we'll go down to the 10 knot section. Go across. And then that's our landing distance. Does that make sense? Are we all happy we can follow that through with a bit of practice? Okay, that's why I've given you. You do it with a pencil and then you can rub it out and do it a few times. Or just email me and I'll send you some. Um, Weight and balance. Yeehaw. 
That's it, the bump stuff. Okay. So weight and balance, there's some definitions. So arm, right, that's the distance from the datum that the weight is being acted through. So the arm is sometimes in meters, sometimes it's in inches, and sometimes it's in, it's in so many different things. The moment is the arm times the force, right? So if we have, or well, the arm times the um, mass in this case. So let's say we have a, a me, a big fatty, right? So 70 kilos sitting at 10 meters or 10 inches from the datum. Okay, so then it's going to be 10 times 70, so that's going to be 700, so it's going to be 700 inch kilograms is my moment. They never combine inches and kilograms. It's either foot pounds or inch pounds, or it's uh, kilogram or meter kilograms or kilogram meters. Um, that's how they do it. Center of gravity, have a guess what that is. The center of gravity. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, so it's where the center of gravity acts through, right? So if we, were, if we were to put our finger on the center of gravity and pick the aircraft up, it would balance there nicely, right? Center of gravity limits, so how far forward and aft can we have them, okay? Basic empty weight, so that's the weight of the aircraft with nothing in it apart from fluids, okay? So oil, brake fluid, unusable fuel, but no actual fuel, no passengers and no, pack, no baggage. Empty aircraft center of gravity position. Do I need to explain that one? Does anyone want me to explain that? Okay. Basic operating weight. Okay, so basic operating weight is our weight with our fuel, but without our passengers and payload. So it's the operating weight of the aircraft. It's what we actually need. Is that including a pilot as well? I can't actually remember. Homework. Right. Um, payload, that's the amount of stuff you're taking. Zero, that's normally referred to as station zero. So that's the datum that all the weight and balance data is measured off. <coughs> ramp weight is the weight on the ramp. Gross weight is the gross weight of the aircraft, so the actual weight. Maximum certified takeoff weight or landing weight, okay, um, is our maximum takeoff weight, so the max weight the aircraft can be at takeoff. Max landing weight is the max weight the aircraft can be on landing. Center of gravity envelope. So we'll have a look at that. If you have a look on your weight and balance chart, you'll see there's a what's called an R2120 envelope, which looks like a square with the corner chopped off. Right? That is your center of gravity envelope. Okay? Then we have specific gravity and the weight of our gas. So specific gravity is how much that... Um, volume of fluid weighs in a specific volume. So think of it as what it weighs in relation to, um, let's say, a litre of water that is a specific gravity of one. Right? So one litre of water weighs one kilogram and has a specific gravity of one. Avgas has a specific gravity of 0 0.72. So one litre of avgas weighs 0 0.72 kilograms. Remember that. That number is very important. 0 0.72. Okay, so how's an aircraft weight? Well, when the engineers build it, they put it on two sets of scales, and then they measure the um, weight of the aircraft. Right? The sum of both of those scales are going to give them the total weight of the aircraft. Okay? It also allows them to give they can get the center of gravity position from that. Okay? So from that, they can say, okay, well, the forward set of scales is 900, the back set of scales is 1,000. That means the center of gravity is aft of the midpoint, and then they can calculate that out using the known information. Right? Happy? Cool. All right. Calculating weight and balance. So. To do the weight and balance, we need to know what the weight is of something, what the arm is of it, and then consequently what the moment is. So how would we get the arm in this situation? Yeah, couldn't we just add the arms up? 
we add these up, and that gets 1,900, and we add these up and we get 428,900, surely we can just add the arms up. Why not? Because maths, right? It doesn't work. You take it to the extremes and you have 1 times 2 and 3 times 4, 1 times 2 equals 2, and 3 times 4 equals, uh, I'll get asked for 12, thank you. <laughs> Wait, yeah? Yeah, 12. <laughs> so this is 14, and that is 4, 6. Hang on, that doesn't work. Right? So adding those arms up together doesn't give you your arm. So if we divide it out, then we get our arm. In this case, it's 225.7 half of the data. All right, let's do one. You guys are so excited. <laughs> Is it because it's Friday? Is it me? Don't answer that. No. No, no. Students. Operational. Weight and balance. Weight and balance. That's control B. That one doesn't work. Where's the scrolly thing? Is that a scrolly thing? Yeah. 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 All right, that'll do. Okay. So, do this one with me. So, 553.4 is the basic empty weight, and times the arm of 0.283 gives us a moment of, in this case, 156.947. So that's the basic empty weight times the arm gives us a moment. Choice. Pilot and passengers, let's just say it's me, okay? So we have 70 kegs times 0.46. What's the moment? 32.2. 32. 32.2. 32. 32. Cool. And let's say I have 10 kilos of baggage. Okay, now let's figure out what our zero fuel weight is. Okay, so 553.4 plus 70 plus 10. Six hundred thirty-three point four. Six three three point four. Okay, and what's our zero fuel weight moment? So that's our zero fuel weight now. Then I want to add in a 100 litres of avgas. Okay? 
Now, 100 litres isn't 100 kilos. What is it? 0 0.72. 72 kilos. 72 kilos, right? Because it's 100 times 0.72. So 72 kilos. Times 1.115 is what? Eighty point two eight. Eight zero point two eight. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's add six three three point four plus seventy two. Seven hundred and five point four. Seven hundred and five point four. Okay. And the moment so two hundred one point two four seven plus eighty point two eight. Two eight one point five two seven. Cool. So that's our takeoff weight, which is less than our max all up weight of eight hundred kilos. Right? And that's our takeoff arm uh, moment. So what's our takeoff arm? Moment divided by weight. What? So two eight one. So two eight one point five two seven divided by seven oh five point four. Zero point three nine nine. 0.399. Okay, so let's just write this down. So takeoff weight 705.4 and the arm 0.399. Alright, then let's say I burnt uh, 40 litres. Okay, so I flew for an hour and 20, so I burnt 40 litres of fuel. So how much weight is 40 litres of fuel? So what's 40 times 0 0.72? 28.8. 28.8. Okay, so let's take away 28.8 from that. So we burnt 28.8 gallons. And what's 28.8 times 1.115? 32.8. So let's take away 28.8 from 705.4. Cool. And what was the arm? So 281.527 minus 32.112. 1, so everyone following along with what's going on here? Two hundred and forty nine point four one five. Two hundred and forty nine point four one five? Yep. Four one five. Okay, so divide two hundred and forty nine point four one five by seven six hundred and seventy six point six. So then we have to plot our weight and balance in the envelope. So we know our max takeoff, our takeoff weight is less than what we need. Or it's less than max all up weight, which is good. So that's the first thing. So then we have to go out and go, okay, well it's 705. Okay, so that comes across here like this. And the arm was 0.399. So there's 0 0.4, so 399's going to be just up on that side. There we go, up. Up some more. So that's our starting point, which is within the envelope. Sweet. Good. Okay, landing weight, 676. So that's 6, 2, 4, 6, 8. So that's about there. 
come across from that one. Right, all the way across, da da da. And then we go, okay, arm is now 3.68, so 0 0.35368, so about there. Right, so then that's our anti weight. So then our total movement throughout the flight is that. So that there is our movement for the flight. Right? Just to prove it, we'll plug in the numbers. But I can't remember what the numbers were, but we'll try. Alright, so it was me at 70 kilos. Did I lie to you and tell you, tell you I was 70? Then we had, was it 100 litres to start with? Mm -hmm. Cool. So then, now I have to try and scroll across and get it so it's just at the right. Right. It was pretty close. <laughs> right? Started at the same point. I can't plot very accurately, but if we had, it would have worked out quite nicely. Right? Happy with how to do that? So you can just do it on the Excel anyway? Or no, because these spreadsheets are actually slightly wrong. Okay. All the basic empty weights are wrong. Okay. Also, you have to be able to do it for your exams, you have to be able to do it for a flight test. So, okay. spreadsheets are only good if you're running out of time. Also, if, you know, if you've done a weight imbalance manually a few times, and you know that you plus your 70 kilo instructor works, and you're jumping in a few different machines that have a slightly different basic empty weight, you're running it on an Excel spreadsheet is sweet, right? nothing wrong with that. But you always need to make sure you be able to have to be able to do everything. Right? It's like we can use, when we're planning, we can use our phones to do all the flight computing, but if you can't use a nav computer, then that's no good to anyone. So you may as well use a nav computer until you know you can use it before going through and using a phone. And personally, half the calculations are actually quicker on a nav computer than they are on your phone, because by the time you go through the menus and find what you need to do and plug in everything, it's way easier to sit there and go, this one, that one, this one, that one, that one. I still use it for IFR flight planning, admittedly for not much else other than elapsed time, but still, it's way quicker than using my phone. Something to think in mind. Think in mind. Keep in mind or think about one or the other. Your pick, my gift to you. All right. No one can leave here until you finish your exam. <laughs> Jesus, you guys have gutted for me. Like, what? All right. Take these home. I'm going to give you the answer sheets. Don't look at the answer sheets. All right. Oh, actually, before you go, I need you to fill out the, the review. If you give good reviews, I'll give you the answer sheet. <laughs> Which you got there, right? No, you've got one. You can fill that one out. Can you get that um, one more thing? Yeah. I think I got it. Okay, so one thing. Yeah, that's right. I'm scared of the people who work in the office. Okay. I'll be back in two seconds, um, and then I'll get to fill something out, and then you guys can go. You scared of Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, <will be> scared. <laughs> Bruce controls the finances. <laughs>